Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. He then went on to complete Spine Reconstruction Fellowship at the Spine and Scoliosis Center in Baltimore. Dr. Van's patients benefit from conservative treatments and minimal invasive surgical procedures. So he is a very skilled and a very experienced surgeon and is most up to date the surgical techniques. He performs approximately close to about 500 plus surgeries in the year and large chunk of them being minimally invasive. Without much delay, I would welcome Dr. Van to take over the session. Uh, thank you very much um, for having uh, me. Um, it's early morning there. It's a little later in the evening for us here. So just uh, uh, bear with me for a little bit. Um, we're just going to jump into a talk here. Um, I've uh, been doing, uh, I've been in practice for 20 years. I have, uh, I started off doing everything kind of uh, freehand, um, you know, placement of instrumentation, pedicle screws. And then in 2014, I uh, started with robotics and have been uh, using a combination of robotics and navigation um, uh, ever since. Uh, so uh, that's kind of, it's in its, as it's growing here in America, we're, we're seeing it's kind of being more and more uh, commonplace to have robotics and navigation. So they asked us to talk about, um, you know, it's in its, um, as it's single position lateral uh, today, uh, using you know, the robotic system. system. And I'm going to see if I can um, share my screen. Okay, and okay. All right, as long as everybody can see, please let me know if you cannot. Um, we do a lot of uh, these courses here in, in America for the single position. Um, um, I don't know, let me see, there we go. Um, basically, um, from this type of position of being able to do both a posterior fixation as well as an ad lateral interbody, anterolateral interbody fusion, uh, it's a very efficient workflow. And with the efficiency comes because you can, with the Mazur station, we can, with a preoperative CT, we can kind of predictably plan uh, all our instrumentation ahead of time. Um, we can then, with the robotic arm and guidance, we can have the precision uh, placement of those uh, pre-planned pedicle screws or instrumentation. And now with the navigation component, we can um, confirm with navigation the placement of those screws, but also now uh, navigate off of the Mazur X system and be able to do a navigated inner body at the same time. Um, these are just some slides from our deck. Um, and, but there's a lot of, when we all started doing, a lot of us do laterals here and, we, and I started doing laterals in the X lift type position. Um, they're, they're great um, for correction of deformity, multi-level deformities, uh, flat back deformities, anterior releases. Um, the OLIF um, in particular, because it's anterior to the psoas typically, has uh, some benefits in, in terms of a straight lateral position. Uh, we have muscle sparing, um, avoidance of the uh, lumbar plexus, particularly the femoral nerve when we're at the L45 level. Um, then it lessens the need for neuromonitoring uh, at the L45 level. And even when we do L5S1, you can avoid the iliac crest. And you can, all, you can basically access all the, the disc levels from L2 down uh, from a single uh, lateral position. The problem is if you do multiple levels, typically has been is that typically, especially if you go past one level, you're considering needing to do posterior fixation. And at least in, in, in the United States, uh, the time from positioning from in a lateral position to prone and kind of redraping, reset it has a cost to it, not only in terms of the cost of the equipment and supplies, but also the time. And typically it can take about uh, 45 minutes to an hour to get that, that positioning to um, occur or happen. And that's on a good day here. Um, so the whole uh, concept of the single position 360 OLIF is that we're able to do the, both the anterior and posterior components without having to reposition the patient, redrape the patient or re-image the patient. Um, also is nice because whether we do a CT to floor workflow or we do a uh, O-arm spin is that you, you really, with those two images or that one spin, you're able to do the entire case without having to wear uh, like lead or, or have any protective uh, equipment on afterwards. Um, we do a lot of these workflow courses here in the United States, and we typically teach what we call a CT to floor workflow. Um, and this is kind of our um, 
steps that we're going to go over and then you'll see it kind of on the, the video that we put together. Um, but basically we have pre-planning, we have verifying instruments, we have placement of the patient reference, bone mount attachments to the patient, and then you get your registration. And then the robotic system uh, allows you to place the pedicle screws. And now we're with a system where we're actually able to navigate the OLIP as well, but we'll go over that. Um, patient selection for this is no different than what you've already been doing uh, in your practices. Um, it's uh, as you would do for an OLIP. So you can do any kind of degenerative disease from L2 to S1. You can have up to a grade one spondylolisthesis. Uh, currently here in the United States, it's on label for two levels, um, but uh, you can do up to three if you need to. Um, six months of non-operative treatment, obviously. So nothing really changes in terms of your patient selection. Certainly when you're doing an OLIF or anterior to the psoas um, to, uh, from anywhere from L2 to L5 or L5-S1, you it, it, just because you're using robotics and navigation and, uh, and all the fancy tools, you still got to do your normal preoperative planning. So when you're planning your approach, you need to review your MRIs ahead of time to make sure you've got appropriate anatomy for the approach you have. Because if you don't have the appropriate retroperitoneal plane or you have some abnormal vascular um, things, uh, then it doesn't matter if you have the robotics or not. Um, in this louder position, as you'll see on the videos, um, it is a, it's very important how we position the patient. Um, there we, in the la uh, navigated position, we use the uh, reference frame on the patient. And there's some nuances for draping and stuff, uh, especially if we're doing a scan implant, which is with the OR. Uh, the room setup is similar, is like this here, where we have uh, basically um, the robotic arm here attached to the side of the bed. The patient is in the louder position all the way posterior to the bed. The camera from the Missouri X uh, system navigation component is at the top of the field. And then your, sta your station or, or housing unit is here in the inferior portion. If you're to use a C arm, it typically comes in from the top of the field like that. Uh, navigation, uh, the nav now that the Missouri is has a navigated component, there's verification preoperatively, but this is no different than what you already do for the S8 or for regular navigation system. And this is all typically done prior to uh, the surgery. Um, the bed frame adapter for the Missouri is placed inferior approximately two feet below the PSIS uh, to give your arm the extension it needs to be able to place the, the screws. And um, again, you can choose to do this, uh, place the robotic um, arm onto the bed prior to positioning the patient. Most of us have a left-sided approach, left-sided up, and um, usually I will position the patient preoperatively um, and then uh, do all the taping and positioning, and then I'll place the robotic arm on there and do what we call a dry mount to make sure we have reachability. Um, no, again, very typical to the standard uh, X-Lift approach, except we're not breaking the bed. So we do put a, a bolster after we put an axillary roll here, we usually put a bolster here under the apex of the deformity, um, tape across the iliac crest, as well as the anterior chest, um, and then some taping for the lower extremities just to hold them in place, but we don't do a extreme lateral position, uh, especially with navigation and the anterior approach. Um, you don't need that much of a, a, a hyperextension. Um, and this is kind of the positioning uh, without going all through this, this is kind of the position you want. Very important for the position of the patient to be posterior on the bed as far as you can, which is a little different than what we treat teach typically for the uh, uh, OLIF procedure, because basically if you're too close, it far on the inside of the bed here, you basically limit the ability to place the screws inferiorly or your downside screws as we like to talk about that. And we'll have examples of that, obviously. Uh, again, some nuances of where we set up the arm extension. This is the shoulder of the arm. It needs to be kind of above midline at the level of the PSIS. Um, and that just shows kind of where you want it. And this allows you to get the reachability for L2 to L5 all the way to S1 if you need to. Um, if you bunch it up, you can't, you, you won't able to hit your downside screws. Uh, we recommend when you first start doing the positioning that you do get a good true AP and lateral fluoroscopy images, just like you're used to with your um, standard positioning or with your standard uh, OLIF or lateral position so that in case you have to bail or you have to have confirmation, you're used to these 90-90 views, AP and lateral. <clears throat> Again, draping is very important when we do a single position lateral. 
Uh, you don't want a lot of uh, drapes that are kind of fluffing up the field here. That might affect the, the three defined scan, which creates your no fly zone for your, uh, for your robotic arm. Because if you have a lot of fluff down here, it will basically make it so that the arm doesn't think it can reach these trajectories and then you won't be able to place your downside screws. So most of this case is about proper positioning and making sure you can hit the screws on the downside. <clears throat> because we are navigating um, the lateral position and we're navigating the anterior antibodies, um, instead of using the, the robotic arm uh, refer, um, navigation frame, we are gonna do a, a perk pin, um, but uh, instead of putting in the PSIS, we put it in the mid portion of the iliac uh, wing uh, to allow us to navigate to the inner bodies, but also allow us a PSI attachment of, of the robotic arm. Um, and this is just showing it's kind of in between the anterior ASIS, PSIS, uh, trying to find good cortical bone there. It's about um, 10 centimeters um, posterior to the ASIS. Uh, the only rigid fixation you get to the patient during this lateral position is the PSIS pin. So a chance screw needs to be solid into, the, into there. Very key for that. Chance arm should be out, so it should be as straight as possible, and as horizontal as possible, and uh, uh, kind of give this again. This is all about reachability for the arm. And then, if you're going to do any kind of drapes, uh, such as a cranny drape to catch the blood, and you'll see in some of our pictures here, you put this on after you've done the three defined scan. Uh, the three defined scan again to confirm is where we place. Uh, basically a towel over all our surgical field and we basically take five images as the arm comes across the body in order to determine where the arm can go without hitting the patient. And that's kind of what it looks like here. And so you do want to make sure this is kind of tucked in with either water or just manually so that you, you um, create the lowest volume field, work volume field. Um, after that, we do a snapshot position um, of the arm, and basically this takes this, what we call the gingerbread band, and basically this synchronizes the navigation component of the system to the end effector uh, arm right here, and that references off of the patient reference frame during your case. The nice thing about the Mazorex system, um, whether we do a CT to flora or an arm spin, should you lose your navigation, um, or should you bump the frame and need to, and it, you've kind of offset it, you don't need to do a new spin. You can just come back to the snapshot, reset this, and be able to continue your procedure. <clears throat> After the snapshot, we'll then mark out the region of interest um, using uh, the turkey foot, usually the anterior portion of the wound and the inferior portion of the wound uh, or surgical field. And uh, that's called the draw spine. And then that allows us to place the three defined scan uh, sorry, the 3D marker in both the AP and the oblique images. Um, and then you use two, take those two images to um, merge with your preoperative CT, which then also has your preoperative plan. After that, uh, you just can confirm um, your trajectories and then you're able to, then you just, just like a prone position uh, robotic case, you're now just doing the same um, procedure, but on the in the lateral position and basically skin incision. Um, I do a mini Wiltsy or a long Wiltsy, depending on the type of procedure. Uh, most of the time, um, the workflow generally is to uh, place the screws first and then go around the anterior portion and do the inner body and then come back and place the, um, the, pedo the, the uh, rods as well. And again, the pedicle access preparations, now that there we have the high-speed navigated Midas, which goes to approximately 75,000 RPMs, um, basically you dilate down to the, to, the, um, to the dock point, but there is no inner cannula anymore. And then you just do, you can then um, do a high-speed drill. Um, and then that's much more uh, accurate than it used to be. And now we can do a high, um, go straight from the high-speed drilling to a... Uh, uh, I usually hand tap, but you can do a, a navigated tap as well. Uh, there's no end point to the navigated tap, and this, so that's why you just have to be a little bit careful. Um, and and uh, then the screw placement, which is uh, robotic guided but navigated uh, confirmed. So that's kind of the, the workflow. And after you finish place, you basically place all your screws. I'll use the downside screws first and then the top side screws next. And then you'll move to the anterior port. You'll Confirm that you've got um, uh, still a good uh, uh, 
basically accuracy of your nav tracker and everything uh, before you move to the anterior portion. You'll disconnect from the patient um, from the posterior portion and then start your anterior um, oblique inner bodies uh, that we're all used to already. Um, so, and so basically the recommended workflow like we talked about here is registration, place all your screws, We'll disconnect the bone mount, the PSIS pin from the patient, and then you navigate uh, just like a regular navigated position, but off of the Maserex system. Um, and, um, and then you just do those, the procedure that way. Um, you can use the, the planar probe or the chicken foot here to kind of navigate to your first, uh, in, uh, your first disc spaces. And then the access is very similar using the mass dilator to dock in the anterior one third portion of the, of the, of the psoas. And then you have the, just a standard um, dilator here. Okay. Uh, disc prep is navigated as well off the system, as well as the placement of the, um, uh, all the disc prep, uh, all the cobs, um, ring curettes are all navigated off of the Missouri X uh, station. Um, I use the Clydesdale PTC um, because it is navigated and, um, and uh, does, I do like the titanium coating on it as well. So this is no different than what you're already doing in terms of a navigated lateral. And then once you paste your antibodies and have confirmed, you just come back to the rod placement of the rod, um, whether you do a captured rod or a true perk system here. So that's, uh, again, the basics um, of a uh, single position. Uh, that's how we kind of explain it as we go along. Um, when I first started doing these, you start with some very easy kind of cases. Um, this is a 74-year-old uh, uh, female here, a couple years out from a motor vehicle accident, um, some right-sided radicular pain. We have a, a little lateral ascesis with a some spondylosis um, at these levels here and um, have been in pain management for over a year with injections. Uh, we've got kind of some modic changes here, um, three, four, some foramal stenosis bilaterally, right greater than left from, from foramal protrusion, but not too much centrally. So this is a good starting case, uh, very easy access at three, four, a good psoas um, here. Um, Preoperative CT or will do typically like this. Uh, uh, my NRC Charlie will uh, plan out the screws prior. This is kind of uh, after the merge. And these are just some examples of um, this is uh, again, um, that's uh, me working on that side there. This is the uh, chance arm connection here. And you can kind of see where we've kind of placed the screws here. Uh, there's the fiducial or uh, reference frame right there. Um, so a single position like that with three, four placing the screws coming in anteriorly and putting in uh, the Clydesdale PTC, um, it's about probably uh, total time was about an hour and 15 minutes or hour and 20 minutes. So not having to flip um, the patient posteriorly uh, really is uh, very efficient uh, with good, good restoration of alignment and, and height. Um, Another, and then we just is another very similar case, uh, chronic back pain, right thigh pain, single level spondylosis, um, severe spondylosis uh, with motor changes of the end plate there, bilateral foramenary, not too much centrally. Um, kind of this is a demonstration of kind of the position where we're in the lateral, tape along the, the anterior chest, iliac crest, uh, small bump here. Um, patient is back as far as possible on the table so that we can hit the downside screws. Interoperative alarm spin images here. This array is a little bit close um, for doing like a lower level, but perfect for the three, four level there. Um, so we kind of got everything lined up. Um, and this is us uh, here putting in, uh, me putting the downside screws in as well. And then you move to the anterior portion here and then, then do the inner body and then come back and put the cage in there. Um, and kind of similar type uh, reduction. Um, so I started with a bunch of those type of cases first. Um, and, uh, and then so three, four, two, three, those kind of things, very another similar kind of case here. Um, spondylosis, mainly a two, three. A little bit of degenerative stuff at 5.1, but clearly on the MRI and her physical exam is coming from this. So again, very little central stenosis noted here. Um, 
Here's the array here preoperatively, a little off that one, but then there's the interoperative images there of the correction and the deformity that you can get with this. And again, all doing it from a single position um, without having to do any flips uh, as well. And that's what it looks like at three months. Um, and then as you get a little more aggressive or get used to it, it gets to be more and more, um, uh, you can expand your uh, indications a little bit. There's a post laminectomy type syndrome here, previous laminectomy, three to five, a little bit of stuff going on at L2, some thigh, bottom of thigh pain, chronic back pain, as well as some intermittent ridiculous symptoms from neuroforaminal stenosis, a little bit of a degen spondylo um, here at three, four. Really some just gender stuff, nothing too bad, central canals, really foraminal stuff, um, but basically similar type positioning. And um, kind of just showing kind of where we are on the bed here, posterior part of the bed, even though he's a little larger gentleman, uh, posterior to the bed there for identifying. Uh, robot attachment, here's the arm out here. We're just kind of uh, showing that the extension that you need prior to uh, prepping and draping. That uh, I do a lot of scan implants. So this was a scan implant, and then Charlie will, uh, my NRC will plan out all my screws for me, um, and then we do a similar type thing um, at each level there. Um, and this is just a difference, uh, basically a knife tapping screw. But I think there's some video of this as well. And then after you've placed those, you kind of drape those off, and then you can move to the anterior portion and do the inner bodies. And with this many levels, I just, I did two incisions for two, three, uh, one incision for two, three, three, four, and um, a second incision for uh, four, five, um, with a three level construct. Um, again, see a significant time saved by not having to do any posterior um, flipping of the patient, but a nice uh, correction and doing well. And then, so, uh, we do have some video that you know it's, uh, that Charlie might jump on here and help me with here. Um, this is again a case that we did recently. Sixty-four year old gentleman, back pain chronically, um, some left side of radicular pain, uh, pain management, uh, spondylosis. Here you can kind of see two, three, three, four here. Um, I'm sorry, two, three, three, four here. Uh, some yeah, retrolysis going. On. There, um, you can see the, ch the general changes on the MRI and on the uh, T2 imaging here, mostly for antenor type stuff, nothing centrally. Um, this is the positioning here. Again, just like I do with all my images here, we have the small bump to kind of straighten them out a little bit, give them a little bit of uh, support when you're doing the O-lift portion, taping along the lateral crest as well as the uh, anterior uh, chest wall here. Um, just showing here, this is the PSIS pin that you'll use to place here and then the fiducial here. I'm going to try to show some video here. Um, uh, and Charlie, feel free to. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? There. I got to figure out how to start this video. All right. So I sorry about the glare um, for this. Um, uh, we didn't realize that the, the, the camera or the lights were going to be that bright, but this is basically where I just drew, we're going to place the PSIS pin. And I'm just checking to make sure we got a firm uh, connection there. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. Now we're attaching the chance arm of the uh, the robot to that PSI pin. Um, you can do it in either order, but I, I like to get fixation to the um, maybe maybe if I can get there uh, to the patient uh, first before I kind of do anything else. But you try to get that chance arm completely straightened out, and then um, as close to the body as you can. There, trying to just minimize the distance that the arm has to go. And then we lock that down. Okay. All right. 
So once we've got a good rigid fixation to the patient um, uh, with the, the shant screw, and then, then I'll move to the t top here. And just being mindful, this is the, where the patient reference frame is going to go. It's on the iliac crest. Yeah, nope. And basically, I'm just trying to find a good solid docking point here for that. You just have to be mindful what levels you're doing. If you're doing L45 or 5.1, you need to be a little bit more posterior, uh, closer to your PSIS pin, um, because otherwise the the, ref the fiducials or the reference frame will kind of be in your um, uh, orthogonal maneuver uh, position for like four, five, and five, one. Uh, we're definitely four, five, um, and so you got to be mindful of that. So we had we had learned that the hard way a couple of times as well. Um, so I make that incision and basically what I'm doing is I'm dissecting down to um, the iliac crest just to make sure because you want a good fixation on the patient. And so since we're not in a traditional PSIS position, you want to kind of get that that iliac crest bone um, superiorly and not go through the, cord the iliac table or iliac wing uh, because that tends to be not as good fixation. Um, so again, we know the camera is towards the head of the field here, so I'm just trying to And then like that one, so it is. All right, so just checking. So that um, basically, I, when I've got a good fixation point there, like again, I'm gonna make sure, because that's kind of your only real reference frame on the patient, so we would like to have a solid one. You can use the reference frame that's on the robotic arm, and we go back and forth sometimes, uh, but this one, being, this one seems to be more efficient when you're doing the uh, oblique lateral interbody fusion. Okay, so once we got uh, that one um, straight, uh, we've got both the uh, reference frame on and where we like it as well as the chance pin, um, then we're ready to try to get our registrations um, uh, of the, of the uh, lumbar spine. So this is gonna be a scan and plan um, trajectory. So once you get that, we'll usually bring out the drape next. Uh, we'll just put like a towel kind of over underneath overall the uh, anything that might be in the field that the arm might see or might hit. So we drape it over the fiducial here and then kind of tuck it into the PSS, PSIS pin. And then I will usually, because you really want that downside screw. So I'm spending a lot of time making sure that's down and flat and flush the body. And I'll, I'll even squirt some of the water there. Uh, so there to kind of keep it contoured. Okay. And basically, this is the robotic arm coming across here for the five shots um, across the body. Uh, this is probably the longest port. It take, I, what, try to take 60 seconds, I think. Um, yeah. yeah, it takes five, uh, five shots, um, and it does that just so it knows where the patient's at, uh, where it can and cannot go, and then... Oh, we lost each other. Um, yeah, so it's basically, there's an optical uh, uh, array here on the arm and it's taking five shots across the field and you'll see it kind of move sequentially over the, over the field. And it's basically letting the robotic arm know where it is, in, uh, where it can go uh, in space when it's placing the, the screws. And that's one of the benefits of having that towel in there because there's two uh, infrared cameras or two infrared sensors and a camera. So sometimes the IO band or the patient reflection can uh, skew that. So we just kind of drape a, a towel just so it's one big mold over top of the patient uh, so the robot will know where it can and can't go, especially in the lateral position when you're not used to working underneath and working at your hip to put in about a lateral or the right-sided screw. Uh, this helps um, <clears throat> make everything more efficient, and so you're not wasting any more time uh, doing that. Um, well, after that, then, you know, the robot moves into position. Uh, like Dr. Van said, we have the um, uh, cameras at the head of the bed, um, which is typically different than um, navigation where they're at the foot of the bed. Uh, but you'll see the arm moving into a different position now, and it's a, a position known within the software, um, and we put this tracker on there. And so what that tracker is doing, it's making a triangle with the eyes that's at the the front of the bed, the head of the bed, the patient reference frame that he just put in, and then the arm, and it, it creates a triangle. So it knows, hey, that blue is static and the arm's going to move. So I know exactly where the patient is in reference to where the arm is. Uh, we take a snapshot 
simple and process. You can always, as I said earlier, you can go back to that um, mm-hmm. as well, right? Um, at yep. any point in time, if you think you've lost your navigation or your registration for the navigation, you can go back and do the snapshot again, unlike traditional uh, navigation. Uh, what you right. what we just did there was, um, I'm sorry, I tried to just I just marked out roughly where I think that we're going to be working, which is two, three, three, four. Um, and he's going to then send the arm to that position. Uh, and um, this is the 3D, I'm sorry, this is the star marker. Um, and basically the star marker has four little beads in it. And so you need to get, when you're doing the arm spin, you have to get the, the four beads of the star marker um, in your um, preoperative uh, O-arm images, your AP and lateral um, images uh, before you spin. Um, and that can be a little bit challenging in the lateral position when you have to put the patient so far back on the bed because the gantry um, of the O-arm, sometimes you can't get the, you know, it's very hard to get the, the vertebral bodies that you want to, to operate on as well as these four beads on this star marker that you see right here um, in the surgical field uh, or in the O-arm field. Um, and so it's critical that, and you're going to see he'll move it a little bit closer as he can to the skin to the body here. And he's, and as we're getting ready, he's putting it right there. And she's. And this is uh, different than what you the showed in there where you did a preoperative CT where you had already the plan and you bring the X-ray images in there and you take two X-ray uh, images and you can navigate off of that where we didn't have an extra, we didn't have a preoperative CT in this patient. So we took the O-arm in and now we're centralizing this reference frame in the middle of the patient and then going to bring the arm in here momentarily or the O-arm in momentarily to do a scan of the patient and then we'll plan the procedure. You see him driving that as close to the skin as he possibly can to get it so that make sure that we can get it all in the, in the um, O-arm spin. Okay. So that's kind of the setup, like 90% of the procedure is the setup and getting to this point right here, whether you do an O-arm spin or whether we do a um, CT to floor or work floor. It's about getting to this stage and the referencing. Because once you've gotten your reference or your, your registration of the field, of the surgical field, then it's basically um, uh, the same procedure of screw placement, um, um, whether we're doing it prone or whether we're doing it lateral there. Right. All right. What you see here is we're draping that whole patient because um, we do not drape the O-arm. So we'll bring the O-arm in. Uh, we'll take scout shots just to make sure the beads are in the images and AP and a lateral with the O-arm. They're in the images. We do the spin. Then I'll import this CT and you'll see me live playing this case um, <clears throat> right here where we're planning the screws on the fly. So yeah, I didn't uh, do we'll all take the arm trying. back out <clears throat> and we're deciding exactly how far off midline we'd like to be, um, the angles, the type of screws, the tulip heads, uh, we're using Voyager, ATS, Solera. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and once the plan's, in, the plan's set, uh, surgeon reviews, Dr. Van reviews the, the plan, we agree, and we begin to uh, send the uh, arm to each trajectory and we'll show you the steps on how that uh, is executed. Uh, but like you said, getting this step, setting this up, doing it right here will make the case go smoother um, <clears throat> once you get the plan and once you get the screws plan. Yeah, I went back to showing your screws. I went back to showing your screws. He's scrolling through them. He's doing that. And what we're basically saying is that while he's doing these screws, I'm kind of watching it on the screen back here as I'm doing, but I'm also doing all that setup. I'm putting back the cranny drape, I'm getting a kind of all the, the high-speed uh, uh, burr and everything like that to make sure it's uh, ready to roll so that when he shows me, each every time he's putting a level in, he'll show me kind of where he's at and I'll look real quickly and make sure we're happy with where we are. I don't know. I don't know if we have all of them on there. Yeah, this, uh, this, what this process doesn't take, uh, but. No, uh, basically by the time he's done, we're ready. And so, and again, these are hard to see because of the glare, but I, I will say for me, I like to do mini wilties because I, I like to decorticate um, the facet joint and sometimes the TP with the, the navigated mitis or burr. 
Um, so I'll, I'll send them to each one of the trajectories and kind of mark out where I think the trajectory of that screw is. Um, with the dilator, you can also, because this is navigated, you can kind of get a guesstimate if you're, if you're at, if you look like you're pretty accurate and that's what I'm kind of checking to make sure. Does it look like we're, we're in the same plane as his plan? Um, so I'll mark that and check. And if I'm happy with that, and he'll do all of the levels there. And then basically I'll do a little mini Wiltsy, um, um, kind of decide where I want to kind of base that incision. Um, sometimes if I'm doing, if multi, multi levels, we'll do all perk, uh, at each level, but I, cosmetically it seems to look better for me when we do mini, a mini Wiltsy open, uh, type procedure. And so I'll do a little sharp incision and then we will, um, and I usually like to take this down with the bobby just through the outer fascia layer or the first layer of fascia. Um, I'll split the a little bit with my finger down and kind of feel some of the anatomy. Yeah, but everything in the louder position compared to prone, the one thing that is different because you know you only have the two points of where the patient's taped on the crest and the thing and on the anterior chest. So you don't want to be using a lot of manual force against the spine. So you, you can't be jamming the dilator or the drill or the screw into the spine because then you'll deflect the spine and then it will maybe not necessarily mess up your first uh, screw placement, but it, it can definitely uh, affect your other screws. Um, so once we've kind of dilated down, um, I'll take the, the large knife to finish the fascial split um, and maybe extend the incision a little bit. That goes down to the bone right there and uh, going all the way down the bone, split the fascia. And it's all guided by the robotic arm. So the, we're not fighting the arm. We're not navigating to that component. This is the dilator with the outer sheath on it now uh, with the newest uh, instrument set. There's only one cannula, an outer cannula um, that dock, you dock it down to the bone. And I'm just um, docking it there. And we're kind of all watching on the two screens here to make sure we have it looks pretty darn accurate. And I wish I had some better video of that, but... Um, yeah, so we're just confirming. Once I'm happy with that, the inner dilator comes out. Again, I'm just making sure uh, you want that dilator down to the bone, but not, not pushing on the bone, not deflecting the spine. And then this is the high speed, new nav high speed navigated burr. Uh, again, it runs up to 75,000 RPM. So you basically tap that to bone, take that off, and then you drill um, uh, to the um, 30 millimeters and it's got a, a end stop to it, hard end stop. So this is kind of the main step uh, to drill your pilot hole. And then once I'm happy with that, um, I will then bring out the um, tap. Um, you can use a, a, a tapless system, the ATS, the um, uh, all tip uh, screw. Um, but um, in, for the first couple of, and the first times you do it, you should probably hand tap it because this is, you know, five, five tap. So this kind of gives you a good idea of where your screw is going to go. Cause once you tapped it, that's kind of what you've kind of bought it. Um, and after the first couple uh, screws, if I'm comfortable with the accuracy of the system, uh, then I usually switch to a, um, a drill, um, uh, sorry, a, um, a tap on power, basically. Um, and then the first couple, I'll check with nerve monitoring, make sure that, um, that we got um, no issues in terms of where we think we are and nothing mismatches. So the first couple, I'll be a little bit more um, uh, mindful uh, uh, to make sure I'm doing multiple checks to make sure we're where we think we are. So once you got the tap out, uh, the outer cannula comes out, power ease, uh, navigated. Um, and then there's the other reference frame. So you don't need that one on there if you don't want to. Um, and then again, we're, we're navigating the screw placement here. And again, it's so small, but it is basically, um, you're just following the trajectories that Charlie's already planned for me. And we're kind of all watching it. And I can, I'm using a combination of that screen and the screen up here. And then we test that one too. Um, and so I just kind of fast forwarded. We're kind of, we did the downside screws. We did the same thing on the top side. Um, 
And, you know, how, how long Charlie was that probably for us to do? We're on like screw number five here, right? Um, yeah. I mean, we've, we've gotten it down to like 45 seconds of screw um, with right. tapping and or drilling, tapping, um, and placing the screw and then moving on to the next trajectory, <clears throat> especially with the well trained OR staff. But it doesn't take us. Right. And then this is kind of the final one. So at this point, we're pretty confident what's happening with uh, the robot. And it's very been accurate all the entire time. I'm kind of extending that incision slightly there again. And again, dilation down uh, to the bone there, and just confirming the accuracy. Okay. And again, the steps are no different than what we already do. Okay. And just the same steps again, high speed navigated burr, um, drill the pilot hole. Um, and we're getting, just wanted to show you what it looked like real time to what it takes time wise. Um, I'll tap this one with hand as well. And normally by this point in time, um, my PA is getting a little bit bored. Um, so I'll, I'll let her put the screw in here. So very, very straightforward, very easy, a lot less um, fiddle factor. I mean, I've been doing single position lateral starting with um, um, obviously fluoro and then to the Renaissance system. Um, I've also navigated them as well. Um, so uh, this one, is, the robot is very, very consistent. Uh, it's nice that you're able to kind of pre-plan your screw, especially if you have a preoperative CT and kind of know that your screw trajectories are going to be exactly kind of the way uh, that you want it. Yep. It's very repeatable and yep. predictable there on that. And it allows you to, uh, like you said, speed up the, uh, the the time to flip, basically skip the flip. So. All right. And there's some editing in this video here, but I probably only – um, this is, I wanted to get a video that showed us kind of trying to do as much of this in real time as possible. Um, you know, we're coming up on, you know, 20 minutes, but I maybe for those other screws, we probably cut out maybe five minutes just to make it. So it wasn't redundant. Um, mm -hmm. we didn't really cut out a whole lot. And so that's all it takes for the front, for the uh, posterior, uh, screws. And those are Voyager, uh, towers right there. And basically, uh, that's it. Um, when you're, for the posterior portion, um, I do apologize. I don't have uh, the OLIF portion, the anterior portion of the video because it didn't come out, but this is interoperative imaging here showing the screw placement um, before putting the inner body. And then here's the lateral and here we've got, I've already got the D-lift um, uh, dilator in the disc space confirming where I wanted my dock point is. And then um, this is kind of what it looks like after your two OLIFs with the Clydesdale PTCs. That's interoperatively. And um, kind of that's the basic of the procedure. And then postoperatively, again, maintaining that um, correction that we got there. Um, but that patient went home the next morning um, from a two level. And that took a, that case itself took probably about, let's see, 30 minutes for the screws. And then we did about another uh, probably 45 minutes for the inner bodies and then hooking it up. So that was a little bit over an hour and a half, right, Charlie, I think. Um, yeah, that was a, that was a quick. But the olive portion is no different. Once you detach the robotic arm, um, you are navigating. You don't have to have the S8 system and the Mazur system in there. Using the Mazur system, you can navigate just like you would with all the instruments you normally would with uh, the S8 station if you navigate uh, OLIFs. Um, and uh, I think that was the last one there. All right. Do you have anything else, Charlie, that you want to? Uh, no, I mean, I think 
I think you pretty much summed it all. The, the main the main difference is the speeding up the, of the time, the, the planning, the pre-planning, uh, being able to, to plan out your screws to know where exactly you're going to uh, place them to go in with the plan, have your whole incisions already marked out and, hey, I'm, all, I'm this far off a midline um, to know where you're going to be able to place the uh, inner body in there with the planning of the mazor, um, and then navigating to the disc space with the mazor. Um, it becomes just one one solid machine, the combination of the stealth station, the O arm, and then the Mazor X um, <clears throat> stealth edition all becomes uh, just one unit um, and makes it for a very efficient and uh, repeatable, practical uh, case and procedure. Would you say? Very much so. I mean, um, yeah, we do. I moved a lot of my cases to laterals now just because it's a lot easier. I used to do a lot of single position laterals, but then I did a lot of anterior plating um, up to two levels. Uh, but I was finding that even if we got good reduction with 22 millimeter width cages, I was still seeing a lot of late subsidence um, of the cages with the um, uh, with lateral plating. And so now I pretty much always do posterior fixation, which is much more predictable in terms of the healing and maintaining the correction that, that we get. Um, yeah. But that's kind of the basics of that of that uh, procedure. I just uh, didn't know if there, if there were some questions or anything like that. So uh, thank you, Dr. Jed, for that wonderful presentation and uh, taking us through uh, the wonderful journey that how uh, the Mizar is basically very, very crucial and useful for doing those kind of single position uh, olives. A couple of quick questions, Dr. Jed, which has come in from the audience. Um, have you... Uh, what is your opinion in terms of doing standalone olefts versus posterior fixation, uh, like the pros and cons of it? Well, as I was just saying at the end of that, um, I, I did use a lot of standalone uh, single uh, position olefts. Um, and when I do that, I typically had done like, I try to get larger uh, with implants in 22 millimeter Clydesdale PTCs. Um, and I usually plate and I'll do up to two. I used to do up to two levels. So I used to be a very, a favorite part of my, I just worry of a favorite thing that I used to do, but I, I would worry because these people would do, do really well postoperatively, you know, leg pain be gone, back pain, but much better. And then, uh, they'd start having kind of recurrent type symptoms like six months later. And I had a case and I show a case when I'm in the lab, uh, when I'm teaching it, that where you get some late subsidence with the anterior lateral plating. And we know that biomechanically, uh, the fixation is not, you know, it's not like you're providing a good biomechanical uh, fixation for the plating. It's not as strong as posterior pedicle screw fixation. And, you know, my biggest reason I didn't like doing the posterior fixation is because back then it meant, okay, you got to flip them back over, you know, uh, reprep, redrape. That's another hour on a day there versus just throwing a plate on. Um, now in the same amount of time of putting a plate on, I can draw, I place the pedicle, especially at one level, I can put pedicle screws in with this system and do the, the OLIF. And, and then I, I don't have that late subsidence of uh, the inner bodies. I have to worry about them not healing. Um, uh, that's, that's kind of why I've started going more and more to this versus uh, just the anterior lateral plating. I'll sometimes not do the plating. I'll do still do some plating here if I've got somebody who is um, just adamant that they don't want posterior fixation um, and uh, they're younger and they have kind of like a good bone quality. And I'm pretty sure I can get a, a good 22 by 50 millimeter, 55 millimeter graft across. Um, uh, but I always do still now counsel them that, Hey, if it's such a subside, you're going to need posterior fixation. Um, if it's an older osteoporotic, um, a uh, little lady, um, or, or a little less likely to have good bone quality to support a standalone, then I'm more likely to do posterior fixation. Right. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, question. I think that clarifies the, uh, question. Um, the, uh, another question which has come in. Um, what are your thoughts on doing or performing OLIF in cases with spondylolisthesis? Spondylolisthesis. I mean, I, um, I don't have a problem with it. And I think that um, because we put the screw, we'll put in the Voyager screws 
you know, first, but we won't put rods in and I'm very comfortable. It's indicated for up to grade one uh, for that. But I think if you do, um, when I have spondylolisthesis and I need to do a reduction or I want to try to get a reduction, um, I think it's still great up to one in grade one and a half. You can do that. You just have to do a little bit more uh, aggressive. I do a little more aggressive discectomy, release of the annulus. Um, to, to allow me to get a little bit of more of um, a reduction before I put in uh, the uh, O-lift cage. And then posteriorly, we've got some uh, reduction maneuvers that you can do if you want to try to reduce that even further uh, using your screws after you've done the anterior, technical anterior release and, and inner body. So I, it's, um, again, I still I'll do open cases like I do laterals. I do a little bit of both. Um, I have colleagues that do all their grade one, one and a half spondylolisthesis is anteriorly with Olus um, all the time. Um, and it's their preferred approach. Uh, so um, it's a, it's still a very good tool for reducing those. Uh, you just have, and versus doing it for a strictly degen uh, or lateral ascesis, um, uh procedure, you just have to be a little bit more um, thorough with your discectomy and release so that you can get the reduction you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question actually from the audience. Um, in patients where there is um, uh, like uh, sclerotic patients where there is a presence of large osteophytes, do you find it challenging? If yes, how do you evade them? Um, yep. Uh, and we'll push the envelope on those two. Uh, when we're talking about the anterior releases and stuff, um, if you have... Um, so if I have some a person that has a lot of osteophytes, um, uh, basically I will kind of uh, dissect down through the psoas um, and whether I'm doing just an anterior so anterior the psoas or dissect around those osteophytes. And you generally there's a big pituitary rondure. You try to remove those first so that you have you know where your 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 vertebral body really starts. Um, and so I am pretty aggressive about trying to resect as much of those as I can, kind of going up underneath the muscle or I'll retract, have my, my assistant retract the muscle posteriorly, and I'll take as much of that down. Um, when we're having really collapsed disc bases, they have a nice tool. Um, we call it the oyster shucker, but it's a kind of a small flat. It's probably no more than, um, I don't know if Charlie can remember, it's like more at no more than like four millimeters or five millimeters. Um, but you can use that to kind of slowly release the disc space um, and see if you can get it to kind of basically pop those discs back open. And a couple of those cases that I had on there were pretty collapsed, um, but it's a really good tool. You just have to be mindful of what the quality of bone of the person that you're working with. So you don't go up into the end plates um, and just patience because you got to usually have to do multiple passes to slowly kind of open that disc space. And then once you get that across and then work the disc a little bit, even if there's not much in there, you usually can get a six millimeter um, shaver or um, blunt trial that they have across the disc space as well. Right. Thank you. Um, I think uh, one last question that has come in. Um, what is the ideal graph sol solution that you use considering the budgetary limitations uh, uh, of Infuse, which is quite expensive? Sorry, somebody asked me to start a video. Um, can you repeat that question again? So uh, the question was like, what are your ideal choice for graft considering that Infuse is kind of uh, expensive for some patients? Right, and we struggle with that here. Um, Infuse works really well, but it is very expensive. Um, yeah, but I, if I, I, and I, and to be honest, I do now typically like to use an extra small infuse that had and then kind of pack it with dbm um uh, in the cage before i put it in um other options i mean i've done uh, uh basically dbm uh, graft i've used also a fiber based uh cell based uh, type um uh, graft as well um cbm um, but, you know, that can also get expensive too sometimes, but uh, it is still cheaper than uh, infuse at times. Um, we've also used um, uh, sponges um, and then we kind of aspirate a little bit off the iliac crest out of that uh, attachment point that we had the PSIS. So we've done that uh, where we've used um, basically um, uh, these uh, DBM sponges and then put them in there and then that's a little bit cheaper too. And you get some of the patient's own biology in there theoretically. All right. Thank you. Um, 
if if there are any other questions i would request the audience they may uh, unmute and ask can i ask bharat dave yes sir please go on yeah, yeah. Uh, means has the surgical time increased with this gadgets or has it given more comfort um i think i have the question i think whether the does it increase time or in the or or i mean yeah yeah again as i said earlier when i first started i mean i did everything freehand or fluoro for many many years um and then over the last 7 years i've kind of developed robotics and it really has kind of because we use it uh, probably in the time now Charlie right it is kind of like really made it much more efficient i can put the screws in um and whether we're doing a single position lateral or any other procedure you it really takes the stress out of the case because it's one less thing that you got to worry about a fiddle factor wise um in terms of like when i do t4 to aliums or bit long constructs like that and you can place all the screws and we're putting them in in 15 seconds at a time so you don't get that fatigue from the case from putting the screws in before you've even started the deformity correction the osteotomies the the pcos psos and stuff so it really has made that portion of the procedure um uh not like mindless but a little less stressful so you, you can focus um on the procedure and then really we're as fast with the robot now than we were with uh freehand um uh if you break Charlie I would say yeah and and cuts down the radiation um taking spot checks here and there shot 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 uh to see where you're at too so it definitely it definitely speaks up right once you get the uh, flow of it and you have a good um staff and you have a good plane going into it right and navigation can be fast too right we have all done that as well mostly it can be but there is that human factor unfortunately that still you can you can fake out nav uh and make a nav picture look good but you end up looking at x-rays that don't look so good and but the good thing is if you don't fight the robotic arm you know it is it is this is robotic guided navigated confirm but if you don't fight the arm then the trajectories that you plan are the trajectories you get right sir thank you thank you so if there are any other questions sorry sorry uh, uh, the main concern has been the disposables means it's quite an expensive thing when you look at the robots and uh, the oom navigation when you compare the two the cost of the disposable goes very high i mean any idea how to circumvent that hmm yeah i'm not sure because every country would be a little bit i guess different with it you talk about the disposables for each set um and charlie again if you can if you're able to sit and talk then um what is the general cost for us Do you know uh it range it it all all based on the discounts that we have in hospitals but from a few hundred to maybe a thousand or so it uh it just all ranges i mean discounted and list price and if you're doing contracts or if you're giving the giving them away as well too so Yeah, I'm not sure there's a great way to go around it. I mean, the capital expense for the robot is the robot, you know, it is what it is. Um, but they, there is a disposable kit that comes with it. Uh it's a, roughly the same whether you do scan and plan or whether you do CT to fluoro. I don't think the costs are that much different. Um, but typically, Charlie's right there. Usually, you can think in your mind for us, we we know that each each kit that we open is probably $800. Um you know but the the cost of the robotics and those kind of things when we talk about we do discussions with hospital um executives is you know if we can create a system or environment where we're placing screws with an accuracy of 98% if you can avoid for us in the United States if you can avoid you know two surgeries repeat surgeries a year for misplaced hardware then you've more than made up the your cost um uh, uh or return on investment of your robot i suppose that is because of the insurance company pays but in in our part i'm from india in our part you know sometimes patient has to pay from the pocket so that's why it becomes a big challenge for us to use the robotic uh, you know the the the, the gadgets 
Yeah, well, I, I, agree. <laughs> I yeah. mean, yeah, my, if you have to pay out of pocket for it all versus um, the way we have it, our system here, and then it is going to be some probably a little bit cost prohibitive unless you could find a way to bulk purchase um, um, the disposables. Yeah, uh, my next question is, means what is your uh, take on the cervical spine surgery about the robot? Uh, can you repeat that again? I'm sorry, didn't you? Yeah, this cervical cervical spine surgery. We are we are comfortably doing the OM navigation for the cervical spine, but uh, for the robotic use for the cervical spine, pedicle screw fixation. Means, are you comfortable using the robot? Uh, yeah, we've used it all the way up to um, what? See, I have used it personally up to uh, plating, placing lateral mass and then pedicle screws from to C five. Uh, mm -hmm. and down through the cervical thoracic junction. I mean, obviously, uh, I think navigation is very good up there at the cervical thoracic junction too, because there's not a lot of bulk there, but I, I, in terms of the accuracy that we get, especially if I'm doing uh, like a oste posterior osteotomy at 7-1 or something like that, um, Charlie will sometimes, will place the screws, but he can also kind of give me my trajectories for my cuts and everything like that. Um, up at the university, the, the academic university um, at, in Virginia here, I know Charlie and a couple of the neurosurgeons there, they've placed uh, C2 um, screws as well uh, using the robot, although it's not necessarily um, uh, uh, approved for that here in the United States yet. Um, it, they are working on that, right, Charlie, in terms of um, uh, getting it approved completely for cervical. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 indicated, for it. it's indicated for it, uh, cervical spine all the way down, but uh, the mounts and the different uh, size drill bits and stuff that are, are still being in the works of making it. But uh, we have done cervical screws with the robot just as accurate. Um, <clears throat> that's not something we are, we're doing all the time, but uh, we do. Um, we do place those C6, C7. Um, for doing all the way down to T1, T2. So. Yeah, and the, the beauty of the, the, we talk about the robot for placing pedicle screws, but really the Mazur software, because you we didn't get into detail here, obviously has the segmental registration of each one of the vertebral bodies. So down the pipeline, what we're looking at is building whole, you know, very holistic type um, constructs, being able to plan your inner bodies, whether it's a single position lateral, posterior, you'd be able to plan your cuts, um, possibly be able to get pre-bent rods, um, some of your decompression being performed with robotic guidance uh, because we have the ability to do the accuracy um, due to the software. Uh, so it's it, the, the pedicle screw part of this is just the beginning. I don't think a lot of people would have bought a robot just for pedicle screws as a side point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dave and Dr. Van for those answers. A uh, couple of more questions coming in, Dr. Van. Um, do you prefer doing T lift still when you have uh, adopted OLIF? And which are the indications that you uh, still reserve uh, OLIF is not ideal? And the follow up to that is do you still use the Mazar for OLIF L5S1? Yes, um, I'll work backwards on that one. Uh, you can do um, robotic posterior fixation. Um, I do, we do ATP or anterior psoas to L5S1 exposures and fusions. Um, sometimes I, I'll back those up uh, percutaneously. Sometimes if I can get a good graft in anteriorly with an anterior plate um, uh, at L5S1, uh, we'll do that as a standalone. I'm much more comfortable at that level. So. But um, again, we have guys that are doing 5-1 single position. Where I like this OLIF is kind of that multi-level um, uh, OLIF uh, and backing it up that way or even single levels. Um, as for, um, again, I'm a traditionalist in terms of uh, decompression. So you saw a lot of my initial cases and a lot of the little cases I do, I tend to, to look for a foraminal nerve, a degenerative type condition, but also nerve foraminal narrowing, a lot of recess stenosis. I have some kind of, again, colleagues that will, um, that will do everything as an OLIF and really believe in indirect uh, decompression and time. Uh, I, I like to, if I have somebody who has a lot of central stenosis, or, then I will still do um, um, 
like uh, I don't do as much T list now, but I do a lot of uh, uh, cortical approaches. And so the robot is very, very good for a cortical approach because it's through the same kind of one inch incision that we do a bilateral laminectomy, say at L45 for central canal stenosis. I can do a decompression, uh, cortical screw trajectories, and do the fusion. And it's uh, basically an outpatient type procedure. Um, so, and, and same thing, if I got somebody who's got some lateral recess or framostosis bilaterally or unilaterally, um, but not too much centrally, then I still sometimes will do a T-lift with facet resection and decompression kind of with bilateral wilties. So it really depends where the patho- it really depends where the pathology is, because I still think that if you don't get the nerve roots or neural elements decompressed, then you can't, you know, the patient's not going to be very happy. So I haven't adopted the O-lift for everything type mentality. Um, so I do go back and forth depending on what I think the patient needs uh, in terms of their relief. Hopefully that answers the question there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jed. Um, so I think if there are no further questions from the audience, I think uh, thank you so much, Dr. Van, for taking this time out and uh, educating all of us on the next level of OLIF, that is single position OLIF with Mazar. Thank you once again, uh, for all the effort and thank you everyone for joining in. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Indranil, and thank you, Dr. Jed, for your exciting session. And uh, so we still have time for the next, uh, uh, you know, pre-event workshop that is going to start by 11 a.m. So we are going to log off for a little while, take a little break and then come back and online by 11 a.m. to attend the next pre-event workshop from the Spine. Thank you, everyone.
Umesh, can we start a session by ten forty-five? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, it's clear. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So, shall we start? Are the uh, are we live or not yet? We are live, sir. We can start. Okay, okay. Hello. Uh, so, good morning, everyone, again, and uh, you know we. welcome you all to the part 2 of the pre event workshop and this is an industry sponsored session that is going to be done by deputy spine for the next 1 1 and 1 hour 15 minutes and the topic that they have chosen is a revolutionary approach to minimally invasive screw fixation a guide wireless mis screw fixation that is the hallmark of their new system that is wiper prime and to conduct this session we have two eminent faculty from our from our country ms dr aish sharma and dr uh, uh, subir javeri so who are going to present their cases and share their experience with wiper prime and also take part in discussion later on um so uh, i would like to hand over the session to ms samiksha shrivastava who is going to host the deputy spine session so ms samiksha are you there yes Can sir Yes sir yes sir yeah yeah sure so you can take over from here uh, welcome dr ayush welcome uh, dr subir javeri uh, to the event and to this particular session from deputy spine and uh, you know samiksha is going to take over from here thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank you for introducing us and we also want to thank uh, the organization for giving us the opportunity to have this workshop at the stage so and and i welcome all the delegates thank you for taking out to attend this event so without further ado i will jump right on to the introduction of dr ayush sharma and dr subir zaveri first of all thank you doctors for taking out your precious time and uh, being a part of this conference especially from uh, the side of deputy synthesis and uh, starting with dr ayush sharma so dr ayush sharma has actually been the pioneer for us for viper prime in india he has uh, been leading various various uh, a lot of surgeries of uh, the prime and uh, as far as his introduction goes so he is the director of laser spine uh, you can check out the website www.laserspine.in he is the chief spine surgeon and unit head of spine surgery department of orthopedics and spine surgery at dr baba saheb ambedkar central railway hospital in mumbai he is also an executive member of assi uh, and uh, he has also been an aosin delegate from like he is currently an aosin delegate as well dr ayush sharma has uh, done his fellowships in uh, like with the various institutions to his uh, medal and uh, some of them are as below indian spinal injury center at new delhi helios clinicum erfurt germany the general hospital attica cat Athens, Salford Royal Hospital at Salford UK, Royal Manchester Children's Hospital at Manchester UK, Queen's Medical at Nottingham, and Sadar Sinai in California. So, sir, I mean, we are just—I mean, just just wonder how did you manage to, uh, you know, have so many uh, fellowships and such such a great uh, profile at at your side. and uh, so thank you for that and congratulations and moving on to dr zaveri thank you for a, such a elaborate introduction so <laughs> it was just sure sir me to visit all the beautiful places thank you so much right sir now moving on to dr zaveri so dr zaveri has specialized in adult and pediatric spine surgery and the mind spinal tree construction He has more than three thousand spine surgeries under his belt across all pathologies ranging from trauma, degenerative infection, etc. And Dr. Subir Zaveri is also a fellowship trained spine surgeon who has Excuse an extensive. Excuse me, Samiksha. You can yes. share your screen if you would want, so audience would be able to watch your screen. Uh, if it's fine, fine like this, I'm I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. This is okay. Okay. Thank you. So Dr Subir Zaveri is also a fellowship trained spine surgeon who has an extensive experience in the management of spinal disorders and he undertook specialized training in adult and pediatric spinal problems at world renowned institutes in Toronto Canada for a period of 2 and 1/2 years he has also trained at the Toronto Western Hospital 
uh, at hospitals for sick children and at Sunny Brook Health Science Center, all of them in Toronto. Dr. Zaveri underwent medical, medical, basic medical and orthopedic training at Ahmedabad. And after training as a consultant or orthopedic surgeon for seven years, he undertook specialized spine surgery at various centers in North America. And uh, he has worked with various surgeons like Dr. Isidore Lieberman at the Cleveland o Clinics, Ohio, and uh, with Dr. Stephen Lewis, Dr. Michael Fehlings, Dr. Joel Feigenstein, and Dr. Albert Thiel. So he has, he, and now he has established his spine surgery practice at Ahmedabad. And he has an experience of more than nine years of performing exclusive spine surgery with patients from across the globe, based in Gujarat, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh, and also remotely. So, welcome, Dr. Zaveri. Welcome to you again. And uh, I would now give over to Dr. Ayush Sharma to begin with his uh, presentation. So, Dr. Ayush Sharma, over to you. Please. Uh... Allow me to start my video. Yes, sir. I'm starting your video, sir. Give me a moment. So, can I start, sir? Please start the video. Not see the video playing. Are you there? Yes, sir, the video is playing. Actually, uh, we can't see the video. So, can you please uh, switch the tab and? Uh... You have to share it and restart the video. We cannot see it on the screen. Please. I'm redoing it, sir. Give me a minute. Yeah, sure. Can you open the video first and then click on share screen? Mesab Surgical Symposium. Today we will be talking on. Hi, uh, can you please? Sorry to pause. Can you please restart the video? Thank you. Welcome to Mesab Surgical Symposium. Today we will be talking on a novel technique. Which is a guide wireless MIS pedicure. Something is coming on the screen. The new, system, new hidden town from Viper Prime. So, this is one of my cases. You see, what has happened is uh, the this tap has broken in, and this was not allowing my guide wire to go in. So, basically, we had to put a lanky probe and take a completely new trajectory so that I can place my screw in the trajectory which I wanted. 
you look at the literature, there are a lot of complications which arises just because of the guide wire in the MIS pedicle screws. It could be as simple as this broken guide wire here, or it could be a migration of guide wire, which is very, very common when we have an osteoporotic pedicle. Or it could be as devastating as this leak in the abdominal aorta due to the guide wire like going anterior and hitting it. So if we look at the complication which arises from guide wire misplacement, it could be as high as 14.8%. And this is where this new system this comes into play which because it eliminates the need of guide wires and Jamshedi needle because basically it is a stylet based system. So this is how the system works. This is a knob which controls the length of the stylet. So you can increase the length of the stylet or you can decrease the length of the stylet depending upon your need. So you can just need to rotate and derotate to achieve that. Let's look at a video how exactly these screws can be placed. So the entry point is the same for any pedicle screw, either MIS or open. This first these sleeves go in. These are dilator sleeves. So I'm just putting dilator sleeves just to dilate the muscle. And straight away you take the screw. No need of guide wire, no need of jump shady. And once you have you start in the, your regular starting point, you confirm your entry on the CR. So that's what we will do right now. Just making sure that we are on the lateral edge of the pedicle. And already if you see some amount of stylet is already out so that I can take the entry. So once I have a bony entry, I will use the knob to increase the length of the stylet. So, so just that's what I'm doing. So I'm just increasing the length of stylet so that I can cross the pedicle. So these are calibrated. You can see how much length you are going in. And again, you can use the CR to confirm where you are. So just that now I've, I've, I looks like I've crossed the pedicle and the lateral view. So like, like any other system, we'll again take an AP as well to make sure that we have crossed the pedicle in medial border of the pedicle in AP as well. So these basic principle of putting a pedicle screw remains the same no matter which system you use and one has to follow it thoroughly. So we are, looks like it, we are good enough. So I, I will just now I will go through and complete the job. So one of the best part of the system is because you have the full weight of the screw is in your hand. So you can really do it targeted approach. So unlike a Jamsidi or a flimsy guide wire, you can really target the point you want to hit because you can do some minor correction in between. So here we are in S1. So I like to have a tricortical purchase. So I'm trying to uh, hit the promontory. At the same time, you need to prevent the rock from, not from rotating because now the whole screw is going in. So that's what I'm doing. I'm doing small minor adjustments so that I hit the promontory of S1. So I think we, we just, so this is, so if you look like this, looks like a bullseye, the stylet just hit the promontory. Now here, it's very important you take the stylet back in so that it doesn't damage anything anteriorly before you tighten the screw fully. So now if you see, I'm just that, that you can see the whole of the tricortical purchase coming in, just one to two turn and we, this looks like a good trajectory. And uh, now you can remove the system. So you just need to derotate and take the whole system will come out. And then you, you can take out the dilators as well. So this is what we are doing right now. So just taking out the system. So that is a, that, that, that's the end of the screw. And when the system comes out, your soft tissue dilator comes in, comes out. Just for the demonstration, we'll take a AP shoot here just to make sure that uh, we, the trajectory was good in AP as well. So this looks like a good enough trajectory here. So uh, 
the other advantage of the system is you can use this to augment the screws with cement in case you are in osteoporotic plaque vertebra you don't need to do anything the same screw could be used for a cement augmentation uh, like some of the other system you don't need to take this separate stab incision same same stab incision of the screw can be used to put the rods in and uh, the other good part is the profile of the screw is very very small so you can do multiple screws in one go so if you see here what i am doing is i am doing a l5s1 now sometimes the l5s1 put together could be very tricky because they they keep hitting you but here the profile is very small your specialized device to hold the other screw so even even in l5s1 with quite some degree of s1 slope uh, you we were able to put two screws simultaneously it uses the use of your fluoro this reduces radiation so the what i mean is the system is very very nicely designed for for you to use it effectively so so you see we are doing two screws together both the screw are getting checked in a lateral uh, in a ap view together so we reduce our cm shoots so so what all this in turn results in you spend more time in targeting the screw and in screw placement rather than putting guide wire or in 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 tapping the screw now this is one of our cases she was a 50 year female she presented with back pain and neurological claudication i can see here there's a grade 2 almost a grade 2 mesthesis and this is the flexion extension view and there is also a canal stenosis which is happening due to the compression from this thesis so we uh, have decided to do a minimally invasive tilif we put the cage first and then this is the case i showed you we did a the mi screws then and we could really get a tricortical purchase here and then the l5 screws are placed so one again beautiful thing about this system is this is a all reduction screw so the last grade of this thesis you can reduce it completely at the same time, we'll see the video now. At the same time, compress it to get the final grade of reduction and get your lordosis back. So, what if you see what we are doing is the L5, L4 has been tightened. The L5, we are using the reduction principle to get the final grade of lysthesis. So, I'm tightening the screw at the same time, my system is compressing. So, we are compressing and reducing the L5 over S1 at the same time. And then the, the system is very easy. You take out everything. And now we'll do the final tightening. And if you look, just hear the sound of the final tightening. It will remind you of using a open screw. So this system has all the advantages of an open screw. At the same time, it gives you an option of doing a minimally invasive screw fixation. And that is the beauty of the system. And this is what you could achieve in this case, a complete reduction and complete restoration of the sciatal balance. This is another case, a significantly degenerated L34 lytic lysthesis. And uh, we decided to do a lateral position surgery here. So first we place the L34 olive cage to get the height back. And then we use this viper prime system to do the posterior fixation. And if you see, uh, this is a sclerotic pedicle, but because you have a very sharp and strong stylet, this putting the screw in sclerotic pedicle also becomes very, very easy due to the system. Not only we could get a good screw placement, the ease of the system allowed us to do everything in single position. Means we can do the whole surgery, both the OLIF and the screw placement in lateral position. And this eliminated the need to, do, to flip the patient uh, to posterior to do the posterior fixation. And this is what we could achieve a complete restoration of uh, the sciatal balance and complete correction of the scoliosis. And this is the final CT uh, scan picture. And because of the low profile of the screw, you can see how look at this small stab incision for the screw case. They're really, really tiny. And this was for the olive. So everything together is very, very small, keeping in line with the minimally invasive principle of the spine surgery. This is our last case. She's a 
was a 60 year female she had undergone a l3 to l5 laminectomy 5 years back and she presented to us with degenerative scoliosis with uh, a significant PILL mismatch of 34.9 degree and there's multiple level can uh, foramen stenosis so first we did a uh, three level olf surgery and to correct the scoliosis that you can see here and then we use the posterior fixation and we use the viper prime screws here so what if you see closely what we have done is we have used the viper prime in the top and bottom end as I told you, they are, they are all reduction screws, just like you do in any scoliosis cases. You use the reduction screw in top and bottom end to make your life easy. So the same principle we have used so that we can put a really, really lordotic rod even in, in a MIS fixation. So this is what we could do finally. So we had completely corrected the scoliosis from 31.1 degree to 2.7 degree. And even we got the striatal imbalance back. Look at the not only the lumbar, but look at the restoration of the thoracic kyphosis. So, based on my experience with Viper Prime, I like to conclude that Viper Prime is a novel technique of percutaneous pedicle screw placement that if we meet the need of guide wire, thus making it safer than the traditional minimally invasive screws. With this, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cannot start the video. Should I start Dr. Subir Javeri's video, sir? Yeah, yeah. so I think uh, we'll go to the next talk and then we can do the discussion. So you can start uh, Dr. Javeri's video sure. and then yeah, we'll do the discussion. Sure. sure, sir, I'll do that. That was a nice case, the uh, presentation, Ayush. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very nice. Well done. Are you all able to see the screen, sir? Yeah, we can see it. Hi, Hi friends. Uh, I am Dr. Subir Javeri, a spine surgeon practicing in Ahmedabad. I have been working here at uh, Dr. Javeri's Spine Hospital for the last 13 years and have been trained in minimal invasive surgery the Toronto Western Hospital. He today, actually, uh, today we did a guide wireless medical uh, screw system, what is known as Viper Prime by debut. Uh, from what the company person told tell me, perhaps the first one in Gujarat. I found it quite comfortable to use. The system is uh, been thought of and designed in a very nice way and there is the concept is to graduate from a guide wired system to a guide wire less system uh, i am sure my co-speaker dr ayush is going to show you a case where things have gone wrong uh, guide wires and i am sure all of us who you who have used the guide wire uh, systems, the system that incorporate guide wires uh, have encountered that the guide wire goes through the front. Sometimes it goes and uh, goes near the bow and it scares the hell out of all of us. So this kind of a system actually uh, would be definitely beneficial. Uh, we'll show you the x-rays of our case that we did today. The 
patient who was uh, previously operated patient of mine i had operated a disc prolapse on him at the l3 4 level uh, he had a sacralized l5 so technically it was the second last mobile segment and uh, today i had taken him to the theater because since last two months he has had a recurrent disc prolapse severe pain little bit of focal stenosis and a lot of back pain he also was a slightly heavy individual and a 10 kilo individual with significant back pain not able to sit for 15 20 minutes so we decided to do a fusion in his case stability but the reason uh, is what i described from my experience today with the viper prime i am absolutely very happy and absolutely i would say amazed at the ease with which i could put those screws perhaps it does require a little bit of previous experience with the guide wire systems and the jamshiri to be able to do this comfortably at the first go small k wire that is inbuilt in the system allows you one and allowed me to use it as a jamshiri at the beginning of a jamshiri and then allow my screw to enter there is very low margin of error and so one has to be very particular and the cm has to be angled exactly uh, at the, that particular level for the screws to go in at the perfect spot and even on the first go there is no second chance one has to be very careful one important point is that you if you are doing an l5 s1 fusion then what will happen is that you will be wanting to put bicortical screws at s1 so in that scenario the screws of this system have got a fluted tip and that fluted tip can potentially come out so one has to be very careful with the length that you desire so uh, there is just a tip from what i learned and 
one has to be very particular while beginning uh, putting the screw because once you put the screw in then there is no going back you have to go through forward because it creates a wider channel and you can't change anything after that but overall a, a fantastic experience i was very happy whatever time really it takes is the cage the screws was like hardly any time there was no jamshi the guide wire tap screw kind of thing all these four steps were amalgamated into one step and little bit of uh, twisting of the guide wire using the knob to advance the guide wire then advance the screw guide wire screw and then the screw itself completely so it was very efficient time saving and uh, very user friendly the cost expense is something that we will not discuss here let the company person decide thank you so friends i am sure uh, whatever uh, we could show you in this short period of time to demonstrate the k wireless or the guide wireless system has uh, given you some insight uh, into the entire surgical uh, technique if there are any questions that any of you want my experience is relatively short but i would be more than happy to help you address and uh, take you on to that that stage as well thank you So thank you Dr Ayush Sharma and Dr Subir Zaveri for uh, taking us through these videos these were, these were actually clear succinct live videos that told us like your experiences of the surgery and of course detailing the product benefits and features so uh, now i would like to open the floor for q and a and uh, after that you can also visit our stall at the uh, exhibitor hall so we are present there you can also visit you can also download the brochures and check them out not just for viper prime but for many other products so i open the floor for q and a who is the moderator for the case for the session so it's a i mean it's an open q and a session we are all connected through the uh, i think it's the operator uh, or the organizer uh, platform but the attendees they will be on a different platform right so someone has to tell us that if there are any questions or we can discuss ourselves it will be a different platform where the viewers will be online so we are checking for the questions uh, in case if there are any questions we'll uh, drop you in give us a second right uh, meanwhile ayush uh, yeah. i i i actually like that you did those cases in the lateral position the one that you did the olif now uh, was it uh, was there any form of guidance or was it just plain fluoro that you you did the lateral position thing so now we are very comfortable with uh, all laterals so all our single position olifs are all lateral and i find it not like as is a doing in supine yeah once you do first one or two cases and your mind gets oriented i think there is no difference to whether you do uh, lateral or you do a um, uh, like or at the supine position but still uh, the only few things is uh, we have not been doing uh, more than one or two levels uh, up to two levels we have done in lateral but multi level 3 4 we still do in supine because sometime it could be bit tricky but uh, we are doing all fluoro and and we started using viper prime for the ease of it and uh, for the lateral but uh, even if you don't use viper prime i think uh, it's there is not not much a issue doing a single position lateral that's what our experience has been probably you know uh, breaking a barrier that's what perhaps uh, it's a mental barrier more than anything else so we are mentally due to you know like 15 20 degree medial now to translate it into lateral and then doing it uh, it probably does require a special uh, thought process in the brain but i, I Yeah, just men, just your mental makeup. Once you start seeing it that way, then it becomes as is doing your any other case. You do few cases, and your brain will reorient yourself to that, and then it is you won't find a problem. I'm 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 telling you from what now we have done uh, almost now all our single level olive for sure 
or all single position learning. So after doing a few cases, I am telling you, one or two cases we found it slightly challenging. Now I'm, we are very very comfortable, and uh, your OT staff, everyone will become part of the team, and you will you won't even feel that you are doing something different. So um, we are trying to. Sir, we have checked in the platform. There are no questions uh, asked by anybody. Right. So, so then let let me ask Ayush. He has done much more cases than I did. I probably just it was just yesterday we had our MIS to live. I planned and they brought the wiper prime. So let's do a wiper prime. It's okay. So I just you know uh, went through the uh, videos and we did it. It was good. So everything what you see is the last twenty four hours. We don't have enough material and enough plan. to put up a proper lecture anyway so i was uh, based on your experience at l5 s1 uh, did you do anything different at s1 because that was what the i had a little bit of apprehension about the fluted tip coming out at the bicortical uh, level so yeah. what's your uh, take on that so, so there are few good things about the system and there are few things you have to be careful first of all normally i'll measure the length because you know you could get good as you rightly point So how do you measure the length preoperatively? Yeah, CT scan based. So we know exactly where we get a CT scan if you are doing a Piper Prime L5 S1 or or on X-ray we have distal X-ray which can mark it. We have a back system in our hospital. So hmm. either one of them for L5 S1 for sure will like to have the measurement. But what I like about the system is I prefer it now for my uh, s1 schools because you know what the problem we face when we are i always try to hit the promontory i i make it a point that i have a tricortical purchase for all my s1 school my biggest challenge has been the if what happens you your guide wire if you go and hit the promontory uh, with the uh, with your jamshedi the guide wire will keep migrating and uh, or on sometimes it is very difficult to penetrate the guide wire because the promontory could be wire, very very thick the other problem if you not hitting it with the guide wire you want to go with your tap the problem is the tap will get blocked because bone will enter so so what will happen then again you have to again put your guide wire so with the system because there is still it in front you don't have to do it so what i do i and i i, I like you i have started with open system so i'm i like the feedback it gives me i know where i am so i really could now as i'm using more i can do minor adjustment throughout because i have the whole force of the system with means instead of a guide wire uh, the jamshedi where you start and you cannot do much of a manipulation because it's a very very thin and flimsy but here if, even if you started somewhere example some medial lateral now someone like you or someone who has done quite a few cases you can do minor adjustment throughout so that you hit the bull's eye when it goes to the promontory and and what you will do is just and you will feel it because you know we, we, because uh, even i have migrated from a being a open surgeon to a mi surgeon so the feedback of the tricortical purchase still with me and that allows me to exactly pinpoint when i have hit the promontory and take a shoot to confirm it and withdraw my stylet and then go all the way so hitting that s1 promontory with this is much more easy and i prefer it now For a S one screw, that is how uh, our thought process has been with Viper. Right. So over time, most of us who do MIS, the amount of work that is gradually we are seeing more. My practice now open work is down to like twenty percent, and the remaining eighty percent has become MIS now. Uh, so based on all that, if we continue using these fluoro things, I think we are going to get burnt in a very bad way. Yeah, yeah. So that so especially that you young guys, who you uh, you probably should get into navigation early on. So, so that that is one challenge, you know, the amount of MIS work we are doing right now. So almost now uh, for lumber, we have not opened a single case in last two years. That is how it has been for us. And so more and more we are getting exposure. So even although it does reduce our time, but you because you know the system as you rightly pointed out. it is unforgiving if you get it wrong right. then there are very few options left with you so you have to get it right getting it right means sometime at least in starting we need to have more fluoro shot too or i think the system is designed to be with navigation or a oa that is how the design is although we are using it with a cia but if you are 
you know, but later on, I, I, I pretty much believe that we should have some sort of a guidance just to, I, I, I think we can all do using a flow row, but just to save ourselves, I think the future is all about having a navigation or some sort of assistant where we can protect ourselves and of, of course the radiation to the patient. Right. So, um, I don't know. I think we have the floor till 12 o'clock. <laughs> some, some, someone had asked, uh, radiation is less compared to the conventional MI system. So, uh, I, think, I think initially when you are doing, uh, maybe you need to take more radiation because uh, you have to be, there is a question was from the chat box. So, you have to be very, very sure because uh, uh, Dr. Zaviri point, uh, pointed out this system is sort of a bit unforgiving in the sense that it is a one-way screw. Once you have put, you have decided and put the screw, then there are very few things which you can you can do to change the trajectory or to revise it. So, but as you become more confident, of course, you, you because you are not using the gem shady or the guide wire, the radiation becomes less. That's that's what I feel. The other thing which I feel uh, I use again, I, there's a talk, on, my talk on salvage, screw, uh, salvage options for MIS, and this screw is one of my salvage options for whatever reasons. If I I think I, I could not get a perfect trajectory with a normal gem shady, or I think I have breached, and what happens with a gem shady? Once you're made, at least you have tapped it, your gem shady will keep going in that hole. So then. You can use this screw and it allows you to do more in, in, in terms of either doing a medial direction or a superior direction. Because as I told, uh, as, as you saw in the videos, we have the whole force of the screw behind it. So uh, even if I'm doing a regular case, I now tell these guys to keep one set of screw with us uh, and so that if required, I can use it as a salvage screw. So. This uh, is also, as of today, my salvage option. If something goes wrong with a uh, with my normal uh, MIS screws, and I find it to be very very useful in terms of getting a new trajectory. And I feel if right now it could be a very very useful tool because getting a new trajectory, if you, in an osteoporotic case or where somewhere you have tapped it and then you find that your trajectory you not know, could be slightly tricky. Your thoughts on that, Dr. Zavi? No, no, I, I absolutely agree that uh, uh, basically keeping it as an option is good. I actually wanted to know whether they have a 7.5 screw on the system as well in case we find that this one is getting loose or there is some issue, uh, whether they have a salvage 7.5 available uh, with the same system or not. They have 7. They have 7. They have a 7. Okay. Yeah, um, I think it comes, and, yeah. They have a seven. I think they have a because I, I because we have been using it, so we ask. So they have an option with that. So okay. uh, with that, but, uh, of course, we. I think you for to start with this screw, you need some sort of experience. Absolutely. Of MIS. Absolutely. Right. Because what I uh, what I realize is that your you need to understand everything happens in the AP. Now to understand where you start at two o'clock and go to four o'clock. Go from three o'clock to nine o'clock. It depends upon the angulation of the spine as well as the rays of the CR which are going in. So to get that understanding, using a jump sheet, it takes its own time. Once you have understood that, and then you migrate to a K wireless system, was pretty easy because I can now put a jump sheet in the AP without looking at the lateral, and we have been doing that almost like for the last three four years. But if you ask somebody when I started out doing this MIS theory in 2012-11, 11-12 sometime, then at that point, if you tell me to do this, it probably that concept was not ingrained in my mind also at that point early on. So you have to do that for a few years to be able to understand that, okay, this is how it works. This is where it is. And then you get it down to right, right at the first shot. And you are worried about the force. I think what you have in your hand is your all. The way we use the guide wire and the tip and the screw is like as if you are using your all and then you're gradually going ahead, use your K wire, again, go ahead, again, use it K wire and gradually keep going in. So I, I like the system very much. Um, if the price is right, I can use it in all cases. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> I told them that the same thing. <laughs> It turned out to be way too expensive for me, but well, we'll we'll not discuss the expense on this for this is purely academic area. <laughs> but I can assure you, as you use it, you you will really find it very useful when you want to have a very convergent trajectory or something like that. Because unlike a guide wire where you cannot do much, because you like someone like you who has some, that experience at your back, as you use it, you'll feel more comfortable in in that medial trajectory. Which you want, because every time you can use some minor adjustment while you are going in, unlike which we cannot do with the guide wire. But this screw mm-hmm. allows you to do that. But you need some some sort of experience to really use this screw. Uh, but if you can use it, I think it is better than a regular MI screw. But you should be careful and use it after having some experience of the guide wire system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's very well summarized. so somebody has asked nikhil has asked is there a problem if we try to use this system for grade 3 listesis where the sacral slope is almost parallel to the skin and after putting the long, lower screw it may be difficult to put the above screw so he is asking for a grade 3 listesis in an lfis1 so i just showed you i showed a video of grade 2 Grade three, I have not done with the system, but I don't think there should be a problem. One of the good part, as I showed in that video, if you, if you see that the screw profile is very very less. So putting two screws together, that's what I was trying to show. Because of the very thin profile, you can do that. That is not a big issue. And the uh, the other thing is the the uh, the superior knob. They have multiple options, so you can change it to a smaller knob. So only problem we found is both the hands when we are trying to. Uh, put two screws together. The both mm. the hands were coming very close. So we asked. They have a separate knob which is very thin profile knob. So you can wait. See, we have not done that, but I don't see that as a problem. Only thing I do when I am doing this uh, high grade list stresses is I start at the bottom of the pedicle so that I, I can get the trajectory. And this allows me to not only get the promontory but even the screw placement becomes bit easy. So instead of Uh, the S1 pedicle, I never start in the center. I start as bottom as possible, so that that allows me two things: to get the trajectory and get the hit the promontory. The other thing, if you ha- want to do the dome osteotomy, you can even take out bit of the uh, superior pedicle if you really uh, want to put your cage. So these are small things, but up to grade two, we never had a problem. I don't think there should be a problem with grade three. That is my my take. Okay. um uh, regarding the uh, system have you ever had the rod getting rotated while you are trying to reduce it yeah yeah so so this is a problem with <laughs> synthesis per se so i'll tell you we have some not with this system but with viper 2 uh, lot of cases we had the rod so what we do now is uh, uh, we at least one of the screws we tighten it completely uh, it happens when you are t- like if you Like n- none of the screws are tightened completely, and you are trying to do something, the rod rotates. So one of your screw, if a multiple screw, you, you can choose which whichever you want to. But one of screw should be completely tightened. We are doing a reduction or something so that rod doesn't rotate. So that is that's what I we have done. We had I, I have had the similar experience, and that's why I I actually want to leave the handle inside till everything is. Otherwise, there is no control. You tend to lose control. so that was uh, the uh, only issue that uh, we were experiencing yesterday also we had a little bit of a that issue and uh, which is why it came to my mind yes. and reduction wise uh, up to grade 2 is okay grade 3 is a very difficult i did a grade 3 but i i preferred the metronic system to be very frank because i am more conversant with the when you pass the uh the arc and the rod through then it's much more easier to do a grade 3 with uh, mis otherwise grade 2s are okay with any system it's okay not about then quite a few of grade 3 not with this system but with normal viper and uh, i think i don't know whether somewhere we are we have that paper i think not in this conference and we we we, we have seen that at least you can reduce by 2 grade and you can really bring it up to like from 3 to 2 for sure and uh, and we didn't ha- and the results has been good till right so 
we still have some time left what about the olives you do the olives uh, uh, on a regular basis do you prefer l34s or do you also you like to use the l45s so, uh, so uh, up to l45 we we have been very comfortable uh, we use a uh, what we do now is uh, we do the initial guide wire and everything completely under vision so what what uh, one of the videos we have for i think olif i have a talk somewhere so what what we do for l45 especially we we see completely under vision and then put our guide wire and first dilator and that i think has made it very very safe when it comes to l45 so uh, so that, uh, although we we had one one case where we had a vascular injury of of the 60 odd cases which we have done but in spite of that overall uh, uh, doing it under vision i think had made uh, it very safe and even at l45 i we feel very confident so we, what we use it uh, we use a handheld detractor system detract the source see it completely that anything is nothing is there and if required we can swipe uh, if there is a a small uh, if the source even genito formal nerves many times we have seen it just out there and we could really retract it because we do it completely under vision and then put the dilators and that has really i think helped us uh, avoid complication and that made us very very confident doing l45 because i i have done a few but i would prefer the l34 i don't want to go near the iliac veins basically those are the nemesis that's what i believe and if the veins are pretty close by your uh, then then they tend to you know you travel so so i actually so pre operative uh, we, we, that uh, screening is very important that yeah. yes, we don't see the window i we don't plan it but l45 almost 80% of the time i think we can get away we have we have been doing it and we, we don't have a problem i think the I, we now we don't we although we have a new monitoring house but we don't use them now we do it completely under vision uh, using the muscle relaxant helps us to retract the swas so we completely retract the swas see the key, uh, the disc then put the dilator even the dilator is now we put it under vision so that eliminates that risk of uh, uh, the injury but if it if, but still it happened to us for one case and you know it is a nightmare when it happens <laughs> so so in spite of everything said and done if you can avoid l4 level nothing like that but if you have, if you want to do it you need to have, take a step backward and do it in a very very uh, cordial manner and uh, like see everything and then do it. so i think uh, we can wrap it up i guess yeah any question questions from the organizers anything they want to anything you want to add i think we should wrap it up then i think yeah, are... because i think uh, it's been quite some time we have all those viewers who have had wanted to see viper prime or had an opportunity probably they could have put a question so we have answered nikhil's uh, uh, question and i think he has also left So I think we can leave now and join later again for the rest of the session. Yes, yeah. sir. Push. Hi, sir. Pushkal here. Uh, huh. So Samiksha has left. Actually, uh, she has joined some other uh, session. Uh, I'm Pushkal from Bangalore, and I uh, take care of uh, Depu Spine uh, portfolio here in uh, Karnataka. Uh, it was wonderful uh, seeing the experiences and the outcomes with Viper Prime that you have experienced with my colleague, uh, Mr. Nishikan. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing your wonderful uh, cases and experience. It was. nice to have the sessions thank you thank you and thank you depu and nishikant as well because he was instrumental in you know getting all that video compiled in the last yes. 12 hours yes, yes. He, it was very quick and very efficient for him thank you thank you everybody thank, thank you guys and see you again short while in the rest of the sessions thank you everyone thank you uh, the miss because is busy umesh and uh, and uh, the deputy synthesis team nishikant was instrumental instrumental in getting this all done and the whole deputy team did support us and we as we do more i think we could 
uh, let, let you know our experiences and we hope that some of you will pick up this system and will share there because together as they are more user of the system i think we, think we can grow and we can use it in a more wiser way this is just the initial learning experience which we are sharing with you thank you thank you so much okay i see you around umesh busy day yeah <laughs> hopefully yeah everything is set so it goes on smoothly <laughs> from here thank uh, you very much uh, chief uh, no thank you very much ayush for your discussion yeah so uh, you know mm -hmm. the discussion was very very interesting and very very enthralling i think many of them have benefited from your wise words uh, so i think we have uh, around 15 20 minutes time left before we can start the next pre event workshop so until then uh, we would take again one more small break and we will join again at 12 noon sharp from then onwards it is going to be a continuous uh, activity uh, we are going to start with a pre event workshop from dr reddy's laboratories uh, where there is a talk by dr vihir bapat on uh, how to manage dural tears and what are the options that are available when we encounter an incidental intraoperative dural tear and following that we are going to have an inaugural session a short inaugural session where we are going to hear from the senior most stalwarts of misab about how we should start and progress with our uh, you know uh, misab activities as well as mis for beginners session so we'll catch you back again at 12 noon and until then we have a short break thank you thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you
चार्ज आ गया सर अनिल कैन यू हेयर मी यस डॉक्टर यू कैन ओके सो अगेन वंस अगेन वेलकम टू ऑल एंड वी आर गोइंग टू गो अहेड विद द पार्ट 3 ऑफ द प्री इवेंट वर्कशॉप द लास्ट वन फॉर द डे एंड दिस इज गोइंग टू बी डन बाय डॉक्टर रेड्डीज लैबोरेटरीज and the topic is role of neural substitutes in the management of incidental intraoperative neural tear so dr mihir bapat we welcome dr mihir bapat a senior spine surgeon from mumbai to deliver this lecture uh, he'll be joining us a little late later online and until then we can listen to the lecture and post the questions later on so we can go ahead with the talk Shall I play the video, sir? Yeah, we can start playing the video, and once Dr. Mihir Bapat comes online, we can post the questions to him online. Good morning to you all. i have been assigned to do the task of speaking on neural leak and its management neural leak is one of those uh, complications which we don't wish to encounter during our surgeries but at the same time we should be apt to deal with it successfully so the incidence of developing or facing a neural leak is as much as 3.5% while doing any elective spine surgeries and it arises up to 6.5% while you are doing any revision spine cases uh, the distribution wise it is most common seen in lumbar cases then cervical and knees in thoracic spine surgeries developing an iatrogenic injury is as high as 5 times if you are doing a revision surgery or in pathologies such as os ossified posterior longitudinal ligament or ossified yellow ligaments using high speed drills or maneuvering your equipments or your instruments in anatomically narrow canal also increases the incidence of developing such injuries uh, it has a inverse ratio or inverse proportion to the experience of the surgeon and using magnifications like surgical microscopes or loops decreases the risk or incidence of developing a neural leak now this flow chart just describes in just the steps which can be enumerated while tackling a dural leak so if you encounter a dural leak in an open wound or during intraoperatively during a surgery it is always better to have a primary closure if you are not able to close it you may attempt to seal it by using fat muscle fat or muscle fascia grafts using an artificial patch of fibrin glue sealants you always have to overlay them with sutures use a subfacial drain in certain cases you might require to put in a diversion of a lumbar drain or a lumbar patch if you develop or notice a dural leak post operatively 
so if it's immediately post operatively in a non healed uh, wound you can just observe it or you can overrun it as enumerated here if it heals by forming a pseudo meningocele you can still try to treat it conservatively and wait for and wait and watch for it if it heals with a fistula or there's it's a, it's the patient starts showing symptoms uh, there is no other way of tackling it than to go in again revise re-explore and repair the defect so the signs and symptoms are clear as shown over here in a post op drain you will find instead of a blood discharge there would be a clear discharge in it which signifies that there is csf in the drain patient might complain of traction headaches or nausea and vomiting in certain cases you have to be wary and you have to keep a watchful eye if he or she is developing any signs of meninges such as neck stiffness or photophobia in the rare cases it might also lead to a deficit uh, if there is any root or cord herniation and also may lead to epidural bleeding diagnosing or investigating by doing an mri and ct scan to look for the leak and the location of the leak is always helpful the complications which it can lead to are as enumerated earlier it can heal with a fistula it can form a pseudo meningocele which can cause pressure symptoms to the patient it can lead to infections such as meningitis arachnoiditis or even epidural abscess now i'll try to explain to you at which steps can you have a dural leak or the chances of dural leak so over here in this diagram you can see whenever you are doing trying to do a laminectomy the first steps are when you are doing or uh, you are excising the lower part of your lamina there while osteotomizing it or while doing an osteotomy laterally you can your osteotom can uh, insert inside canal and it can uh, injure the dura while cutting the ligamentum flavum as well you have to be quite careful with your knife otherwise that can also lead to any tear or nick on the dura itself so you have to be very careful while you are inserting any sharp instruments in it once your uh, window your laminectomy window or bony work is done down you can extend it up or down as shown over here and then you can easily see the neural bundle in front of you now different areas where you can encounter a dura tear or a nick is in the center over here it can be paracentral it can be uh it can be around the shoulder while you are trying to maneuver around the nerve root by using a nerve probe it can be similarly seen in the axilla of the nerve root or if the under surface of your dura is adherent then you can have a ventral tear as well now whenever you have a tear the steps which you have to take is that slowly and steadily because of the pressures over there the tear tear can expand and once it expands because of the flow of the csf it can you will see that the clear fluid of the csf is jutting out of the tear or the rent over there uh, you might also encounter small nerve rootlets which are also jutting out through the tear if the tear is too big the first step which you have to take is you have to give a head low position by giving a head low position what you can do is you can just reduce the pressures of the csf flow through the rent of the defect once the csf flow is reduced you can try to stop it even further by using a cottonite patty so using a cottonite you can just stop the flow and slowly and steadily you can also in fact try to push or persuade the out jutting nerve rootlets inside the defects while doing so if you feel that you are not getting too much of space to maneuver your instruments it is always advisable to increase your bony window so your field of vision is not restricted slowly and steadily start pushing in those small nerve rootlets inside the canal once you have uh, accomplished it you just have to close it with a non absorbable proline suture so over here you can just see that once it is closed you are sure you just remove the head low position give a neutral position ask the anesthetist to give a valsalva maneuver and look for any uh, flow of free fluid or csf fluid over there 
once you have accompanied a uh, accomplished a uh, complete closure or a airtight closure you can always augment it by using a fat graft or a muscle graft you can also try to uh, do a sandwich technique where you are using artificial sealants like uh, the one which we are describing here or you can use fibrin glues as well so this is known as a sandwich technique where you are not depending on a single method of closure but you are using multiple methods to close the defect if you feel the pressures are too much you can always insert a lumbar drain to reduce the pressures the csf pressures at the uh, repaired area uh, the muscle closure or your subcutaneous closure has to be watertight you can use a subfacial drain as well you have to be very careful you don't have to put a drain next to your dural elements uh the cutaneous closure should also be continuous uh a continuous suture uh now as discussed there are different options available to us while doing a closure of a rent uh, that ranges from doing a primary closure then using a autograft of fat or muscle you can also use uh, use art artificial patches like uh, duragen or durafoam or you can use a tc or a fibrin glue no i'll i'll just enumerate a couple of cases where we had encountered dural leak and how they were managed now this is a case uh, which was operated uh, four weeks back for l4 to s1 lumbar decompression he started developing severe disabling uh, radicular pain two weeks post surgery and that kept on increasing uh, these are the pre operative x rays and mri you can clearly see that he has a csf collection at the operative area and it is causing a pressure symptom in his case where if you are pressing the lumbar back he is developing a radicular pain in his lower legs now this is a intra operative gd of the same case where you can see that the csf collection has in fact uh developed into a pseudo meningocele so you have to be very careful while incising the pseudo capsule of this meningocele you have to carefully uh, separate out the edges of the capsule you have to be sure that you are incising the capsule in length totally otherwise it can create a band a pressure band over there which can lead to neuro deficits as well slowly with the help of a nerve probe you have to create a plane between your normal dura and the pseudo capsule once you are comfortable there yes, you have created a plane you slowly slowly keep on progressing towards the neural elements as you can see over here so with the probe and with the suction you can see that now we are able to appreciate the normal anatomical plane between the pseudo capsule and the dura over here and there is a small rent as well at this point so now you are able to uh, identify the small rent so i think the previous surgeon might have used a fat graft to seal it with so you try to remove it and actually see how severe or how big the defect is at this step so you can see the gel foam as well which he had packed inside so you have to excise the capsule to clearly see it the defect so you just pack it so the csf doesn't come in way you can see here the facet the which is adjoining facet is coming in way while we are trying to approach the rent so removing or increasing the bony window helps out in exposing the rent properly so you can close it meticulously so right now you can see over here the rent is there so you just pack it off as it was a small nick you can always uh, do a primary closure or primary closure over here it is worthwhile mentioning that you should always probe for any secondary rents as well that there, there couldn't be only one rent you might encounter there are multiple rents while doing any revision surgeries so here you can see a uh, non absorbable proline 50 is used to achieve a primary closure of the rent and uh, once you have closed it you do a valsalva maneuver just to reconfirm there is no further leak from the rent as well 
Now, this is another case of a 54 year old female which uh, presented with disabling axial and radicular complaints. Uh, she started having gait instability and human signs. You can see she has multiple discs over there. So, and there is chances of having an OPLL or a ossified yellow ligament over here. So, intraop we found that the lamina was adherent to the dura. So, while removing the lamina, the dura automatically peeled off. So, it was uh, in such cases where there is a dural defect. Achieving a primary closure is not possible, so you can actually use these patches to close those defects and you can just pour in the fibrin glue to close the defect as well. Now, in the third case, in this case, as you can see, of a dumbbell schwannoma, dural rent is not a complication, but it is a step of your complete surgery. That means to reach till the intradural tumor, you have to do a durotomy. So, in doing so, while removing such kind of tumors, you can always augment your primary closure by using artificial grafts like Duragen to be assured that there is no post-operative CSF leaks or any complications uh, associated with it. So, as mentioned earlier, we try to do a sandwich technique where we achieve a primary closure by using a proline suture. We put a duragen as a second layer and as a third layer, we put in a fibrin glue. The closure is always uh, in layers and it has to be watertight. A fourth case, which you can see over here, which you can see in the CT scan, he has severe uh, osteophytes, uh, OPLL, and there is also uh, ossification of the ligament of flavum over here. So, what happens is whenever you're using any uh, electrical equipment such as an electrical burr, while doing your laminectomy, you might be, uh, even if you're very cautious while using such equipments, you might have a burr related injury where because of the burr there is a tear in the dura. Now, if you are having a tear using an osteotome, if you are having a tear using an osteotome, the tear margins are always very uh, linear so you can have a primary closure but with such a mechanized or with burr injuries, the tear margins are always jagged so having a primary closure is very difficult. So, in such case, it is always advisable to close these uh, tears by using a dural patch. Over here, you can see that there is a small tear. So, we used a dural patch. Uh, we just overlaid it like a patty. So, it just goes over there and sticks with the dura properly. Once you have uh, applied your duragen properly, you can also seal the edges or the junction of your duragen and the bone with uh, overlaying it with a fibrin glue. So that way you have a double protection against any CSF leaks. Now, this is the similar case where you can see the CSF, uh, the fibrin glue is overlaid. <laughs> Because if it is, then I can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, are there any questions for the previous session on uh, dural tear? Uh, any questions on the chat box or any questions on the uh, the platform? So, in the chat box, there is a question which is asked by Sanjay Chandir. Yeah. So, uh, hi, it's uh, Dr. Amandeep this side. Uh, unfortunately, there are some connectivity issues. Dr. Bapat cannot be with us. So yes, I, so Amandeep, you can take the question on his behalf uh, since you have given the lecture. Yeah. And uh, so, there is a question on the chat box, Sanjay Jangir. Spinal level most common for dural tear. What, is this? what are the common clinical features hmm. and which is a better method uh, for, for repair, single or sandwich closure? Can you just briefly answer it in a minute? Yeah, so if we'll go through the talk as well, the most common site for in any developing a leak or a tear is in the lumbar spine. And specifically, if you're working in anatomically narrow canals or bony nano canals like spinal stenosis, and the most 
better method if you ask me uh, it would always be a primary closure is always preferred than using any other means of closures such, such as fibrin glues or a uh, patch but a sandwich technique is a fail safe that means after doing a primary closure as well always check for any leaks by doing a valsalva maneuver to feel that yes there is a probability that there might be a small uh, leak always safeguarded by doing it in layers by using a patch or a fibrin glue and always prefer doing a watertight closure for the skin as well overlay it with continuous sutures yeah well great uh, thank you thank you dr amandeep for that uh, you know uh, nice and informative lecture so i think uh, we'll pro we'll go ahead with our next session yeah uh so yeah welcome and once again welcome all to the uh, you know misab surgical symposium and ultimately we are finally at a point what we have been waiting for for the last 3 to 4 months and that is the actual event the misab surgical symposium it starts today and goes on all the way till tomorrow evening 8 pm we have an exciting array of academic programs uh, lectures by very senior and very experienced national and international faculty as a host of clinical case discussions on the most controversial topics in spine surgery and mis as well as uh, an an array of debates that covers some of the most uh, you know enchanting to inside inciting topics uh, in in spine surgery so but before all those things i think it is it is it is a formality for us to have a formal inaugural function and what better way to do than with the blessings of all our seniors so we welcome professor arvin jaiswal who is the founder president of misab uh, dr amit jhala who is the founder secretary of uh, misab uh, dr rohiras the past president professor dr rajkumar deshpande who is the current president and of course dr arvin kulkarni who is the current honorary secretary we also take a big pleasure in inviting uh, you know dr shankar acharya who is the president of assi for his special invited lecture at the end of this particular session so we'll we'll i would like to initially invite dr arvin kulkarni who is the current honorary secretary of misab in to give a inaugural and a welcome address to all the participants for misab surgical symposium dr arvin kulkarni please uh thank you very much uh, umesh uh, at the outset i welcome you all Uh, to the most uh, prestigious event of the year our uh, annual uh, festival so the last one year has been extremely stormy you know we have been surfing the waves of this miserable pandemic and as we do so a fresh merciless wave has hit us again and sure and i'm sure with the weapon of minimalism we will beat it again so the buzzword is minimalism that is the new mantra and the world has become minimalistic so no elaborate functions no elaborate incisions and as you know motto of our society has been to be minimalistic so this is not our annual conference but it celebrates the live and cadaveric workshop that we host annually at ms ramaya bangalore in the month of april so dr umesh dr rajkumar and the entire bangalore team have left no stone unturned to host a mega mis event so we have a star studded cast of young young and old seasoned and articulate national and international faculty of fame who will share their thoughts with us you will be exposed to everything in mis under the skin including for the first time live surgery straight from the operating rooms that will be beamed to your bedrooms we will have live wire high pitch debates in depth discussions of concepts and techniques and most importantly paper presentations that carry awards and this will decorate two days of intensive learning participation and brotherhood and fellowship so amidst this depressing health crisis that we are pushed to we are fortunate to have the presidents of our own society dr rajkumar deshpande and our brother society assi will be addressing us in this particular session so i encourage you to participate actively and conclude by requesting all the delegates to interact share your knowledge and make it a pleasant uh, meeting so hand uh, by uh, hand over the mic back to dr umesh 
yeah uh, thank you very much uh, uh, dear secretary and without your guidance this program wouldn't have been in the shape that it is today uh, so now it takes i take a great honor in uh, inviting our dear president dr rajkumar deshpande he is who is right here and we are blessed to have him in our operation th in my operation theater today and uh, he is going to give the presidential address so dr rajkumar sir please hello arvind uh, hello amit jala all the past presidents the founder president and all the executive members it's a pleasure for me to be part of this wonderful symposium uh umesh has done a great job and with all of his team and i welcome both the national and international faculty on this uh, very important momentous occasion even though uh, covid is really in the horrible midst of us i still feel that uh, we are doing a phenomenal uh, thinking in continuing this uh, process of having the symposium so with that i would like to uh, start the start the session uh, can play, play. they will play the session now please yes sir i am playing your video sir dear friends it gives me immense pleasure in welcoming you to this edition of the misab surgical symposium i would like to welcome you all along with my president elect dr amit jala and our secretary dr arvind kulkarni these are strange times these are covid times and during this difficult period i am happy that all of you have come together to participate in this beautiful and historic meeting without much ado i would like to talk about some of the reflections i have had as a neurosurgeon in the past 3 decades i had more than 3 decades of surgical life uh, i can separate into 3 10 year phases the first decade was finding the right rhythm as a surgeon and in the second decade perhaps i matured as a true surgical person and in the third decade i started leading teams and mentoring it's not that it, there was a 10 year cut off it sort of blended along as time passed by now as a neurosurgeon in practice in the city of bangalore i had to end up doing both brain and spine surgeries now 40% of my work was brain surgery and the remaining spine i did everything you know some really complex work i went brain tumor surgery skull base surgeries joint aneurysms brain bypass endoscopy both transnasal intraventricular but the most interesting aspect for me was how i ended up doing the minimally invasive spine work but what i would like to impart today especially to the younger surgeons is a new concept of surgical psychology psychology is the science of uh, the mind of, and behavior so psychology includes study of conscious and sub on the subconscious or unconscious phenomena as well as the feeling and thought now surgical psychology is specific to how should young surgeons prepare their mind and behavior especially in the com coming decades and perhaps what should established surgeons do next so most surgeons have heard these quotes earlier surgeons make decisions they don't just put their hands in their pockets like internists big surgeons make big incisions they have eyes of an eagle heart of a lion they're passionate aggressive demanding dominant i mean all of this is right and sometimes not so right so i developed some suggestions especially for the young surgeons in mind 
and I like to put it in five buckets. And these are the five buckets. Training for practice, family time, physical fitness, some financial thoughts, and developing parallel interests. And what I'll do is I will go bucket by bucket. And let me start with the first training for practice. So it's a given for surgeons that they have capacity for deductive reasoning and decision making. They have very strong emotional characteristics and obviously dexterity is a must. And also said that surgeons never shed tears, almost. They hide the fears behind a mask of confidence. Now, given that characteristic, one of the first tips I would like to do and give is do we need a mental performance coach? So when the young surgeon is getting into practice, there are certain barriers that he sort of has to climb and that could compromise performance. If you're working under a senior, especially a famous one, it creates an emotional anxiety and there is, of course, this uh, concept of time management. You're starting a case, your chief will come in half an hour. By the time you have to open and keep the area ready, and you would say, continue, I'll join you. And by the time you use the first instrument on the bone, he's already scrubbed in. So this keeps happening. And then what you end up doing is, you try to do faster and faster, but that leads to missteps. So you have lost that art of patient work over time. Or suppose you get an unexpected complication that will set your mind back and they will say, oh, this guy did something, it went wrong, and you don't want to hear that. And there are some colleagues which might, you know, say negative things about you, and that will sort of set you back. And with these days of medical legal issues, an unexpected case can again think, uh, make you think in a wrong way. So in these situations, do you need a mental performance coach? The second tip I would like to do, I uh, give is on the surgical skill labs. So young surgeons definitely need dexterity improvement, they would like to learn strategy for reducing risks, improve outcomes. They also would like to develop a cognitive schema in their brain for patient care by observing other surgeons. And it's better to make mistakes in the lab, not in the OT. Now, along with the skill labs, nowadays you have a huge bunch of you view many, uh, you know, videos, YouTube videos, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the senior surgeons also can do some specific learning. They can learn a little bit of nuances, some slightly different technique, and this will help them make listen. Uh, no, reduce their mistakes. Now, the third tip that I would like to give is to actively find a mentor. This is part of the Guru Sishya Parampara that used to be in existence centuries ago. So, if you have got a uh, senior guy, a skilled surgeon, not necessarily in the same speciality, but you know, but definitely in a different city, because there's no uh, uh, difficulty in relating to him. And if that person has good surgical outcomes, he's open to discuss with no malice. If he's a lot senior, with a balanced personality person like and willing to spare time and space for you. He is a, going to be a good mentor. But the three tips that I mentioned, mental performance coach, having a surgical skill lab and finding a mentor are sometimes very difficult to get. So I'll give some ideas how to do that. One of the ways that I did was to develop deep friendships with very good surgeons from other cities, both senior and my level. And when they discuss, I would be participative, open to different thoughts, 
and I would, I would hesitate to fight, even though in my mind I had a different way of probably look, looking at it at the time. So this is kind of a way to widen your thoughts and make a concrete idea about how to manage a particular situation. Also, I started attending skill labs as and when it was available. And the second thing you should do is in your operating rooms, you should constantly challenge yourself. If you want to do certain things in a perfect way, one of the greatest virtues that you can start thinking about is how to challenge yourself. And the third way to find a mentor is to be simply a shadow surgeon for a very busy seniors. They have a ton of cases for you to do and they may or may not participate in the surgery. At that time, you end up doing most of the cases. So initially, you'll be a little apprehensive, but then you develop more and more confidence. And then you start perfecting each step. You become a great surgeon. And also, around the same time, if you are had some sort of hostile colleagues or difficult administrators, they'll really, really round you up very nicely. So the thought process in the mind should be, you should believe in yourself, be positive, and learning to be patient. I think this tip four is for training for practice. The second bucket that I would like to discuss is family time. These are the things I learned as lessons from COVID-19. I think it's very important. Family is all that you have at times of crisis. Most surgeons may end up going home late. So it classes, uh, family time classes with professional time. So it sort of reduces your importance of being a parent and you'll have less time to take care of elders. For me, the COVID-19 became a blessing for four or five months. I did all of this and I'm supremely happy. The third bucket I'd like to talk to you about is physical fitness. Surgeons end up working late and sometimes sleepless. So their health is disregarded and they do surgeries for long periods of time, either sitting or standing, their posture can be varied. I think if you can look at it and keep your back straight and neck straight, use instruments that aid visualization, et cetera, et cetera, with a good exercise regimen, I think your health you know, standard will definitely be on the up. Now, the personal preference of alcohol and smoking is very delicate subject, but I would request those of you who indulge in it to be in moderation. These are not good times. So if somebody is using alcohol and are smoking on the little higher side, I don't think you should wait for a health setback to understand this. Now, the fourth bucket I want to discuss is financial thought. Generally, it is a, a taboo subject in scientific meetings. But I would like to say that it's better to invest from a very young age in the stock market, or even land or gold in whatever proportion you would like. Perhaps invest in your specialty like some of the, my fantastic colleagues have done. Invest in a hospital, invest in the same specialty. And that will give them perhaps a certain financial rigor, which uh, will keep them very well satisfied in the long run financially. I also pay taxes on time and I encourage you guys to pay taxes. You owe it to this country. So for saving for a future, you start early. There's the power of compounding and many of you know it or most of you know it. But I think I missed the bus. I don't want the young surgeons to miss that bus and try to save a significant portion of post-tax income, maybe 20, 30%. And if you don't know how to do all this, talk to a financial expert, preferably try to do it on index fund because the cost of, you know, all that will be much lesser compared to stocks and other things. So it's really taboo. It's a different one hour talk on financial thoughts. But I think these are the skeletal of what I wanted to tell you. And the last bucket is developing parallel interests. Today's trend is we all live longer. 
many of us have had burnouts we rarely have non physician friendships i think so if you develop a parallel interest you'll then have something new it's like a boy with a new toy and there's no exam because you're learning something new without the stress of exam and sometimes you'll start making peace with yourself other than just the subject you are involved in day to day also a mindset that competition is good jealousy is not and for those who are around my age i don't know when to retire if some if any one of you have an idea i would like to discuss that with you now these are the arts of trying to be a good surgeon because these are exciting and challenging times you end up caring a lot many times is exasperating mostly it's rewarding and extremely satisfying and to speak in front of you all i have had this great privilege and honor i thank you for your time and thank you for your attention have a good conference thank you for giving me this opportunity my fellow members and all the seniors i have tried to explore something different than the usual spine surgery minimal access uh, spine surgery talks and i hope the young surgeons will have a great future i was just telling umesh in the morning that uh 10 years ago there were a few of us and we were just making a little noise on the podium now 10 years down the line there's a bunch of us who can meet together discuss coherently talk scientifically and enjoy each other's company though in these covid times it's virtual and i think 10 years down the line there'll be a huge number of exciting uh, young professionals doing minimal access spine surgery with uh, robots being very common and i hope those times they remember all this discussions that we had and have a good laugh thank you for the time umesh thank you very much sir i think uh, it is a justice to a topic probably which only you could have carried out so eloquently and so uh, charmingly and uh, so going forward i think no inaugural function is complete without our cultural ritual of you know lighting a lamp and to invoke our favorite gods so however this time because it being a virtual however this time because it being a virtual yeah so because this being a virtual we are we have carried out this small uh, you know tradition of ours in a in a virtual format itself uh, anil can i request to to start the uh, lighting of the lamp video sure sir give me a second uh thank you and that was actually our uh, founder president our past president current president founder secretary and our current secretary lighting the lamp so uh, that is what we would we would uh, uh, this one and uh, going forward you know we would like to invoke uh, our favorite gods in the voice of uh, vidushi hs shivaranjini so can we have her online please mm -hmm. hello all <coughs> uh, 
you can start vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama smarisuve ninaya divya nama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama smarisuve ninaya divya nama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama vigna vinashak buddhi pradayak vidyaya nido shri varadayak vigna vinashak buddhi pradayak vidyaya nido shri varadayak charana kamal ninna puji pe anudina sadhana vetava tarak nama sadhana vetava tarak nama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama smarisuve ninaya divya nama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama gangadhar suta chandra sudharak sankat hariso shri shubhakara ka gangadhar suta chandra sudharak sankat hariso shri shubhakara ka bhava sagar vanu dadalu anudina pavana guliso ee shanti dhama pavana guliso ee shanti dhama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama smarisuve ninaya divya nama vigneshwar ninage prathama pranama smarisuve ninaya divya nama smarisuve ninaya divya nama smarisuve ninaya divya nama thank you very much uh, mr sri ranjini uh, for that uh, you know uh, excellent uh, uh, invocation so we would proceed with the next talk and uh, misab as we know has come a long way since its inception in 2014 as missy and its metamorphosis into misab around 2 years back and uh, so the journey that we have had so far has been quite exciting and you know we know that we have a long way to go ahead as well so here is dr amit jala our founder secretary as well as our president elect to tell us how misab started and what has it been journey so far and what are we looking at in the future so dr amit jala please yes sir we are playing his video uh first of all thank you uh, uh umesh for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to talk on misab and it's very inspiring talk for the life of a surgeon and life of uh, how a surgeon should live by dr uh, our president and a very apt talk by our president of misab dr rajakumar this pande and you can see the whole chat box is full of the praise for his talk now let me uh, take you over to how what is the journey what was the journey of misab from its right from before its inception and right till today and i would like uh, my talk to be played please play my talk yes sir you are able to see the screen sir yes misab is a very young organization 
and I'm going to talk about the vision and the mission of Misab and how was the journey so far and how we are going to go ahead in future. Now, if you want to get through the hardest journey, we need to take only one step at a time, but we must keep stepping on. When we thought about an organization for minimally invasive spine surgery in India, at the start, we never knew whether this was the right step forwards. There are a lot of apprehension and anxiety. There's a lot of discouragement to start with a separate body when a larger parent body already existed. But there were a handful of surgeons practicing minimally invasive spine surgery that is around 2002 and they came together to form this association. All these surgeons had a different techniques to perform MIS, but the goal was same of doing the surgery MIS way. And the centers in India which started with MIS initially were from Ahmedabad, Pune, Kolhapur and Hyderabad. But soon the Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore got added to it. And so the strength of MIS surgeons increased during that time. There were lots of debates and discussion in conferences whether MIS is the right way to go ahead. Though both the procedures gave a good outcomes, but it was green on the sides of an open surgeon because the balance tilted towards the open surgery because there were many open surgeons and a few practicing uh, MIS surgeons. But one moment changed all and the balance got tilted towards the MIS way when one of our founder president and chief architect of the MISAP and pioneers of the spine surgery in India guided us forwards. And this turned the balance towards the MIS surgery. We hold his finger to take us through the journey of MISAP. And that was the defining moment for the culmination of the society. And he was none other than our Professor Jaiswal. In November 2013, when he was president of the World Society of Endoscopic Navigated and Minimally Invasive Surgery of Spine, he organized Venice 2013. And during that conference, Dr. Jaiswal, myself, Dr. Rajakumar, Dr. Satish Gore, and Dr. Rohidas, Arvind Kulkarni, and Dr. Sudhir Javeri. They were sitting together and the seed of forming a new organization was sown during that meeting when we started thinking of uh, having this association. What Dr. Jaiswal told that like in a Indian classical music, we have different types of gharanas. Similarly, minimally invasive spine surgeries are done through tubular retractor, through full endoscopy and through the stand -up but we all worked for a common goal. So why can't we have a common association? So after that, there was a lot of brainstorming. There were a lot of uh, exchange of emails. Ultimately, initial association, which was known as MISI or Minimally Invasive Spine Surgeons of India, which came into existence on March 2014. And it was an association of persons and we all signed the memorandum of this association. At that time, it was decided that the first inaugural meeting will be conducted by me in Ahmedabad in November 2014. The mission and vision of MISI, which is as on today of MISAB, was the same. The mission was to unite as one, everyone practicing different techniques of MIS in India. We have to be united for propagating minimally invasive spine surgery in India. We have to share and learn together the most advanced MISS techniques from peers and colleagues throughout India and globally by arranging meetings and conferences. It was very important if you want to propagate this minimally invasive spine surgery, it was not the older generation, but it was especially important to train young generations in different techniques of MIS by conducting workshops, live surgeries, and cadaver training so that these techniques remain live and the baton is passed from master surgeons to the young surgeons. And the last mission and vision was to spread awareness of MISs amongst the surgeons and community by conducting the outreach programs. So the first inaugural meeting, which was conducted in Ahmedabad in November 2014. And we had an international faculty from 
Dr. Kevin Foley, Jun Ho Lee, Kan Singh, Gabriel Liu, and H S Kim, who is still a faculty as on today, and our core members, which were initially seven, we finalized the core committee of fourteen. And all of us, you know, these are the fourteen surgeons who are really active uh, as on today. Also, to our surprise, we thought that this will become a very small meeting, and just we will have a small discussion of different cases. But there was lot of interest. from all over india to attend this meeting and this meeting was attended by around 210 delegates we had full hall throughout the sessions and we also conducted cadaver sessions for all the three different techniques of destando transforaminal and tubular retractor system so with this initial enthusiasm that we got we started with a bang and the impetus to this organization was further given by the different conferences that we hold so these were the annual meetings that were very well attended and that has given impetus to our association by these grand conferences which were arranged in 2017 we thought that we need to train the younger surgeons and we required to do a separate live courses and cadaver courses and then we started with two courses and these courses are flagship courses mis live cat 2017 and mis live cat 2018 where there were live surgeries conducted and the cadaver course was also conducted so this organization has come up step by step then came the change for the better future initial missy was association of persons and we need to change it to a trust because we need to register and we registered this association in april 2018 as an official association and then we turned missy into misa that means the name of minimally invasive spine surgeons of india to minimally invasive spine surgeons association of bharat which is now established in 2018 the achievements of the misa if you see we have regular annual meetings we have regular cadaver training programs for all the three techniques right from its inception there are regular live surgical demonstrations and we started from 2019 the outreach program unfortunately the outreach programs which were which were scheduled in 2020 we were not able to do because of the pandemic we have got international collaboration of these association now and the first collaboration in 2015 was with ecmist and then in 2018 we had a collaboration with asmis and they had a collaboration with comist and ecmis in 2019 and which was also very well attended by our members of the association there are two important publications that we have the first is the credit goes to dr arvin kulkarni he has been the editor of this minimally invasive spine surgery book which is an official publication of minimally invasive spine surgeons of india this year we have also collaborated with jamist publish our articles in jamist also the journey ahead we know that the rocket is already launched the misab is already launched and the spark is created by the different conferences now we just required to give a booster so that the rocket can fly high in the sky there are four pillars of the journey the first pillar we should have a global vision and we should have an international participation international collaboration so that our visibility is wide enough not only to the india but globally the second important fact is we need to start documentation research and publication at multi centers all over india we have enough uh, clinical material in india and we can contribute to the science by doing a good publications next is education and training we are already doing annual conferences and uh, the live cadaver courses but we need to increase the fellowship programs the fellowship programs are very important for the young generations to adopt the uh, mis technique we should increase the outreach programs for the awareness and it's possible to have a technical video library so if anybody wants to and they can get their educated the last is to promote the young generation they are the flag holders of the future we have to cultivate them to present publish and to help them incorporate mis in their 
clinical practice because I have seen that the fellows who are trained under us, when they go out for the practice, it's difficult for them to practice MIS and we have to increase their participation in our organization. So these are the four pillars on which we need to work ahead. Now, the last not the least, we have always a debate whether an endoscopy is better or a tubular better. I don't think we should keep these debates now. We know that minimally invasive spine surgery, sometimes it can be steep and sometimes it can be longer, but a better route. And you know that there are so many surgeons who are already practicing now minimally invasive spine surgery. So whatever suits best in individual's hand, you must promote them to practice that. But then we should not have a technique-based association like transforaminal aura. We need to find out and ponder. We should have a newer vision from technique-based mindset to a diagnosis-based mindset, keeping the patient in the center and find out which technique is best for which diagnosis. One thing is very, very certain. I think this horrifying pictures we should not see of full open spine surgeries. Spine is a very delicate structure and a cosmetic structure. We need to preserve this spine in an artistic fashion and do a cosmetic minimally invasive spine surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I think this was a completely engrossing and an exciting talk from you. Uh, so you have already laid out the pillars for the younger generation to build the society further on. And I'm sure that under your presidency from next year onwards, we will be able to achieve and we will be able to progress in a significantly better direction uh, and achieve the goals that you have set for this organization. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So, uh, so naturally, as Dr. Jhala has already uh, uh, commented, mm -hmm. so one way for us to go ahead is to link or is to follow the footsteps of bigger organizations. And for us, our big brother is not very far away. And it is in our own backyard, the Association of Spinal Surgeons of India, which has been there for more than 50 years and has mm -hmm. been uh, it's uh, Herculean heights in as far as Indian spine surgery is concerned and this is the most recognized uh, spine association from our country and what better way for us to tell tips and guide us than its president Dr. Shankar Acharya. So we would like to invite Dr. Shankar Acharya to give his pulse of wisdom and he is going to tell us how MISAB can link with ASSI or how the two societies can function together in order to create a uh, better future for both. Dr. Shankar Acharya, stop, please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Umesh, for these kind words. It was an excellent talk from Dr. Rajkumar Desai, and he's always wonderful, delightful to hear and give such good tips. Amit also gave an exciting and in, uh, excellent talk, and uh, I am glad to see all the top people of the ASSI here, Arvind, Alok, Satish, Umesh, Amit, Professor Jaiswal, and everybody uh, is there. And they are actually the pillars of ASSI as well. And they have taken a leap forward and started the MISAB, which is a very good thing. So I did record my talk because I was in the OT and I thought by chance I missed it, uh, I would be able to record a video. This was very kind. He sent me a link and I put the recorded video. So if we can play the video, please. Yes, sir, I'll share my screen. Thank you. You want to watch, see my screen, sir? Occasion yeah, yeah. of the annual conference of the Minimal Invasive Spine Society of Bharat, I wish you all a very good morning. When Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, my close friend and president of this association, and then Dr. Srikant rang me asking me to speak a few words on how ASSI 
could collaborate with Nisab, I thought to myself that let me find out who are the main players in Nisab. And so when I checked their website and I found out that lo and behold, all the famous faculty of the ASSI are also the famous faculty of the minimally invasive spine society of Bharat. As you can see, Professor Jaiswal, who has been my elder brother and mentor right from my MBBS days, since he's a good friend of my elder brother, he has passion and uh, really made me a spine surgeon today what I am. It is uh, really encouraging to know that stalwarts like him have spearheaded the minimal invasive spine society. Then I see Dr. Rajkumar, as you know, is a famous neurosurgeon and very active ASSI member. Alvin Kulkarni has really brought the minimal invasive tube uh, system and used it in all his surgical uh, operations and, and has got good result. And so has Neeraj and Vishal and Arun and so on and so forth. And then I thought, I was also a member of MISAP when I was when Amit was the secretary and Dr. Jaiswal was the president and I found out my membership number. So I am also a member of this elite society. And then I asked Mr. Joshi who rang me to say, sir, you have a talk and it's on this day. And I said, what has uh, MISAP done? Can you give me a brief history? So he sent me this WhatsApp note and I was surprised that uh, though it started on November 2014, it has 300 spine surgeons, 50 done 53 conferences, 250 missed lectures, 500 missed surgeries, and has had conferences year after year on and including a cadaveric workshop in 2017. I think which also Dr. Rajkumar uh, uh, did, and then I had live cadaveric in 2018, and so on. So this. Society was formed by the stalwarts of the ASSI with uh, the aim to make sure that every Indian citizen has access to safe, fast recovery of spine care at affordable price. And in order to facilitate a platform that will serve as an aggregate for latest in minimal invasive spine surgery in India, including the best practices, innovations and progress as achieved by the experts so as to be enabled to impart the training to those who want to learn it. If you go back a few years in, as you know, Alex Vaccaro publishes a lot of books. In 2010, he published a book from TMA uh, on controversies in spine surgery. And that was, at the time, minimal invasive was coming in and there were always skeptics. And as new technology comes in, there were always skeptics. In the last 15 years, minimal invasive surgery has well established itself and really raring to go and no more of controversy. It is essentially doing the same surgery as you know, with less access insult and complications with better patient outcomes. Nowadays, no one will go for an open gallbladder surgery. Everyone would like a minimal invasive gallbladder or a laparoscopic gallbladder surgery. And similarly, as abdominal surgery has come down to robotic surgery with mostly everything being minimal invasive with advanced technology, so has spine surgery advanced. Microscopes, endoscopes, percutaneous instrumentation, navigation, robotic surgery. All this has helped uh, in making the minimal invasive spine surgeon more skillful. However, there, as you know, there is a learning curve and newer, younger surgeons do pick this up much better. And uh, the peer has recognized this advantage of minimal invasive surgery and no more uh, showmanship of a few uh, specific surgeons. Now this is a big group and this is which is going to be the future of the day. Patients also accepted initially and now they demand uh, minimal invasive surgery. They tell me, would you do it minimally invasive by laser or would you do it open? So patients are more and more keen for my minimal invasive surgeries because they now see good outcome and good results. 
with virtual reality, artificial intelligence and machine learning coming into all this advanced technology and with genetic engineering, gene modulation and tissue biologics advancing every day, you will be surprised where spine surgery will be in 2035. I this did this case a couple of days ago and I have written this past at the at the moment we still do these surgeries routinely in my practice and I am sure in a few years it will be difficult for me to justify uh, doing all cervical disc prolapses by doing an ACDF and now at the moment there are a lot of people who are doing minimally invasive discectomies as you do for the lumbar spine with good outcome and result. Obviously, it, it prevents doing a fusion. And as you know, fusion is always a salvage procedure. So it prevents doing a fusion and with uh, either anterior or posterior for aminotomy, you can do a discectomy and with good outcome. And I see so many cases nowadays. Initially, it used to be a very uh, rarity really and now as I see more and more people getting onto this but the future would be different future would be biologic therapies and there are quite a good few papers I was preparing for this lecture there are quite a good few papers which show how biologics or cell-based therapy would change the disc degeneration and as you know a lot of studies are being done in proteomics and tissue engineering and uh, you will have a time when uh, we would harvest a cell and then centrifuge it, then concentrate it, then culture it. And after that, once you do a discectomy, you would put that cell in the hole and that would seal the annulus and uh, uh, good collagen formation will occur. So this day is not far away and that is going to happen. So the flight of Misab has already gone high up in the sky from 2014 to 2021. And on behalf of ASSI, I wish that we should get on to the flight as well as most of the passengers in this plane are from ASSI. So I'm hoping rather than ASSI doing something for MISAB, MISAB and ASSI should collaborate together to go for higher heights because together we can grow. If you look at the history of ASSI, this was a slide I wanted to put. If you look at the history, the first real meeting was done on the 1st of May, 1986 at Hotel Taj Mahal. And as you can see, that is uh, uh, the first scientific meeting, disorders of lumbar spine. There is Dr. Dolakia on the stage. And uh, I had the privilege of seeing him do surgery. He was a great surgeon. And it was attended by 82 orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons. And uh, since then, if you look at uh, what ASSI has grown to, uh, we have 200,888 members precisely. When I checked up with Nima yesterday, and not only from India, but also from various parts of the world and Indian subcontinent, we have uh, our own journal have published different books in spine. Dr. Raj Shekhan has published books in spine. Then we have monograms in spine, as Dr. Gautam Javeri has uh, and Dr. Raghav Dutt have published monograms in spine with all our own faculty in it. Then we have a very successful fellowship program, which is a two-year fellowship program, uh, the ASSI uh, fellowship. And there is a very competitive exam nowadays for this. In our days of training, there were no fellowships at all. So we had to go abroad. And now we have traveling fellowships, and there are different award programs to promote young surgeons. We have collaborated with various societies in, in the past and especially in the present due to the pandemic, we've had uh, various uh, collaborative meetings and the pandemic has shown that virtual meetings are now a real reality and we can learn a lot from all over the world. So when uh, Dr. Rajkumar said what ASSI can offer, of course, we are more than happy to offer uh, uh, part of the day or part of many uh, uh, three hours slot in any ASSI program, rebates and registration fees for all the conferences organized under the ages of ASSI, complimentary booth spaces for the ASSI, rebates in buying ASSI journals, 
but we have a wish list from the esteemed faculty of MISAB who are also the faculty of ASSI to help and train the members of ASSI to learn and lessen the learning curve because that's the big uh, reluctance for people like us who want to get onto the bandwagon as well. Hold webinars and training sessions, have a half day session in the ASICON or the ICS once in two years and uh, request all senior members and faculty to send articles to the ISJ. You would rec recognize that the current challenges of MIS for a senior surgeon is big because from an open field going into a 2D monitor display and having the three uh, uh, hand-eye coordination, you will need to develop unique psychomotor skills. And now they say that if you do play a lot of video games in your childhood, then you can be better at these surgeries. So the younger surgeons can pick them up faster. And then you have manipulation of long surgical instruments while adjusting for amplified tremor, reduced tactile feedback. You need some space. I find that when I mm, try to do minimal invasive, you need space and the space constraint uh, is a problem for me. And uh, that has been aptly shown by Dr. Kulkarni how with the TO we can do everything. So uh, there is a learning curve in this. And the training methods are also complicated because training on cadavers, you really don't get the feel. And uh, then training on animals, of course, not very prevalent in India, uh, but doesn't match uh, the exact anatomy of humans. And so that's an issue. So I'm sure that if MISAB really could set up virtual training centers or create uh, um, such facilities, and uh, which is going to happen in near future, and we in the ASSI are also trying to look into this, whether it could be a reality. That would take a lot, bring in a lot of more surgeons into the minimal invasive world with a lesser learning curve and good patient outcome. After all, we have to do the same surgery without causing any damage and giving better outcome. And that is the aim of minimal invasive spine surgery. I think together we can do anything or everything. And this is a great platform and an opportunity for all of us to collaborate. I especially thank Dr. Rajkumar, who is a very dear friend and I have a special place in my heart for him for having given me this opportunity to talk a few words to you. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much and have a great academic session. Thank you, Dr. Shankar Acharya. Thank you, my friend. I am extremely grateful for you for accepting this. And we in Misab are honored to have the president of ASSI speak such eloquently. We understand uh, each other's needs. And I hope in future, both associations will do justice for each other's existence. We, we collaborate better. We do things better. Ultimately, our patients will benefit. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your suggestions. And thank you once again for being a part of us. You'll always be in our memory. Thank you, Shankarji. And with that, I hand thank over the mic to uh, Umesh. Thank you very much, sir, for that exciting talk. And it was actually our honorary secretary, Dr. Arvind Kulkarni's idea to get these pearls of wisdom from you. Uh, so with this, we come to the end of this session and, uh, you know, I thank all the uh, faculty for their valuable time. We move on to the next uh, session and uh, we especially thank Dr. Professor Jaiswal and Dr. Rohidas, uh, our founder president and the past president, as well as all the speakers, you know, for, the, for this wonderful session. Uh, we go on to the next, the mic is all yours. I think you can take the session forward. Okay. So thank you, Umesh. Uh, this has been uh, a huge uh, effort from your side and we congratulate you for doing all the effort and bringing MISAB and this uh, surgical symposium to its culmination as we begin it today. Now I have an elaborate panel here with Dr. Arvind Jaiswal, Dr. Srinivas Rohidas, Dr. Satish Rudrapa, Dr. Bharat Dave and Dr. Gautam Zaveri who uh, will be there on the panel and uh, will address certain issues and, and an equally uh, dynamic and power packed speakers. We have Arvin Kulkarni, Raja Kumar, Karthik, Dr. Amit Jala and Alok who will be presenting uh, their... Uh, so without you know wasting much time, we are already about 16 minutes behind schedule. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Arvin Kulkarni, uh, can we start with this talk?
So, okay. and colleagues, my impression about this particular topic are as follows. Let's start with the case example. So, this is a 75-year-old gentleman who came to us with difficulty in walking, inability to, to feel the floor, and history of repeated falls. He showed multi-level compression on MRI, and this led to tubular decompression at multi-levels, which is one of our favorite surgeries. Obviously, this surgery had to fail because we had missed this lesion uh, at the level of the conus, the intramedullary lesion. So, uh, this was a matter of shame. And what you learn from this particular case is that, you know, you need to really, really examine and assess your patient and not jump to surgery looking at the MRI uh, casually. So, next illustration of a six, is of a 65-year-old gentleman with an extremely high BMI who was bedridden for the last four years in view of pain, paresthesia in his lower limbs. He also had incontinence and severe weakness in the lower limbs. So, he was referred to us for decompression at this uh, significantly stenotic level, that is at D11, D12. So, this particular should, case should not be considered as you know L45 or L5 S1 stenosis. This comes with deformity. This particular compression is a result of deformity at the apex of the thoracolumbar spine. And if you decompress this particular canal posteriorly, you'll be you know, releasing the tension band and making his kyphosis worse, thereby worsening the compression at that particular level. So these are the principles to be learned. And what this patient needs is an osteotomy and deformity correction. So every spine surgeon should know principles of deformity correction. So this is what was done. A V-shaped osteotomy centered over the apex realignment of the thoracolumbar kyphosis by, by excising the uh, compression at, of, uh, at the apex. And this is how we started walking after four years with significant relief in his paresthesia as well as his continence. So he was up on his feet after four years. A decompression alone would have made it worse. Obviously, this can be done using a minimal axis. There's another patient who had this disc herniation causing severe right-sided leg pain, but over a period of 15 days, when he saw four separate surgeons, his pain had gradually come down and he was advised surgery by all the four uh, surgeons. And, uh, in fact, in, in even if he did not, uh, you know, this patient did not have any kind of neuro deficit. So we all know that, you know, most disc herniations regress spontaneously, especially the ones which are large and uh, sequestrated. So, <clears throat> failure to understand the natural history of the disease or greed to operate in spite of knowing the natural history of the disease uh, is something which should be, uh, you know, uh, condemned. So, these are the lessons which you learn from this particular case. Then another patient with severe uh, leg pain as well as weakness and numbness uh, in his right lower limb and he definitely showed L3, 4, L4, 5 stenosis for which he was referred to us. But however, this is the uh, findings were disproportionate to his symptoms. So this should make you think, you know, whether this patient will definitely whether it would be improved by just decompression alone at these two places. So there was a hint here that there was an extra foramenal compression at L5 S1 on the right side. So he had, did have extra foramenal compression on a repeat MRI, uh, uh, which was the cause of his symptoms. So you can see that this this costified complex uh, in the CT. So what this patient needed was, you know, a decompression of this particular foramen. How you do it is a matter of choice. We did a minimal access relief and freed the nerve and it did not touch the L3-4 and L4-5 uh, stenosis. So, very, one should have a high degree of 
uh, suspicion when symptoms do not match with the MRI findings. So another patient uh, with uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, he had been advised C4-5, C5-6 discectomy to be done endoscopically. However, friends, it is very important to understand that in this particular case, the myelopathy was contributed by the disosteophyte complex at these two levels, as well as kyphosis. There is no disc herniation alone that can be you know, excised using an endoscope here. So the principles of treatment here would be discectomy plus partial corpectomy plus reconstruction with realignment, which was done in this particular in, in this particular way as shown here and the patient responded very well. So it is very important to understand problems and solutions well. You know, poor patient selection, extension of indications, poor surgical techniques can all lead to complications. So the journey from Shivaji Park to Oval did not happen overnight. There's a lot of stress, tears, sweat involved here. So the take home is to be with these stars here, know the subject well, learn principles, dirty your hands, learn open surgery, learn to manage complications, learn to make decisions, then MIS will welcome you. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, that was uh, quite an elaborate uh, lecture on what things one must avoid while we are taking uh, the new steps and taking the infantile steps towards uh, learning the MIS. May I ask um, Dr. Arvind Jaiswal, sir, are you there? Uh, or may I ask Dr. Srinivas Rohidas? My panel seems to be disappearing. Ah, Dr. Jaiswal, sir. Yeah, yeah, tell me. So, a quick question to you. Um, what is your quick one minute advice to somebody who is starting out? What are the types of cases that he should learn and he should start with before jumping on to the complex cases that uh, Arvind does nowadays? Uh, basic essential uh, concept of surgery, any surgery, is start with the basic and straightforward cases, right? So if you're starting with a tubular uh, MIS system, for example, start with a uh, well-defined uh, disc which needs surgery, you know, and, and a large uh, posterior lateral disc. So go from the simple straightforward cases and then extend your... your uh, your indications as you become more and more skillful and expert of that technique as such. Right. And as, as Arvind had also said, one, one must know the open technique, the open uh, anatomy before you even embark on MIS. So that has probably worked for most of us because we were trained in the open era and then we adopted the MIS. Yeah, that's what right. What is happening is that all fellows of Arvind are only seeing MIS. Now, right. where, how do they learn the open surgeries if he doesn't do any? So that is a big question, I think. So uh, maybe during the orthopedic residency training, there should be more focus on open surgical uh, training. Rotation. They should probably follow up on with an uh, MIS fellowship or things like that. So this is just a passing thought. So let, let us uh, take the next uh, lecture, Dr. Rajakumar Deshpande. He is going to speak on 10 essential things that an MIS surgeon should have. So, um, let us hear what Raja has to say on these 10 things and maybe we can learn something more from him as well. Can I play the video, sir? Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the 10 essential things an MIS guy should have. Be the right guy. So I would like to put this under three major components. Attribute of the surgeon, equipment and technology, and the staff and team. And let me expand on all that. So what are the attributes of the surgeon? The first is patience. In MIS surgery, one should be patient with yourself, with the other members of the team, 
and in circumstances that may happen during the surgery. So good things take time. This is a picture that I had taken waiting for quite a while and you know the bird is about to fly off and it takes patience with the bird. Mindset. So the surgeon should have proper planning for the case, should have backup plans in case something goes wrong. If there is a setback, not to blame others. One should be willing to accept failure of a technique or complications and to get better, you should have the mindset not to stop learning, keep learning, update knowledge often. Now, anticipation of complications in certain category of patients like severe obesity, osteoporosis patients, fluorotic patients, and a severely narrow canal. These can really hamper your surgical technique. What would otherwise be a simple surgery may end up with additional problems. So if you can anticipate these things beforehand, you'll be far wiser. And not the least important, it's really very, very important to have a good understanding of spine anatomy and the biomechanics. You should be able to read MRI, CT and X-rays in thorough detail. Also to remember every case is different. There's no simple case. And a simple case can be challenging in its own way. So these are the attributes that a surgeon should have. What about equipment and technology? In today's world, CM is a must. Nerve monitoring is necessary for most cases. And of course, you need a good technician to interpret it. Now, OAM navigation and robots, they are now considered a big luxury. However, in times as go by, it will become a must as the CM nowadays. So, Usage of microscope and endoscope. This is the tiger I took in Ranthambore picture. And if I zoom in one of the pictures, you can actually see the house flies on the nose of the tiger. You can zoom the picture. Same way in surgery, microscope and endoscope gives a fantastic and phenomenal view with the coaxial light system. Please use it. To have good control on tissue, you need uh, microsurgical instruments for delicate handling and a good instrumentation system. And get used to one system first before you try many systems. So you can understand the pros and cons of one of the system thoroughly. Now staff and team, very important to have a good uh, OT technician who can handle the CM because he'll make your life less miserable. He will save time and energy, reducing the dose of radiation, and your surgical experience will be better and better with him because you can compress the operating time or over a few number of cases. Now, you must have the company to send a person for instrumentation support. It is very, very good important to have them. If you get into trouble, they will help you out with alternatives. You should also be very familiar with the instruments. If you use the same kind of instruments over time, you will get a hand feel. You will know by the feel of the equipment itself that this is what it can do. Having a good scrub nurse and assistance is a beautiful thing to have because they with their experience will hand instruments without you asking for it because they have the ability to anticipate the next step. Especially in long cases, in MIS, sometimes the case goes too long. Fatigues can you know, affect the judgment of the surgeon. So a good scrub nurse is a fantastic addition to the team. So with that, I hope I've given you the 10 essential items that 
a MIS guy should have. And I hope this sort of gives in a gist what an MIS surgeon uh, should try to develop over time. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, Dr. Deshpande. That was very uh, uh, thoughtful and a very nice way in which you have, you know, outlined uh, these 10 attributes uh, that and the things that a surgeon needs. May I ask one of my panelists, um, we have uh, Gautam here. Yeah, Gautam, uh, forget the MIS section part of the, of the attributes of the, that Raja has said, but what in your opinion is besides these 10 things that Raja has enumerated, uh, does anything else come to your mind that what uh, as in, an, any spine surgeon should consider as an essential besides what Raja has already enumerated? Yeah, thank you for asking me, Subir. That, that we heard to some wonderful talks by Arvind and uh, Raja. Uh, I would go back to Arvind's talk in this regard. I think the first essential is that as Arvind emphasized very correctly is patient selection. Just because you are doing a surgery minimally invasive doesn't mean that you are operating on some other pathology or such. So patient selection remains the most important criteria. Do not think that because you are doing a minimally invasive surgery, you, your patient selection criteria change. They do not. They do not. So your patient selection is the single most important thing that should be there. The second thing is, as a surgeon, you should know everything. Don't try to think. It is good to think minimally invasive. But don't, there are times when it may not be possible. Like the case which Arvind showed where he had corrected the kyphosis with the, in a patient who had paraparesis or paraplegia. Now, sometimes... You as a surgeon should have everything in your armamentarium from major maximally invasive reconstructive surgery to minimally invasive surgery and endoscopic surgery. And select horses for courses. Select your surgery based upon the patient's pathology and need rather than you deciding first of all, this is I have to just do it through an endoscope and then you land up making mistakes. The third important thing is that often in an endoscopic surgery, the anatomical view is extremely different. And therefore, a knowledge of, thorough knowledge of anatomy, as Dr. Deshpande mentioned, is extremely important. You should have a three-dimensional perception of the anatomy. And especially when you are doing endoscopic spine surgery, which is through a postrolateral endoscope, then the entire anatomic viewpoint changes completely. And therefore, you should be aware of the different stories in which you are operating as described by McCulloch, the three stories and where you are going in. Because that requires a complete reorientation from the typical posterior approach that most of us use all the time. So these, I think, are the very vital things that you should think about. Thank you. Okay. All right. So thank you, Gautam. Uh, that was uh, enlightening as well. Now, can we move on to the next... Next lecture by Dr. Karthik Kailash. He's speaking yes. about his experience and how he overcome, overcame his experience, his problems in the initial period. Can I play his video, sir? Yeah. Karthik, where is he? Yeah, I am here. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, Thank you very much, Dr. Deshpande, Dr. Umesh Srikanth, and the executive at the NISAB for inviting us and also for putting up a fantastic event despite very difficult and hard times with the COVID. Today, I'm here to, to share with you the initial problems and how I tackled them in the start of my career as a minimally invasive spine surgeon. India is a very, very large country with a la being a land of diversity. It's very diverse. You'll see people in cycle rickshaws and things like that on one hand. And then you have my good friend, Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande in his swine new Mercedes. So it's a very big land of uh, diversity. And it's also a land of contrast with so many different things. So it has to be accessibility and availability of many, many things for varying people all over the country is important. And how do we go about doing that is a challenge. 
Now to talk about this, the first thing that uh, came to my mind was the concepts. First, to become a spine surgeon, and then there are to become a minimally invasive spine surgeon. So to start with, when I when I said I want to be a spine surgeon to my chief, he quietly and promptly told my wife, "Your husband is a mad fellow," and I continued to be mad. I continued to become a spine surgeon later, and thereafter the move to become a minimally invasive trained spine surgeon began. And we are still trying to do our best in this area. So, what were the problems that we encountered in our early part of career? First thing was a lack of awareness to a spine surgery, and then to a minimally invasive spine surgery itself. So, not everyone had an access to standard care, and the cost factor was enormous, so people couldn't afford it. Remember, the change is never painful, but the resistance to change is always painful. And this is very important for us to remember because we are we ready to change. So, I thought the process of change can be thought about in terms of man, metal, and mind. So. We look at the man as a whole. When we start as a junior, where do we stand? And then, when do we? Have, what happens when we are a senior? As a junior, we have problems in trying to learn new techniques, in trying to implement new techniques, whether we are in the institution or in a private practice. Institutional practice, we are bound by seniors who may not be amenable to what we think and what we want, and they wouldn't want new things to be developed. On the other hand, in private practice, you are very wary and you are scared of doing a new or experimental procedure, which you think might be derailing. As a senior, when you get to be older. You have the onus of responsibility of providing consistently good results, and therefore you don't want to take up something new which you are not adequately trained. So that's a that's a problem there. How do we have to circumvent that? You have to have an adequate mind. You have to think clearly, get yourself trained, and be aware that retraining is important in every part of life. Now we go on to the metal part of it. Various tech gadgets, etc., have been used in our minimally invasive procedures for doing all these procedures: discectomies, fillers, and all these things. Now. When we talk about innovating in modern is yet we want to do it because the pressure of delivering the correct treatment of an affording patient at minimum cost but maximum benefit and safety is needed and who else better known to innovate than my good friend Dr Rajkumar here so the transition from open to micro to tubular tractors was a large transition various gadgets have been in use metro experiments for later and present day tubes however all these things were problematic first of all they were not available easily and universally available so it was not user friendly and we didn't know how to use it as because you are not well trained in this area more importantly the vision was not adequate without a microscope and not many of us were microscopically trained or did have access to a microscope in our early part of our career we had to use loops so these things compounded to it and that meant that we had to modify newer things and make sure that we were able to do the same procedure in a very similar fashion to doing an open procedure so the solution was in modifying our basic retractors or home retractors which would help us in doing the same procedure as efficiently as possible in terms of Of giving the optimum result, like the modern retractors were there. We go on to instrumentation. You know, we have to remember that when you start putting this instrumentation, adequate preparation and planning for that there. So you, the first case we did, we remember that does it the tray had. Only a 90 millimeter rod. These instrumentations, when they began, were all designed for uh, low back surgery and not for trauma or skip levels. So the longest rod in the tray was only a 90 millimeter tray, and therefore we then had to devise get the original tray as a backup, keep it there, and from that we had to use a regular rod on a free hand technique to go ahead. and complete the procedure so remember that these things can be a problem if you are not adequately prepared and you have adequate experience guide wires being bent and used and migrating are a problem so go go on to a technique where you can learn to put the screws in without the guide wires being bent this engagement of extenders is a major problem because the companies do not have adequate extenders which can be rigidly fixed on so adequate changes had to be made in that reduction devices were inappropriate and one such was this Used where the screw captured and it pulled the screw back up to the rod, not the other way around. Where you need the rod to be pushed onto the screws, and this is also you know pull out the time of surgery itself. So it's very important as a surgeon that you pay attention to detail. And as surgeons, we are always careful and we pay attention to detail every single time. Not paying attention to detail can also lead to problems like what I have had. Can we extend this to the anterior surgery? Yes. The same thing can be done with the modern techniques, and we can do a olives as well as a corpectomy, etc. The same technique what I have described. Implant modification, as I mentioned to you, the extenders were coming loose. That's why we had to use the screw, which itself was an extender. Therefore, the, the screw loosening out or the extender loosening out did not happen. And these things had to be made cheaper so that we can do the things for all kinds of patients, not only for corporate or for, or for corporate patients alone. Lastly, moving on to newer areas of navigation, doing a cervical spine in a navigation was a new experience. However, the problems in that were that you could have You may feel the table were not appropriate. There's a blind spots in that because of the opacity, and therefore this is a problem in getting appropriate registration done. So had to redo the table in terms of of, of, of repositioning it so that 
appropriate exposure can be done with the navigation and the CM and then complete the procedure. Remember, every single time you're starting to do a procedure with a new technique or a new gadget, make sure that it's always rerun and a trial run has been done before you can go through with that. So climb mountains, not so the world can see you, but so you can see the world. It's a very important thing because I've learned it and I've done. I've been fortunate to have many of my friends here who have climbed mountains and seen things and also ensured that we are also a part of it and and, and, and empowered us to do something better as we go on. Life was to live. And I thought this is a good thing for us to think about. 20 to 30, get a good mentor, develop a thought process. 30 to 40, try out different things. 40 to 50, do only the things that you're good at. 50 to 60, invest in youth. And over 60, the time for yourself. Enjoy your passion. Invest in youth is very important. Have a good team. I'm very fortunate that I had a good team in my colleagues, Vignesh, Sai, and Sudhir. It's very important to develop that. Lastly, always keep a keep an eye around and there's always another way which can be better done by your friends who can teach you that always think laterally and remember there's always a way which can be a better way thank you very much so that was an interesting uh, uh, talk by dr karthik kailash he has there are a lot of modifications as he has shown us. He was doing this MIS trauma cases even before any of us were you know, really trying to put screws in trauma. So he has led us uh, a lot. Um, from our panel, we have Dr. Bharat Dave with his huge experience. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dave, can I ask you to just share some experience on any modifications which you have done in your practice? which would, you know, allow you and all of us to learn something more from there. Okay, yeah, I think repeatedly we have been discussing about how to convert uh, MISS, you know, from conventional to MISS practice. And I think one really need to have the gadgets in such a way that, so that, you know, if you have some problem, then you have some sort of the, I would say, you know, the, the the conventional surgery you should be able to perform. That is very important. So that is something which we always make sure when we get the fellow, we have the MISL surgery done, but we all teach everybody or other the fellows that they have to know real anatomy and conventional surgery. Suppose something goes wrong, then they should be convert that into the conventional surgery. So that is something. And we keep on updating ourselves as far as the gadgets are concerned. So, you know, OAM technology, you know, adoption, adoption has to be done as well. And most important is magnification. Hope I have answered your question. I definitely no, no. This was just like a discussion because uh, uh, we have very short time in between to discuss on these things. And uh, as it is we are running late so i'm trying to uh, you know involve each and every panelist that we have along with the speakers so uh, now we have dr amit jala who has always been you know uh, what raja kumar said never stop learning he has adopted the endoscope the full endoscope technique as well and uh, can we have dr amit jala's next talk on tube versus endoscope or which one and both Dr. Jala, please. I will share the screen, sir. Everybody, whether to use tube or an endoscope, there is always a heated debate in the conference. And I've been seeing and watching and even uh, involved in these debates whether to use tube or an endoscope. These debates are done by the key opinion leaders and masters of this technique. And because of that, the young fellows who are watching these debates are always confused because both the masters will show their best results. So in this short presentation, I have tried to uh, give head to head comparison between the tube and an endoscope. Now, in 2002, I started with digital microendoscopic dystectomy technique and wherein the endoscope was fitted around the tube and the procedure was done with the help of the endoscope assisted tubular discectomy. The biggest problem here was the fogging of the endoscope and the field of vision which was less because the endoscope would come in the way of the tractor. 
and you can see the field was bloody uh, compared to what uh, you can see now. And in 2008, I started using the tubular discectomy, wherein the we stopped using the endoscope and started using the microscope. And the biggest advantage here was you can use the whole diameter of the tube. And with the help of the microscope, you can get a good magnification. So the procedure where you can get a better space or, or working area. And with the help of the microscope, you can get a good three-dimensional vision. And uh, you can do the same procedure uh, very nicely with the help of the magnification. But in 2016, I started using the full endoscopic technique. And you can see that there was a drastic difference between the vision. You can see the clarity of the vision. And this clarity of the vision, which was absolutely bloodless, which was because of a constant irrigation. And you can get a good magnification by use of the endoscope. And therefore, each and every technique has got their advantage. So what I have tried to do here is give you the head-to-head -head comparison by point-wise taking each and every uh, point. As far as the vision is concerned, tube gives a good three-dimensional vision because of the microscope, but the field is usually bloody. While compared to that, the endoscope will give 2D vision, but you will have a better and clear field of vision. And therefore, the advantage goes to the endoscope. Magnification, if you use the microscope, then you can get a very good magnification with the help of the tube. But the advantage in the endoscope is that it's a real-time magnification. Because with the help of the endoscope, you can just go uh, as near to the, uh, the field of vision what you want to look for. So it's a real time and therefore the advantage uh, goes to the endoscope in magnification. Handling, definitely compared to the tube, endoscope has got a, a more learning curve and the handling because you have to use both the hands and the tube has an advantage compared to the endoscope. Reachability. The tube has got less reachability because every time if you want to look at the corners, you will have to wand the tube. While in endoscope, you can just move the endoscope and as such, the endoscope comes with 25 degrees of vision. And therefore, you can get a better or a more field of vision compared and reachability compared to the tube. And the advantage goes to the endoscope. The surgical time. The surgical time will decrease as your experience increase. Though I have said that tube has got less surgical time, but I think both are equal because once you master the technique of an endoscope, the surgical time is definitely going to come down. Learning curve. Endoscope has got much more learning curve. There is a steep learning curve in endoscope compared to the tube. Versatility tube has obvious advantage because it can be used at all the levels of the spine and you can do all the procedures like only discectomy and decompression and fusions with the help of the tube. Well, endoscope, it's definitely less versatile because more of the decompression procedures can be done best by the endoscope. Anesthesia. Endoscopic uh, procedures can be done under local anesthesia and in high-risk patients. This is a definite advantage compared to the tube. Outcomes, they are both nearly the same. Complication rates, they are much more. In initially, it is high in endoscope and the biggest problem is inadequate decompression. So there are no limitations for the tube. But there definitely is a limitation in the endoscope because you cannot do the fusion. So advantage goes to the tube. The incision size is definitely much more smaller in endoscope compared to the tube. The equipment cost. If you use the tube with the microscope, the equipment cost will be high. But if you start using with the loops, then the equipment cost will be very low. Compared to the full endoscopic, where you, there are a lot of other gadgets which are required like RF and Burr and specialized lasers. And therefore, the whole endoscope system is much more costlier compared to the tube. And if you use uh, Distando or UBE, definitely the cost can come down. So if you use tube or Distando or UBE, the cost is less compared to a full endoscopic system. There are no recurrent costs in tube. But in endoscope, you have to use a RF device. There are scope issues, there are instrument breakages, and therefore tube has an advantage in recurrent cost. Portability, yes. If you use a loop with the tube, then it is portable and endoscope is always a portable. So both are equal in marketing and glamour. Definitely endoscope is much more marketable. There is much more glamour attached to the endoscope compared to the tube. And if you look at the future, both have a future. Technology which is fast advancing, you are getting better fusion uh, related equipments and devices for an endoscope. And therefore, I see a future 
which is there even in an endoscope. So it's an equal compared to what the tube and the uh, endoscope is there. So the take home is both have their own advantage and disadvantages for decompression. Yes, endoscope is better and do the job, but has limitation definitely for the fusion. The tube can be used as a bailout technique if the endoscope fails. So it's better that you should have both the things with you. The last message is you must train for both the technique. Check what works best in your hands. What are your skills and master that technique first. Once you've mastered one technique, you can go for the other technique and never try to do all the procedures through the single technique. Thank you very much. Excellent, Amit Bhai. That was an excellent presentation. I think you have elaborated and you know thought over a lot about both these systems. And now that you have uh, both of them at your disposal, uh, I'm sure uh, you probably are one of the best persons to give us advice on to whosoever asks. I think a young uh, spine fellow wants to learn. Probably you would be better off uh, telling them which one is best. Um, I was wondering if we have Dr. Rohidas with us. It seems we don't have him. Anyways, we are as it is. Uh, Raja, do you want to elaborate on anything on that Amit Bhai just said on both these things? Raja, Raja Kumar Deshpande. Yeah, I have uh, had nothing to add because Amit Bhai is a fantastic experienced surgeon. I think he has put all the pros and cons beautifully. I think the young surgeons should revisit that talk in their mind several times and they will have a fantastic uh, bird's eye view of what to do over years to come. Thank you. Right. Okay, so then we move on to the last talk by Dr. Alok Ranjan. Sure, sir. He's speaking on uh, whether the road that we have taken, is it the right one or does it still require uh, a critical appraisal? We must critically appraise whether minimally invasive spine surgery is going the right way in India. There are several factors which will influence it. One is, is the literature favorable? What is the learning curve and what is the side effect of that? What are the special equipments and cost implications? Does the patient prefer it? What are the ways of overcoming radiation related challenges? And what is the health insurer's view regarding cost related challenge? Now, various well designed prospective and randomized controlled trials have shown that MIS has an overall advantage in discectomy, grade 1 2 listhesis, obese patients, redo surgery with midline disturbed, and selected cases of thoracolumbar trauma metastasis infection in short term. Long term, studies are not, they are equivocal. We also know that these other side of the spectrum, small intradural tumor, vertebral fracture requiring corpectomy, selected cases of infection, trauma tumor, and olive, it is not inferior to previous gold standard. And for certain specific matter, they are superior. However, it will take some time to accumulate results. The initial learning curve of MIS in decompression procedure, it was found that by 30th case, the complication rate decreased from 11% to 0% and even the operative time reached to acceptable level between 50th and 30th procedure. The major complications were derotomy, neurological injury or conversion to open procedure. This has been proven by level 2, 3 and 4 studies. Whereas for TLF, by level 2 and 3 studies, the overall complication was 20% included instrument malposition, infection, non-union, non derotomy, post-operative contralateral stenosis left. The learning curve was 20 case and even the operative time decreased by 33 to 50% over 20 cases. This was an experience of single surgeon which showed that over time, the Asia improvement suggested that the patient's surgeon's results are getting better. The two level percentage of miss had gone up tremendously in the third year and then came down to 25 year 
we suggested that the pendulum is swinging back and the spike in third year was over enthusiasm and as we can see by second year the complication rate had come down and remained acceptable now learning curve can be decreased by cadaver workshop before which we are doing misab annual biannual workshop major company workshop there are hospital based short term mentorship fellowship and in house training this was a presentation done by metronics that in 2010 in america they had a traditional fusion 2% and by 2020 it reached 10% and initially it was only for degenerative disc disease when now in involved trauma tumor cement augmentation olf and even difficult listhesis so there is a scope now minimally invasive surgery in spine was first introduced as a discectomy somewhere in early 2000 in all systems and the first for fusion was introduced by metronics as a c horizon set as well as a longitude set and this actually increased the scope of minimally invasive spine surgery subsequently there are several companies which have come with one type of modification or other but the basic principles of fusion remains the same now this was a data from kutsi stoge they had about 150 sets in 2010 and by 2020 the sets number had increased to 600 out of that the standard was about 200 sets the pled percentage of sets were about 20% in 2010 and is increased to 50% so obviously pled has grown over the years but we must understand there is a significant percentage of sets are with non user or which are old abandoned sets this was a graph by metronics which showed that mass user in 2010 were 31 went to 324 by 2020 navigation which is an important part to reduce uh, radiation and increase precision increased from 5 to 140 and 3d cm oam from 2 to 28 so there's no doubt there has been progress it could have been better but there has been progress the last challenge was how to reduce radiation risk good ot setup apron collar smart technician smart use of fluoroscopy more cases will give better workflow however the problem with navigation and robotic is the cost as i discussed earlier there are problems with radiation such as cataract malignancy brain tumor and one has to be careful about radiation could we have done better of course more cadaver workshop but what we have learned from cadaver workshop that they can only be done by multinational companies and hardly 10% delegates are found to be serious converts what is the surgeon's perspective it's a capital investment learning curve complication rate has to be manageable and cost of surgery goes up insurance mostly rejected so there is no financial incentive to do this however the good thing is that the patient always wants minimally invasive what is my perspective minimally invasive surgery means less invasion so but the sub optimal surgical endpoints cannot be accepted and as of now for the sake of minimally invasive surgery we have a fairly substantial number of sub optimal surgical endpoints case selection is very important one size should not fit all nobody is genius in this field we must understand our limitations limitations of the instruments as well as the exact disease as of now there is no long term consistent benefit over traditional approaches so but the short term benefit is established thank you so that was a very critical uh, appraisal i must say uh, a, a very thoughtful insight into these issues which perhaps have never been thought of or discussed on a scientific platform actually these are the things that we discuss perhaps perhaps when we are sitting on the bylines of a conference and then we don't have the numbers so alok there was a great job that you did with the numbers and the statistics that you brought forward um we are already running late by 20 minutes uh, if there are a lot of pearls of wisdom by dr arvin kulkarni and this he showed us uh, what cases that we should do and what are the ones that should be adopted using a different technique not necessarily mis always then there were the 10 attributes by dr raj uh, rajakumar uh, the modifications uh, that uh, karthik did in his practice 
to make sure that uh, he overcame the challenges and then the absolute and fantastic comparison of the tube versus the endoscope by dr amit jala followed by dr alok ranjan's um, critical appraisal on wo- where we are and the direction forward so i think we have had a very interesting session and we should move on without wasting much time uh, sh- shall i ask dr umesh are you there umesh can yes, you please uh, uh, close this session and take a, take the next session forward please and yeah, thank yeah. you all moderator and uh, thank you all speakers panelists and all the audience uh, who are here for uh, making this session a uh, very enjoyable one thank you all yeah thank you very much uh, uh, dr subhi javari for the for moderating this excellent session for uh, on mis for beginners i think this is where now we are going to break off now the hall b is also going to start so those who are interested in attending the session in hall b that is going to be on an endoscope uh, based uh, talks the basics of endoscope assisted surgery and endo- full endoscopic surgery uh, so you can log in log off from hall a and just enter the hall b and here in hall a we are going to continue with the basics of uh, tubular retractor assisted surgery and for this i would like to call upon uh, the our next moderator who is going to talk on tubular retractor assisted surgery the basics he is going to moderate the entire session dr kartik kailash dr kartik kailash are you around yeah thanks yes. thanks umesh uh, without okay, wasting much of time here. yeah without wasting much of time thank you very much and uh, well done well begun is uh, half done so oh uh, we we have with our panelists for tubular retractor is the experts of tubular surgery vishal kundishal kundan nikhil from uh, bombay niraj from uh, amdavad and uh, bala from uh, chennai to uh, to talk on various topics will be our uh, bunch of uh, talkers uh, dr jayesh from uh, dr jayesh or fanikiran or gururaj dr jacob satyan and niraj and subir javedi so we without wasting time i call upon dr jayesh to give his first talk on basics of mis instruments and equipments sir can i play his video sir yes please very good morning to all Shant, are we on? हाँ बोलो हमना नहीं मारे जी वार लाख सर प्रशांत अभी प्रशांत maybe we can move on to the next talk then can we can we resharing the screen sir there was some technical issue yeah please do i'll reshare it please yeah you able to see my screen sir yes please please so, go ahead today i'm going to brief about the basics of uh, mis's hardware for this presentation there is a no disclosure no conflict of interest and this presentation is education purpose only since 1997 with the tubular assisted surgeries the most uh, considered the most popular retractor system available is the minimal exposure tubular retractor system or the matrix system and uh, it can be used from top to bottom cervical to even a sacrum level the various aspect the various procedure the only difference is the various landmark for the docking point is different now if you see it's available from uh, diameter 14 mm to 26 mm diameter in range normally 18 to 20 mm diameter is used uh, for uh, mild to moderate to bit 
मेट्रिक सिस्टम इज फॉर मल्टीपल लेवल एक्सपोजर एंड मल्टीपल लेवल प्रोसीजर यू नीड टू डिपोजिट इट एंड दिस नोन एज बैंडिंग नाउ टू अवॉइड दिस दिस मेट्रिक सिस्टम इज रिवोल्यून इन द रिवोल्यूशन इन टू सेकंड जनरेशन टू एक्सक्यू in which uh, the tube in which after after uh, placing into the docking point the lower border of the tube can be expanding and it can be expanding up to the three level so uh, this can this this is multiple bending can be avoided now for mises for the tube assisted surgery within the tube long thin bionated instrument is preferred so these are the uh, picture of uh, some long and thin bionated instruments commonly used for the mises quadrant detectors Three types of quadrant detector is available. Uh, posterior mast posterior quadrant detector, which is used in a PLF and TLF. This is a lateral quadrant detector, which is used in LLF and OLF. And uh, this is an anterior quadrant detector system used for LLF. Now the, the the principle and the quality of the quadrant detector is that the two bed blades are separate and it can be angled up to 30 degrees so that from the single incision it can expand it up to the three level so with the single small incision you can operate up to three level various different kind of kind shape and size of uh, the cage is available for the different kind of lumbar interval diffusion like this is the cage for the pilif cage for the uh, tilif which is banana shape now dick Thick cage is available, which is radio lucent, and the titanium cage is also available, which is radio opaque. This is a long, thin, long and with a wide cage for the only for L L F, which is uh, uh, deployed in the anterior column between the two body. Now, six to eighteen degrees is the range of lordotic lordosis in which these cages are available. In, in advance, if you see. this expanding cage is a newer things which can be expanded into the lordosis and this is a thin perforated fenestrated cage which can be deployed via percutaneous transfer of endoscopic system these are the different cages medical assist device is a become very popular for the needle monitoring purpose by a free running emg while putting a pedicle now this 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 wire is attached with this pedicle assist device like the jamsethi needle attached with the needle monitoring system uh, for a free running emg so putting a pedicle instead of jamsethi if you put a uh, uh, cross the pedicle by this uh, pedicle assist needle then if you violate the medial pedicle because of injury or compression of the nerve root suppose there then this change in the free running emg signals will notify you and give you alert signal this is how you can make it safe cornerstone steps for a uh, interval diffusion is the end plate preparation now there are some ideal methods uh, within the tube you should start the disc preparation with the servers you should start with the small servers thin and then increase in the size rotate it so that the annulus purposes become loose and then you can remove it the forceps then after uh, the, the the other remaining part of the annulus at the corner and all of the part of the body can be removed by this uh, straight scrapers the cup curate and the ring curate which is helpful at the angle now this after uh, that step the long bionic uh, this uh, long angled the cup curate is used to, to separate the elastic cartilage from the bony part of the cartilage even from contralateral side also and this angled rasper is used to rub uh, the the bony part of the cartilage so you can it can promote the fusion and then you can put a cage after the pedicle screw fixation there are two kind of uh, road insertion method is available one is a uh, uh, road insertion system from the separate incision and another in which road inserted from the same incision so sextan system uh, is used uh, to put a rod from the different incision uh, especially when the fixation is restricted to three level for more than three level it is the longitude system can be used from the separate incision and this is the different mechanism uh, available by the various company in which the rod can be inserted from the same incision so this two uh, rod incision method is available thank you very much for your attention this was the brief about the mis hardware thank you Thanks, thanks, Dr. Jayesh. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Karthik. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. A lovely talk, and uh, I will now request. Uh, is Vishal there? Vishal, Vishal around or? 
Michelle, hi, good morning. Can can I just get you to say a few words on anything else, any equipment which Jayesh might have uh, missed out on, which you are specially using? Yes. Yeah, sir, you're muted. Please unmute. Yeah, uh, sorry. So most of the things comprehensively Jayesh has covered. Just few things, I think. Uh, most of the surgeons now have started using cylindrical fixed diameter tubes instead of the expandable ones. So that is one thing that I would recommend most of us to use it because they are less traumatic, more stable, and they remain in the muscle area more more uh, stringently. Of course, they have their own limitation that the view is limited. You cannot expand it. Uh, but the advantages are also plenty that you can actually start using it. The second thing is uh, uh, most of these tubes that are available today are available in metal. However, there are the second version of tubes that are available in carbon fiber. So while using your cautery or while using your instruments which are electronic driven, I would recommend using those carbon fiber fixed diameter cure tubes for your early decompression procedures and discectomy procedures. So that is one thing, maybe an uh, addition to what Jayesh just mentioned. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks for Michelle. adding on to it. So we just now go on to the next talk by Dr. Fani Kiran. Fani is uh, a senior consultant spine surgeon at the uh, Global Gilnagil's Hospital in Chennai, a very dear friend of ours. Uh, he's going to talk on dilatation technique, knowing the correct docking position and angle. Problems anticipated. Over to you, Fani. Can, can you play the video for uh, Dr. Fani? Thank you, sir. Good afternoon all, I am talking about uh, the technique of serial dilatation that is a universal step in all the minimally invasive uh, spine procedures. Uh, it is basically a principle where we move away from cutting and stripping the muscles from their uh, attachments to uh, sequentially dilating the uh, track to the target area, the working window by using serial dilators so that the muscle injury is uh, minimum. It is used in all the minimal invasive techniques like uh, for a micro tubular microdiscectomy or foraminotomy or uh, decompression for a lumbar canal stenosis and uh, interbody fusions, lateral interbody fusions, and even on cervical spine. The steps usually uh, involve uh, marking the incision uh, under the CR uh, based on the landmarks, depending on the procedure, uh, and docking the serial dilators at the desired side, followed by serial dilatation uh, up to the desired uh, diameter based on the refractor that is being used, and then fixing it in position. For a micro discectomy, usual uh, incision is one to two centimeters lateral to the midline, and uh, one must uh, dock it on the inferior edge, feel the inferior edge of the superior lamina of the level that is being operated. Uh, one should avoid using a K-wire or a guide wire uh, for the initial uh, location uh, because there is a risk of entering the spinal canal. This is a small uh, video to show the animation to show the technique. Incision 1 to 2 centimeters lateral to the midline. The initial dilator is used to feel the inferior edge of the superior lamina and find the right position for docking the sequential dilators followed by the retractor, the length of which is measured on the final dilator and then it is fixed in position. The same technique is used over a guide wire for insertion of uh, medical screws. Uh, one must ca be careful not to violate the facet joint um, and an interbody fusion uh, for interbody fusion, the transforaminal approach. Uh, the incision usually is uh, 4 to 5 centimeters lateral to the midline uh, to get an angulation into the uh, disc. The docking site is on the facet joint of uh, on the side where the symptoms are more uh, through which the interbody fusion is planned. And uh, the position of the dilatus is checked before fixing the retractor and going ahead. This is uh, an example of a two-level decompression where the serial dilators are used and the tubular retractor uh, to do the decompression at one level first and then the uh, same incision is used to redirect the retractor to the next level by doing the serial dilatation again and uh, the procedure is finished in this manner. There are some problems that one might face. Uh, uh, more importantly, if the entry is too lateral, there is a 
higher chance of excising the facet joint, more of the facet joint and uh, causing instability. Sometimes the patients have a thick uh, spinous process which might push the entry lateral. One must be careful not to violate the facet joint uh, more than required. And uh, in obese patients, the locating the midline might be difficult and using the C-arm is recommended uh, to mark the incision. And uh, one may need to start a bit lateral uh, compared to a thin patient. And uh, the longer tubes that may be required in obese patients may hamper the instrument movement and uh, lighting visualization inside. Uh, other minor problems that one might face is uh, it is important to take out the offside or IO band on the, at the incision site so that uh, while passing the serial dilators it doesn't go into the wound. Uh, adequate skin incision is important uh, to prevent skin uh, necrosis at the edges and uh, if the detractor fixation is not uh, proper or the length is short, there may be muscle creeping into the uh, field. So uh, that is an important step that one must uh, be careful. And uh, if the procedure is being done under uh, epidural or spinal or uh, sometimes in the local, the, the patient movement is a problem. And uh, one must also be aware of uh, formation of hematomas in the muscles uh, after the, the post-operative period and even uh, reports of the compartment syndrome. So, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Fani, for the uh, very nice illustration on uh, dilatation techniques. Is, uh, is Dr. Bala there? Ba Dr. Bala Murli, is he around? Bala is not there. Yes, okay. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, good morning, Bala. Hi, yes, hi. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, would, you, did, did you, would you want to uh, talk a few words on you know, the docking, te docking technique and the difficulties you had with some obese patients or with, you know, different uh, problems? Sure, sure, sure. Now, that's an excellent talk uh, from Pani. Um, uh, just to add a couple of points is uh, one is the though uh, Pani had explained very nicely the uh, centimeters that you need to stay away uh, from the midline for a disc and for a T lift. It, it will vary for the patient, especially the more obese the patient becomes, um, your points will really vary. So you have to be really aware of that. Um, that's number one. Number two is. Uh, the problem happens is the more you start doing MIS, the more you will identify that one, you go in, you're either a bit wrongly positioned um, or you will have the muscle creep that's coming in or there's some bleeding from the muscle. So uh, in these cases, um, especially in the learning curve for the younger people, what I would say is never hesitate to start over all again. Uh, never hesitate to extend your incision slightly a little bit more by another centimeter. It is not the incision that really matters. It's about the muscle dilatation that really matters. Um, and many times we've been caught out by, you know, just being in the wrong position. You're being slightly away. Your muscle plane that you've entered into is slightly wrong. Um, and the muscle is allowing, not allowing you to retract or get the tilt that you want. So start all over again from your first dilator. Don't try to just adjust and hold it because you're constantly struggling throughout your procedure to get the right angle. So take out everything. Start right from your either your K wire or your from your uh, you know from the first dilator and dilate it and position it. So unless you're satisfied with your position, you're able to see your facet joints, your lateral medial, identify. Do not proceed to the next step. Just wait till you get your and that is the whole technique that you have to learn with docking because docking is very not, not that difficult. And if your muscle creep comes, don't hesitate to remove some muscle. Um, you know, by removing in you know, a small chunk of muscle, which you have to do because it's not a plain surface, uh, you cannot proceed. So I think these are the only two points. Uh, and the difficulties I face day in and day out uh, with positioning is that, you know, and sometimes when you're doing a long procedure, sometimes I do tumors uh, where I want to see more medial first and more lateral. And the minute you move it a bit lateral, your muscle falls in. Um, so then you again have to take it out and reposition. So don't hesitate. It may take you five minutes more, but that's a very important step. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Bala, for uh, adding on to that. Uh, we will go on to our next speaker, Dr. Gururaj. Dr. Gururaj is a senior consultant and unit head for spine surgery at the Indian Spinal Injury Center as a well-recognized technician and uh, surgeon. So I would next uh, request uh, Dr. Gururaj's talk to be put up. I'm putting up the screen. Good afternoon, friends. Myself, Dr. Gurura Sangundimat. I work as senior consultant and unit head 
at Department of Spine Surgery, Indian Spinal Injury Center. Today, we are going to discuss about tubular discectomy, how to go about it. So initial few cases, you can mark your levels, you can mark the midline, you can mark where you are going to take this incision on the paramedial side. And usually it corresponds almost two centimeters from the midline or two finger breadths uh, apart from the midline. Usually I try to take this incision little medial as compared to normal uh, where it has to be taken because the spinous processes and muscles constantly tend to push your tube more lateral. So I tend to be a little medial as compared to usual. This is the head end. This is the foot end. This is medial side. This is lateral side. This is lamina. This is where the pars is. This is the facets. That is the interlaminar space. So here you start uh, widening the interlaminar space depending upon the level. Uh, as you go uh, at the top levels like L2, 3, L3, 4, you might have to cut more of the lamina and do more laminotomy. At the L5, S1 and L4, 5, you have to do a uh, less laminotomy as compared to the upper levels. So here you start uh, separating uh, the ligamentum flavum uh, from the undersurface of the lamina using curved curette and then uh, start taking down the lamina with the uh, rongers. Typically, I use 30 uh, m 30 um, millimeter diamond burr for doing this uh, laminotomy in this procedure. Uh, but here for the simplicity of the procedure, I'm going to use the kerosene rongers. You can use 2 mm or 3 mm kerosene rongers. So you have to be careful here and you be aware that where is the pars. Inadvertently take down a lot of, uh, don't take down a lot of lamina and pars causing iatrogenic pars lysis. And then once you start widening the lamina, you start seeing more and more ligamentum flavum there. Once you do a, a superior um, widening, then you have to do a lateral widening of the interlaminar space by doing the medial facetectomy. So if you do a too little medial facetectomy, you will have to retract the nerve root too much then which can increase your neurological deficits. So be sure that to do a ideal amount of uh, uh, medial facetectomy. So how to recognize the end of the medial facetectomy there? That is by seeing the edge of the lamina when you start doing the uh, medial facetectomy there. So once you uh, do the medial facetectomy, you will start seeing this yellow ligament that is ligamentum flavum, uh, ligamentum flavum there. So a lot of people try to do a, uh, to go to the edge of the flavum and then try to dissect it from superior down. But typically I don't do too much of laminotomy. So I do a mid substance dissection using a number three or number four pen field. And at this stage, I also make sure that there are no adhesions between the ligamentum flavum and um, thecal sac or nerve root. Uh, so I try to put my curate and try to uh, make sure that there are no adhesions. Once you start taking down the ligamentum flavum or do a flavectomy, you start seeing uh, the epidural contents, uh, thecal sac, and so you sometimes you see epidural fat depending upon the size of your disc. So the epidural fat is an indication that you are inside the epidural space. So if there is a lot of epidural fat, you might have to take it out by using a bipolar cautery or a hydro dissection or using a pituitary. So you be careful that when you pull this epidural fat, don't catch nerve root or thecal sac into your pituitary. So once you do that, you start seeing clearly all the epidural structures. That's the thecal sac. The nerve root is somewhere here. And uh, so try to actually retract the nerve root and at this stage be careful that don't uh, forcefully retract the nerve root. There can be adhesions between the disc and the nerve root. So be very careful. Try to separate these adhesions using nerve hook. And once you retract the nerve roots, so you see that uh, underneath you start seeing the disc bulge there and you start seeing these epidural veins, that is an indication that you are at the right place. So here, because it's an extruded fragment, disc starts delivering out itself. But then don't be enthusiastic. As soon as you see the disc, don't try to take it out because try to take it out in one piece as much as possible. So use nerve hook to tease out the disc uh, in one fragment. And then once it is out, you can take it out with the pituitary. So here I'm going to take this fragment out, which is uh, has already popped out with the pituitary. But then here again, you have to be very careful. Don't catch the nerve root. And in initial few cases, you can ask your uh, assistant to retract the nerve root and hold it away from the uh, working field. 
So once that is done, you can see nerve root is nicely pulp, um, pulp, uh, pulsating, and then you can see that second fragment is again uh, delivering out itself, and then you take it out using the pituitary. So that's the suction retractor, which is very handy when you use do these tubular discectomies. And then you take out all other fragments slowly. And then be sure that uh, if there is uh, only an extruded fragment to, to do a um, fragmentectomy, not to actually create one more annular rent to take out uh, and enter into the disc and create an annular rent. I generally tend to do fragmentectomy, but if the annular rent is already visible, then I will uh, go inside the disc and try to uh, tease out all the loose fragments. Once your discectomy is uh, basically the end stage of your discectomy is indicated by this bleeding which is coming from, from the disc or you start suddenly having an epidural bleed there once the decompression is done of the nerve root. So try to take out all the loose fragments. If you are already entered into the disc, you can use a straight and forward uh, pituitaries and you can always do a hydro dissection using the saline uh, to flush out all the uh, free fragments. Once you are satisfied that you have done uh, uh, or taken out all the loose fragments, you have to check for the free mobility of the nerve root. So you can see that mobile nerve root is very mobile and it is pulsating very well. So that's an end of your uh, discectomy. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Guru, for that uh, lovely demonstration of uh, a tubular discectomy. Uh, is uh, Niraj there, Niraj? Niraj? Yes, sir, here. Hi, good morning, Niraj, how are you doing? Good morning, good. sir, how are you? Very well. One quick question. Uh, when, you have a, when you have an axillary prolapse, what do you sorry, do? Sorry, sorry, come when again? You, when, you have an, when you have an axillary prolapse, Okay. And how do you how do you manage this the tube? Well, I guess you know, I mean that depends at the level. If it is at four five level, I'll make sure that the superior lamina of L five is drilled off more to uh, so that I can reach into the axilla of uh, L five root. But if it is an L five S one, most of the time from the same in, for same tube tubular approach, you can very easily remove. Only thing is, you know, on those th these cases where Guru just do a, a, a pop in plavotomy, uh, I might want to remove slightly more medial aspect of the tube and you know just go on a medial aspect of the root and tease out the fragment from there itself. First, so large fragment has to be taken out from the from the axillary, axillary position and then try to check the root mobility and remove residual fragments which are there. Don't try to jump the root over the axillary fragment because sometimes you may end up having neuroprexia. Perfect. Thanks, Niraj, very much. And uh, we'll just go on to the next uh, talk by Dr. Jacob Epen Matthew, uh, consultant neurosurgeon, spine surgeon at the Astor uh, Medical Center at Cochin. He's going to talk to us on over the top decompression, a step by step technique. Over to you, Jacob. Could we have, could we have Jacob's? Uh... Hello, greetings from Kochi. My job is to present uh, the step-by-step -step technique for over-the-top top decompression in uh, lumbar stenosis. So the goal of surgery remains the same, that is complete removal of the hypertrophic ligament and platen, both medial, laterally and uh, superior inferiorly, and removing part of the hypertrophy <coughs> superior articular facet on both sides. So in this case, uh, we do a quadrant-wise decompression. There are two ipsilateral quadrants. That's quadrant one cranially, quadrant two quadrally, and then the contralaterally, uh, the superior quadrant Q3 and the inferior quadrant Q4. So the first quadrant would be uh, when you point the tube cranially ipsilaterally, there you drill the inferior uh, surface of the lamina uh, cranially, and the uh, <coughs> medial uh, side of the inferior articular facet. The second would be the quadrant two as you turn the tube orderly and uh, folds on the ipsilateral side. You would drill this part that is the superior half of the lamina and the medial half of the superior articular facet to uh, decompress the lateral recess. And these two are the opposite quadrants. Uh, this is the cranial one and here you would drill the undersurface of the lamina to go to the opposite side, 
you see the lateral aspect of the view right here, you would see the quadrant four, uh, where you would uh, <coughs> decompress the lateral recess. Now, this uh, would be the beginning of the surgery, wherein you would uh, do a two centimeter incision and uh, you use a first dilator along the uh, <coughs> medial aspect of the spinous process going all the way, uh, doing a medial lateral banding and then a craniocaudal banding. And you would use progressively larger dilators to do this and uh, you would get a good uh, <coughs> Uh, field of view if you do that then you would induce the uh, correct size port. The next uh, would be the uh, exposing the first quadrant that here you can see this is the uh, superior of uh, the, the superior lamina that's the inferior half of the superior lamina and the uh, inferior facet uh, or the uh, medial uh, facet and here you would go the, the drilling you would extend all the way cranially so that you can expose the uh, superior uh, margin of the ligamentum flavum and as you drill more laterally we have to take care uh, not to damage the facet you can uh, maybe go too laterally and uh, once you remove the last portions of the uh, bone here you would uh, then see the lateral aspect of the dura here that would complete your uh, first uh, quadrant decompression the next step would be to tilt your tube inferior uh, this is on the ipsilateral side and you would drill uh, the <clears throat> there's a lot of soft tissue here you can use a monopolar to remove this and uh, in the inset as you can see here you drill the superior half of the uh, lamina inferiorly and the medial aspect of the superior articular facet and this is a place uh, where you can see a lot of uh, compression and uh, this is a place where we should pay attention to uh, as we decompress the lateral recess and uh, there will be a lot of uh, hypertrophied uh, flagrum which you can remove here and finally you can see the <coughs> decompressed uh, lateral recess that is the traversing route you're going laterally to that and that complete uh, quadrant two decompression. Next would be to tilt the tube to the opposite side of course along with the uh, <laughs> microscope and the uh, table which is tilted. There's a lot of uh, ligamentum flavum which you can use a monopolar to remove the very large hypertrophic flavum. This would give us space enough to see the undersurface of the lamina and the uh, undersurface of the spinous process. As you go to the opposite side, our goal here is to trace the uh, lateral aspect of the dura there and uh, the next step would be to to go uh, first cordially to the last quadrant that is quadrant four also a very important quadrant because here is where the lateral recess is so you go uh, and drill the undersurface of the lamina all the way as you go to the opposite side and there you can see that use a small diamond berth to drill the ventral surface of the superior articular facet. This can be quite tight out here and you can use a straight punch or a curved punch to remove the remaining parts of the ligamentum flavum. can encounter some bleeding here so we have to be a little careful because sometimes uh, it can be a little messy. Also try to make sure that we don't create a CSF leak at this point. Uh, this is uh, can be a problem. <laughs> Right. So this, uh, we complete the quadrant vice decompression and uh, close it watertight in glass. Good uh, washout is quite useful at this point. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thanks, uh, Dr. Jacob, for that uh, very nice uh, demonstration. With the paucity of time, I think we just go on to the next lecture uh, from Dr. Satyan Mehta. Satyan is from um, Mumbai. Uh, and he is going to demonstrate to us on the percutaneous pericle slow fixation step by step technique. Morning to you, Satyan, and over to you. Can we have Satyan's uh... techniques? I'll be giving you a few pointers on that. Now, uh, this uh, percutaneous pericle screws are being used in minimally invasive surgeries a lot. We commonly use it in MIST list. We are also using it in uh, fixing uh, thoracolumbar fractures. Uh, moderately unstable uh, birth fracture, sometimes in TB cases as well. And it's uh, use is very important. You need to know how to do this. Now, what do you need before you start off uh, putting in your screws? You need to have a very good C-arm, a C-arm technician. If you have an O-arm, uh, is also great. Navigation helps as well.
well then you need a good uh, radio listed operating table ideally you need, if you if you have two cms it's uh, even better otherwise at least you need somebody who can change it from an ap to a lateral view quite easily so the difference between normal shoes and here is that you need to start up on an ap view and so you need to make sure that your ap view can be done very well while when you position these patients when you uh, start on your ap view you need to make sure supposing you're putting it on an l4 here your end plates need to be parallel to each other this would give you an idea about the proper vertebral body alignment and so you can uh, uh, accurate, plan out your uh, pedicle screw pathway now when you put you need to put a cook needle in to make your pedicle screw pathway first and you need to start at the lateral border of the pedicle what you're seeing on the ap view now uh, so you need to make an incision just about 2 cm lateral to the lateral border of the pedicle <clears throat> now this 2 uh, cm uh, could become more if the patient is obese and also it could be a little more if you are going in say in s1 or if you are you know where the or it could be less if you are going in straighter like in for a, in uh, t12 and l1 uh, region so once you have made your incision your stab incision you put your cook needle in and start at the lateral border of the pedicle you can get a good feel of the lateral border <coughs> along the lateral aspect of the facet joint and you start uh, going inside uh, angulated medially as per the level of the vertebral uh, 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 as per the vert vertebral uh, body level <coughs> and superior inferiorly as per the alignment of the body now once you have uh, progressed in you need to be in the middle of the pedicle while you are in the pedicle and you need to be at the medial end border of the pedicle if you touch the medial border you need to be well within the vertebral body at that stage so you need to keep checking on your lateral views and if you have uh, gone to the medial border of the pedicle on an ap view but you haven't crossed your pedicle on your lateral view it indicates that uh, you have gone too medially and you may perforate the medial border so this is an important step here so you need to uh, make sure that you are within the body when you reach the medial border of the pedicle and if you are if if that is the case then you are fine you will be in a safe zone once you have reached into the body you can then insert your guide wire and take your needle out uh, through the guide wire you can then dilate the pathway and then you start doing your tapping now this is probably the most important step in percutaneous pedicle screws because while you tap this guide wire can progress forward i can get stuck in the tap and you can start can start progressing forward and it can cause uh, injury of uh, your abdominal contents of uh, important structures so you need to make sure that it doesn't progress you need to keep pulling it out a little bit dislodging it and uh, check keep checking on your lateral view especially make sure that it doesn't cross the vertebral body at all once uh, you have tapped that area you need to then check the length of the screw that you want to insert and then you can start putting in your uh, pedicle screw over the Sleep. now now when you are putting this in again the most important thing is to check the guide wire try not to if you you should not be changing your uh, pathway at all because then the guide wire can get stuck again into this area and uh, try to remain in the same pathway get your pathway done perfectly and stick to that while you are putting your cook needle while you are putting your tab while you are putting your screws as well and make sure that your guide wire is not lodged in it and keep loosening it once you have gotten it to the body to a certain degree better you take it out when you put in the pedicle screws now after this is done you need to then make your stab incision for your l5 which may probably be very close to your l4 incision you so you can plan it out accordingly so that it does not your towers don't hit each other so you can go maybe a slightly bit more laterally uh, and so that you get a more lateral angulation as well and uh, of course a little bit inferiorly when you are putting that in same steps to be followed when you are putting in your uh, pedicle screw on the uh, next level so once that is done then you can put your rod in. and de depending on the type of uh, rod that is and uh, get your uh, construct done so this is quite uh, technically easy actually uh if if you have been doing open pedicle screws you have a good idea of the anatomy you can do this uh, quite easily there's no expensive instrumentation that is required and it can be done at any basic medical setting and it's been given a 97% accuracy uh, in various studies however it could be difficult to perform these if there is a high degree of deformity or in if there are complex conditions like in cervical pedicles to small pedicles sometimes there are sclerotic pedicles and it could be quite difficult also radiation uh, is uh, an important aspect and you need to uh, protect yourself from multiple shoots of the cm so percutaneous pedicle screws are quite uh, technically easy however you need to have a very good understanding about your anatomy and and your open pedicle screws and uh, although this is the present you need to go to the past you need to make sure that you go through your open and your percutaneous screws so that you can go to the future which may be robotics thank you
Thanks, Dr. Thanks, Dr. Satyan, for a very nice demonstration. I think uh, we are running really, really short of time. I think what I what I'll do is I think theater is also ready for the surgery. So I would just hold back on the talks from Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Neeraj, and uh, Subir. And uh, we've got a call from the theater that we are ready. And I think we'll go. Nandu, you're on, Marbeko. We will we will go to the theater, and then we'll come back once the case is on. We'll then come back into uh, the other three lectures after this. Apologies, three uh, speakers on this uh, little change. Uh, thank you, Karthik, for this slight accommodation. Umesh is ready. Hello, can you hear? Yeah, we, we are ready. We are hearing you. Yeah, so Umesh is ready, and I'll hand over the mic to Umesh. He's ready to start. Umesh, can yeah. you hear, please? Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? So, uh, can we just focus? So, we have already marked the incision here. Uh, so, this is the horizontal disc level, and we can just check the CM where we have passed a needle through this point in order to get access to the uh, you know direction to the disc space there over there. So, we have marked an incision approximately one centimeter lateral to the midline. So, this is the midline. This is the horizontal disc space that is there at L four five. I think we'll just uh, tell in brief the clinical details. There is a small presentation that we have prepared. I think the clinical details yeah. can be showed okay, by the time I can put the incision and start my dilatation. Yeah, I would, Umesh, with your permission, I'll just take a uh, minute to just inform Vishal and Ranjit to take over from here as the moderators for the the live surgery session. Doctor Vishal and Doctor Ranjit. Hi. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dr. Anjit. Good afternoon, Dr. Vishal. Sharing the case. Yes. A clinical uh, update on this patient that you are operating. Yes, yes. So we are just sharing the case details. It is in a presentation. So in case if you want, you can just put in your. Uh, you can focus the. Uh, yeah, over there. Can I have an artery? Is the presentation there ready? Yes, sir. Display. Yeah, we can see. It. We are seeing. Very display. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Low back pain started after episode of vigorous bending, which was insidious in onset, gradually progressive, mild in intensity. Which so it's a 50-year-old male with had right more than left leg pain, eight months. Post respect of the and uh, more on the right side, which was sharp. Okay. There's no bladder bubble and no neuro deficit. Okay. Standing and cleared on lying down. So, so can you go to the next slide? Distance of less than 500 meters and paresthesia affecting his daily activities. Sir, it's a video. On examination. Uh, can you increase the voice? Uh, we can barely hear it. We can hear from or back. Or is just me? Voice actually. Rest of the neurology being normal. On a visual analog scale, he had a score of five. So the recording is done at a very feeble right voice, sir. Six. I will left not left be able to increase. Okay. The examination was normal. T2 sagittal screening showed L4 L5 prolapsed individual disc with flame hypertrophy. Sequential sagittal cuts from no. right to left showed grade one. With the guide wire, guide wire. Four five. Axial cuts at two three and three four showed facet hypertrophy and facet fluid sign. At four five, there was a diffuse prolapse individual disc. With facet hypertrophy and flame hypertrophy, with grade three lumbar canal stenosis and lateral stenosis, causing no root compression. At L5 S1, there was a central disc with no obvious impingement of the nerve. Dynamic X-ray showed no features of instability. It was yeah. planned for MIS right L4 L5 UBF. Okay. Uh, so this is the MRI image, uh, the axial image that is of interest, uh, you know, in this particular patient. So as we can see, uh, this is a straightforward case: bilateral uh, ligamentum flammarum hypertrophy, a diffuse disc bulge, as well as moderate amount of acetal hypertrophy, together causing bilateral lateral resistenosis. The central canal seems okay. Uh, uh, we, what what point we are observing here is that we are going to a right-sided approach. The facets are favorable; they are almost near coronal orientation. But what we can observe here is a small uh, cystic collection that is probably a small synovial cyst that is where probably the facet joint is going to get opened up on the ipsilateral side while we are decompressing, and uh, so so that is the case details. I think so. As I was already mentioning, we have made a 
horizontal we have made a vertical incision just 1 cm lateral to the mid mid line can we just show that uh, x ray in order to show how we have marked so it, the needle has to be tangential to the disc space it is actually going to be it is go, should direct us to the disc space and once that is done so then we can start uh, sequential dilatation so with our first dilator the first dilator should act as a finger so it should palpate so what basically what i have done is uh, you know go along the spinous process okay that's enough you can show it back here so basically what i have done is i have gone along the spinous process gone down there separated the muscle as we go down and then we have we can palpate the lamina there and then the lower border of the lamina so just above the lower border of the lamina and the junction of the facet and the lamina is where we are going to start our initial docking and because we have already done good amount of muscle dissection with our first dilator the subsequent dilatations are easy so as we see it should actually dock on the bone with each subsequent dilator we need to do a to and fro movement as well as a circular movement so that it docks firmly on the bone and we should palpate albeit gently not with too much force with each dilator the, the outermost dilator we should palpate the uh, the lamina or that we are uh, or the bony structure that we are seeing we should also take uh, precautions in order to make sure that the skin doesn't get entangled or it doesn't get caught in between the two dilators that itself can cause some edge neck necrosis and can lead to a very bad post operative wound so we are going to operate through an 18 mm tube so this is what the five dilators is what we have done in order to achieve that 18 mm diameter so as we can see there this is showing number 5 so i am going to use a 5 mm sorry 5 cm long and 18 mm wide uh, nitrex tube a fixed tube uh, to carry out the rest of the procedure so this is a flexam assembly that is attached to the bed rail the table and then so here that is very important so we, we should avoid angulating it laterally we should avoid angulating it too medially so uh, for the initial process for part of the procedure especially for a discectomy decompression i would like to push this against the spinous process as much as possible and it is straight down fix it so if we do a more of lateral angulation you know the chances are that we will end up on the facet and that is going to cause uh, uh, you know an excessive or an unwanted facetal drilling in such cases so after pass after placing the tube we always uh, check with a cm so any any questions so far any comments from the moderators or the panelists yeah uh, dr umesh dr umesh so, yeah yeah yes sir i can hear you yeah i am ranjit yeah hi dr uh, ranjit hi yeah any any tips in uh, attaching the handrail bed rail and any tips where do you keep it your side opposite to you i always keep it opposite to me because as you can see here uh, the can we show the camera here so as we can see there this is going to be you know uh, it is going to come against you when you are operating so and it this the lower the profile it is actually here also it is slightly higher so we can actually bend this a little more down so that the profile is less uh, so actually if it is on the other side it is easier to operate your hands are free again there is a small knob here and that is not going to catch your hand when you are operating from this side so i i always prefer to keep this uh, on the other side uh, away from the operative side okay and uh, uh, you got two tightening arms in that in the railing system which one do you tighten in what order any tip there any particular order there i am sorry you got two uh, hinges in that uh, arm right yes yes which one do you tighten first any particular sequence always the lower one Mm -hmm. always the lower one so the lower one should be tightened first and then the upper one because we have to tighten it from the base 
and uh, in case if you have to make a little adjustment only the upper one can be released in case if you want to angle it a little more then ideally it is better to release both of them okay and what are your tips to prevent muscle creeping you know into the operative area so as i was mentioning you know we have to have good dilatation uh, you know at each step at after, uh, while passing each dilator mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, due to some amount of acetal hypertrophy or due to some amount of uh, uh, you know the overhang, there will always be some amount of muscle that comes in your way, okay. as you can see it here. So this is all the fatty structure that is there medial to the muscle. The muscle is more lateral over here. Mm -hmm. So some amount of wrist muscle or the soft tissue has to be cleared. So usually I do it with a monopolar as I am doing now. Okay. So and uh, when do you decide between a round cannula and a beveled cannula? You now there are two cannulas available in the system, right? When do you decide to use a beveled cannula when a round cannula? No, nowadays uh, all my uh, decompressions and discectomies are with a beveled cannula. In all all of why, them. Why have you moved over to beveled from round? No, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. So any reason why you moved over to beveled from round? Is it because of? No, it is because it conforms to the uh, the slope of the lamina in majority of the cases, especially when we are doing at L four five or or an upper lumbar level. Okay. Only in the case of a significantly hypertrophied facet is when we find some issue because the lateral edge of the tube, which is more deeper, it sits on the facet over there. and that is why your tube is slightly more higher up rather than going all the way down to the lamina but uh, the, in those cases also it is better to have a beveled lamina because i feel that we get a more medial orientation medial visualization and the amount of angulation that we have to do as we are going to show later in order to access or view the opposite side is less because the medial part of the uh, tube or the uh, the fixed tube is uh, open Okay, thank you, thank you. We'll 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 take you on the way. Yeah. Let me ask. Umesh, uh, can you orient us to the anatomy here now that you have uh, exposed the lamina there? Where? Um, yes, yes. Just a minute. So, so I am I am in the uh, I am sure Dr. Jacob would have told about the quadrants. So I am in the upper one now. So this is the superior, inferior, medial, and lateral. Can you give me a dissector? are you able to view the full circle here yes yeah so this is superior this is inferior this is medial and this is lateral we are operating from the right side and this is l4 l4 lamina so that is the medial border as you see i am going below the tube and trying to pass this cannula get the dissector there all that is the spinous process so we are flush with the spinous process that is the facet joint over there you can see the facet capsule which we have not disturbed too much that is the lower border of the lamina and that is the upper part of the interlaminar space we are not yet visualizing the upper part of the lower lamina so i think this is the first part of the decompression that we are going to do mono and once we do the first part of the decompression then we go ahead to the lower part drill okay dr umesh can i have the uh, panelist can we have dr arvind dr arvind dr arvind kulkarni your muted uh, dr arvind yeah. yeah arvind what are your tips now i how do you like uh, you choose a round cannula or a bevel cannula number 1 number 2 we heard umesh say about the facetal orientation you know the obliquity and the hypertrophy so what do you like how does it involve your decision making regarding the size of the tube and location number 1 the facetal orientation number 2 the face hypertrophy Yeah, so I have a uh, talk on this tomorrow. How to minimize soft tissue damage while you insert your tubes and do a MI surgery using tubes. So lot will be shared there. But having said that, I don't have any experience with the bevel tubes. I'm quite comfortable with these regular tubes. Uh, maybe when if I do one, maybe I can probably uh, uh, you know some <coughs> uh, pos some positive points about this bevel tube may get revealed. uh maybe there is an advantage uh, with regards to the uh, facet orientation uh so i was not actually paying attention to what umesh said what i see is i actually look for this facet orientation where 
whether it is sagittal or coronal because when if it is coronal you, you will st- uh, try you will start hunting for the f- joint line and you will not find it and you will get lost so this is something which i tell my fellows also to check sometimes it is so coronal that is it's sitting right on one on top of the other so you will not find the joint line so then these are good uh, situations to to use your osteotome because underneath there is a superior facet which is protecting it so you can use your osteotome to knock off uh, the inferior facet but when it is a sagittal facet actually there is significant mobility also when there is a sagittal facet when you use your osteotome you know it can yes, can sir. hamper the nerve root through the you know through the phlegm so that is a distinct possibility uh, so, good thing is you will identify your uh, anatomy very easily if it is a sagittal facet so i have built the lamina so the hemi lamina anatomy is done so that is the medial part of the facet i think i have drilled the facet partially also as required there so now the upper edge of our lamina anatomy as we know should extend all the way to the upper edge or the attachment of the ligamentum flavum and as you can see there the moment i resect this ligamentum flavum or the moment i retract this ligamentum flavum you can see the epidural fat and so that is the upper border of the uh, ligamentum flavum that is what i wanted to show i think we can continue with the discussion i'll keep Then. Thanks, Omesh, and uh, thank you, Arvind. Uh, very valid point. Uh, see the pre-op um, MRI, MRI carefully for the sagittal versus coronal orientation of the facet, and you use round tubes. Can I have uh, Dr. Amit Zala? Dr. Zala, what is your opinion? Like, what are your tips? Where do you start your job? You start your job at the bone first, or you go to the phlegm uh, first? Sir? What is your uh, tips are there? So, if I am doing a uh, L5 S1 or an above L5 S1. If I am doing above L5 S1, definitely the bony work is needs to be first because the, there is a overhang of the inferior lamina. Hello. So for L4 5 and above, the bony work first. Hmm. For for this discectomy, this is I am talking for discectomy. Okay. And for L5 S1, I definitely go through the ligament. and uh, i may be uh, there may not be need for if there is a wider because sometimes there is a wider interlaminar area i may not need to remove bone at all at l5 s1 for the decompression part i always do my bony work first that means i start uh, with the same side lamina uh, or laminotomy then i bur the um, under surface of the uh, spinous process even bur the opposite lamina go up to the facet joint and mm-hmm. expose the whole uh, ligament first and then do it, then do the phlebectomy so that's what i would do if i am doing the uh, over the top decompression so that's how i change according to the pathology thank you sir thank you very much again valid point start that bony work first at 4 5 at 5 as men start the ligament work first and let me have the opinion of dr rajkumar deshpande sir many times when we look at these stenotic uh, uh, on the axial sections the stenotic canals we see a lot of hypertrophy of the facets and so, uh, uh, dr ranjit uh, just a minute so uh, uh, i am using this uh, angled carison sponge so that is the lateral flange of the ligamentum flavum so more and more uh, as the time has progressed so i have limited the facet resection and actually that done most of the subarticular work using these uh, angled uh, curettes or a foraminal punch as it's called many, many call it foraminal punch Yeah. Yeah. Punch, yes. uh, yeah. So, so Umesh, before uh, uh, just one question. There was a question from the audience. Uh, what size of tube do you prefer for which procedure? You are doing a decompression. So, what is your favorite size tube? My favorite um, size tube is eighteen millimeter mm-hmm. for a decompression. For a discectomy, uh, of course, nowadays we. are doing interlaminar endoscopy as well but uh, in many cases we use a 16 mm tube for discectomies so for decompressions we still are you know uh, i think i prefer a 18 mm tube because i think frankly speaking between 2 mm we are not achieving too much of any reduction in the soft tissue damage that we cause and the amount of comfort and the visibility that we get is uh, you know and uh, we have been used to using an 18 mm tube for a decompression Would you use the same thing for a T lift, or would you prefer a different? No, no. For a T lift, I always use a twenty-two millimeter. Give me a small patty. For an extra foraminal disc, what size tube do you prefer? Eighteen millimeter. 
18 or there too. Okay. Are there any uh, precautions you take when you land uh, with your dilators for an extra foraminal disc? Well, how do you, where do you land and what precautions you take to not let your dilators? So I, I usually target the junction of the lower transverse process and the superior articular process, the lower aspect. And from there, I just angulate my tube above and uh, we are straight away there on the disc. So I don't, I don't actually go uh, as recommended from the superior to the inferior aspect. So I usually target the lower transverse process in the junction of the superior articular process because from there it is easier to migrate upwards. Most of these extra foraminal disc prolapses are, you know, uh, you know, are at the lower part and they would have, they would have uh, caused upward and lateral retraction of the exiting nerve root. So your nerve root is very far away and you are directly accessing the disc and we keep it directly monopolar. You can, you know, go in and remove the uh, superolateral aspect of the pedicle, the area there, and then you are directly onto the disc space. So, so as you can see there, now we have finished uh, the first quadrant, that is the lateral border of the dura, as you can see there. So, and then now I am angulating the tube downwards in order to visualize the upper part of the lower lamina and remove the lower attachment of the ligamentum flavum. So I've angulated the tube down there. So now I, again, there is a small amount of muzzle creep over there when we angulate the tube. So what I'll, I'm going to do is again, we are going to burn that and cauterize that small area of muzzle there small this one and then that is the fat tissue so these are the areas where uh, you know the beginners miss you know so they feel the root is free on both sides they don't go lower down so it's very important to i have noticed it is very important to angulate down and see that the root is free and going all the way into the foramen the lateral recess the lateral recess so, Arvind, how do you start the lateral cyst decompression? You start outside, inside out, or you directly drill and go to the bone? No, so I, here, I, yeah. I, I tell you the steps. I do the laminotomy on uh, ipsilateral side. I don't uh, uh, remove the flavor. I burn the undersurface of the cortex on the opposite side. Perceps. Then I see the midline cliff, and the, the amount of flavor that is visible on this side should be equal to the amount of flavor visible on that side. So I start from the flavum. I take a bite, a few bites on this side. Otherwise, you know, can't see the horizon. You can't see the plane between the flavum and the dural sac on the opposite side, unless you take a few bites of the no, no. lateral side. So then complete the lateral recess on the opposite side. There you go up and down all the way. And then tilt the tube to your side, do the upper part, then tilt it lower down and decompress the lower part. So here is actually reached the superior lamina of the inferior place yeah. and it's taking it. Yeah, so that is what I'm coagulating there. I'm trying to remove that superficial slip of the ligamentum flavum, lower part of the attachment. So if you, but you have to be very careful there. If it slips down, the, the deeper slip of the ligamentum flavum is very thin. And sometimes you can burn the, you know, dura or sometimes it can cause a uh, uh, dural tear by your cautery itself. So I am palpating the, that is the bone there, as you can see. So I am palpating, I am first palpating and then I am coagulating. So that is the lower part. So now this will make the, the, the superficial part of the, the flavum disc forceps. So I can just pull that away. So as you can see now, so that is the superficial part. And that layer comes off. Now, what is left is the deeper attachment of the ligamentum flavum to the upper part of the lower lamina. So that is the edge. Uh, can you appreciate that? Can you see that? Yeah. So what we what I'll do now is again I'll use the drill in order to drill off the upper part of the lower lamina and make that lower border of the ligamentum flavum free. And that is going to give complete access to the ipsilateral ligamentum flavum and we can easily remove that. Hmm. 
So you see now that is the lower attachment of the element drill again. Sorry, the little bit is left. Uh, I think if I drill off that bone, the ligament of flavum will become free. So that is the junction of the lower lamina and the, the superior articular process. So that is where that is where we are now. And just below that will be the traversing nerve root. So once we it we have to be careful while doing the bony work and the drilling here. Yeah. So as you can see now, detector. So Dr. Umesh, what is the drill you use? You use a match head or a spherical one? What size? Yeah, I use, use a match head, twenty-two, uh, uh, two point two mm, and it's a diamond bar. Okay. So diamond match head diamond. Yeah. Up that. See, as you can see now, the lower border is free. So again, here you have to be careful so that you don't go below the nerve root when you are catching this. So, in in case if there is any doubt, what I do sometimes is I come from above again. So that is the above the uh, ligamentum flavum that you have that you have disconnected from above, and I leave some ligamentum flavum near the midline. and then you can virtually now only the lateral attachment that is the subarticular attachment that is there in the ligamentum flavum that is there so laterally so that you can again use an upcut again we have to dissect between the ligamentum flavum and the dura using the upcut itself so we just to make sure that the dura is not inadvertently caught And say so that is that was the point that I was mentioning where the facet will open up. So as you can see there, so I think just another bite. It is the entire ligamentum flavum, ipsilateral ligamentum flavum, is going to come off. So that is the ipsilateral ligament on flavum. So again, a little bit of the subarticular portion is left on the lower part. The upper part we have already removed using the angled carison dissector. So now that is the lateral border of the nerve of the nerve root, as you can see there. Now it is very important, I feel, to is to remove this subarticular portion of the ligament on flavum that is there. because again that is going to cause compression on the nerve root as the patient stands up you know as the disc bulges a little more or when there is a slight buckling of the ligamentum flavum so again angled up cut so i use an angled up cut in order to limit again the bone resection and so again it's important that sometimes this angle dissect retry the the foramen or the angle the uh, upcuts can cause compression on the nerve root if we go directly down so always we come from a lateral or a, where the area is free and then we move it down so that the nerve root is retracted as we are coming down and then we are not causing any undue compression on the nerve root due to direct pressure from this foramenal punch yeah be sector so that is the disc over there and that is the nerve root now it looks relatively free so that is again one small portion of the that is the lower part of the ligamentum so again that small portion i would like to remove give me a smaller section up cut angled <laughs> so 
so sometimes this uh, as you can see it is slightly blind and sometimes we can catch a vein and you know that also causes some amount of bleeding from the lateral recess over the dissector please dissector how do you control that bleeding considering that you don't have vision for that area so we have a concord shaped bipolar and uh, so that is slightly an ang- with an it comes with an angle tip uh, so we can you know use that to uh, you know put it angled there and coagulate while protecting the nerve root and the dura over here uh of course if it is necessary uh, we can do that otherwise we can just pack it with a small surgical gel foam patty go to the other side and then come back and see by that time most of the times the uh, uh the bleeding would have stopped bipolar kami madi So I'd like to, just like to coagulate that medial facetal capsule. We would have opened it on. So this uh, I always try to do that because you know we would have opened the facet capsule over there. And what uh, advantage does this give? No, I, I I am not really sure. I I don't have any any evidence to say that it benefits or doesn't benefit. so but i always assume that because the facetal fibers the facet uh, can be a very prominent source of pain just by coagulating the torn fibers the the facetal of the capsule probably we are giving some amount of uh, but doesn't the nerve supply come from the other side the other side yes yes but also here we are just coagulating that open area that's all and also if any synovium can leak out i think that also can get prevented so yeah, i think is just purely theoretical i am not sure how much it benefits on so most of these cases even if there is a prominent disc bulge as we can see here i usually tend not to do a discectomy unless there is an acute component so as we know this patient doesn't have an acute component because we have done post operative imaging for some of these cases and you know even though you have done a discectomy it hardly looks the same means it it hardly looks like you have removed any amount of disc so what we can instead do is just coagulate the annulus a little bit around the nerve root not not anywhere else so that it becomes a little taut and you know that would complete the ipsilateral decompression uh, This I like to take that to the panelists. Arvin, do you uh, believe in doing a discectomy in a decompression case like this, or do you leave it like that? So if it if there is a uniform bulge and if there is no sequestrated, you know, uh, fragment, and if it is totally calcified annulus, and if the patient has only symptoms of stenosis, I just leave it alone. But I look for a fragment. If there is a bump which is sitting there, I remove. It. which is very very uh, not very common in stenosis uh, dr amit do you do that uh, do you prefer to do a discectomy or do you just decompress you have uh, muted yourself dr jala so uh, if clinically i will see that the patient has got a claudication or not the patient has got an sla which is positive or not and then i'll uh, if there is a claudication which is the main complaint and then paraoperatively i'll see how much the root mobility i get it and depending on that i'll uh, think whether i need wash wash so that's how i would try so i'll correlate clinically also and then uh, of course surgical find so uh, majority of the cases a discectomy is not needed as long as the decompression is adequate the entire attachment to the flavum has been released and excised uh, and the, that much extent of uh, uh, laminotomy is done i think that should be enough so this is the ipsilateral decompression that is complete so this is the lateral border of the dura that is the beginning of the nerve root so we can see the nerve root going there i can pass my dissector down it is going freely even above laterally as well as medially in the axilla so that we have decompressed enough this one i am not feeling any soft tissue there again if i when i do like this if i feel any soft tissue uh, i usually tend to remove that if there is any residual ligament flavum uh, so that completes the ipsilateral decompression so now what i am going to do 
uh, any further uh, this one uh, uh, vishal no this is good just one uh, question now you're yes. going to do the opposite side uh, you have yes. retained the midline but for do you recommend this even for the beginners to do a filavum removal before taking out the bone from the opposite side of the tilt table, table. Uh, this is how i have learned and even when i was a beginner also this is how i have done so i don't think uh, you know the your chances of dural tear increases if you preserve or remove the ipsilateral ligamentum flavum i have virtually never had a dural tear while doing the opposite side after removing the ligamentum flavum it is due to totally other different reasons either due to wrong use of an upcut or due to you know very much thin dura and uh, Uh, you know, chronically thin dura or a calcified ligamentum flavum or a or a very chronic compression. So do but, you always uh, use a diamond tip or do you use a fluted one too? No, I always use a diamond tip, and that is one Any of the advantages for not using a fluted one, considering it's more aggressive cutting. Uh, which one? A fluted drill bit. No, no. That, uh, of course, this diamond drill uh, it it cuts in the same way. and the advantage is that you know you can be much more faster you can be much more uh, confident that you will not injure the dura even if inadvertently the drill by mistake it touches the dura if it is a fluted bur there is a chance that you might have a very bad dural tear but in a diamond drill the chances of that happening of course with a diamond drill also if you are not careful you can tear the dura but the chances of that happening are pretty pretty low yeah umesh can you just uh, describe the step that you are doing now So I have just angulated the tube to the contralateral side. Now what I am going to see is the base of the spinous process over there. So this is the ipsilateral laminotomy that we have done. So that is the base of the spinous process. Now what I am going to do, you see, we have removed the ligamentum all the way till there. Now what I am going to do is drill the base of the spinous process in order to get to access to the area. between the contralateral lamina and the ligamentum flavum so as you can see the ipsilateral dura is over here so uh, uh, that is what i was mentioning that i don't feel that there is any major advantage in preserving the ligamentum flavum or not drill please vishal if i may say something vishal if i may yeah, say yeah. something I, I think uh, what the point you said that I will be much safer leaving the ligamentum flavum ipsilateral when I am drilling the bone either side. I would like to finish all my drilling, major part of the drilling, before I start on the ligamentum flavum. Now, there are times when the drill slips, and you are much more confident that you have a barrier. You are not doing anything. So definitely, I will take your point there that I, I prefer doing complete bone work. before i start the ligamentum you can still do the bone a little bit of drilling with diamond drill later on remember diamond drill generates a lot of heat lot of heat so uh, you can little bit you can do later on but most of them should be finished before we do the ligamentum flavectomy it gives yeah. you a safety net yeah that's what i do usually but to make sure is a champ with a drill i mean he's just going through it like so so this is the area that i was looking at so as you can see there i can see the ligamentum flavum contralateral ligamentum flavum and i have done the drilling there so now i am going to extend it superiorly till i reach the upper edge of the contralateral ligamentum flavum so there are two or three ways in order to in how we can do this so i'll just tell this is this is the one way and i am going to extend it lower down all the way to the base of the spinous process to the lower part of the contralateral lamina over there so as you can see there now so i have complete access to the opposite side lamina so that is what i am saying so now if you see now if we had preserved the ligamentum flavum it was here so that is why i and that is why i feel you know that 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 would have been there here so that is the dura that we have exposed and uh, we are our bone work is completely happening here which is on the other side uh, so if our angulation is uh, uh, like this we don't need huh? uh, we not we don't need to preserve the contralateral or the ipsilateral flavum that is what i feel but of course yes uh, 
you know uh, different ways to bell a cat bipolar so vishal uh, i do the same thing like uh, look i do the bony work first as i said but uh, in certain situations i do the ipsilateral mm. laminotomy first and flavum excision that is when there is a large disc herniation in a stenotic canal so if ipsilateral you know if you start uh, pushing things with the you know suction on the opposite side when you are dissecting the opposite side there will be you know the dura will get uh, you know compressed between your instruments and the disc extruded disc so in those situations i remove the flavum on ipsilateral side do the discectomy then go on the opposite side okay so now from now onwards usually i employ one of the two methods dissector so either now we know that the lamina is not contributing to the pathology so what we can do is we can just separate the ligamentum flavum all the way from the under surface of the contralateral lamina as you can see there so that itself is enough for your decompression because your lamina is not hypertrophic and then you can go all the way to the contralateral facet joint so you see there and then again the superior border over there so i have disconnected the superior border that is why the bleeding is coming there the superior attachment of the contralateral ligamentum flavum as you can see there and then go all the way to the lateral aspect where it is attached to the facetal capsule so we can this is one part one time or in case when there is a severe facetal hypertrophy or the medial overhanging superior articular process slip so usually you can actually go with the drill all the way till there so can i i'll just show an example drill so once you do that you can visualize the medial overhanging lip of the facet and then you can use a drill and then you can just bury it off here is where i feel the contralateral ligament and flavum has to be kept intact and until your bone work is complete because otherwise the dura is going to be very much in a precarious position so that is done right angle please so now i can just go with my right angle horizontally then turn it and then lift off the entire ligament and flavum over there i have disconnected it now from there as you can see there and the only part that is left now is the lower part of the contralateral side i think i'll come there in a little while up cut 3 3 clean so that is the upper free edge of the ligament of the bone so i have just removed it there give me a long to dissector first so that is the lateral flange of the contralateral side which we have separated there but we have not at resected long to so that is the contralateral lateral most part of the ligamentum flavum and that is the disc as we can see there the white structure can you see it okay dissector so that is the contralateral disc over there 
and that is the contralateral lateral border of the dura so now i am going to leave it there and then uh, attend to the last quadrant that is the contralateral lower one fix so as it, we don't have to tilt the tube too much here because it is further away and you know our vision is good so here what we have to do is we have not at separated the junction of the interspinous ligament and the the ligamentum flavum so again a little bit part drill little, little part of the base of the spinous process is remaining over there and once that is done monopolar so i'm just separating the ligamentum flavum from there and that is the contralateral the upper part of the the contralateral lamina drill again which i'm going to drill there and then i can remove the entire ligament on flavum now give me an upcut three straight so that is the midline flavum which all came out in one piece so now only the contralateral flavum is left Give me two. So the here is where you have to be careful. Sometimes uh, it is important to separate the dura properly before we take a bite. do you have any tips at this stage for the delegates here i mean this is quite often there are three types of ligament one comes on the center and two are on the sides so the, the contralateral one and the center one quite often is a cause of dural tear so as uh, umay said that little time is needed to separate that and if there is something there then you have to identify and cut it because most of the time the dural tear is from that not from you have caught something you have caught the ligament attachment Long. you have just split it up and that's where the dural tear happens because if the dural tear happens in that area then you are in a bit of a trouble if you have to repair it then all the repair will become indirect because you don't have access to do lots of things yeah most of my dural tears in an mis have happened to the opposite side inferior corner and you can't do much i mean you just put a fat and do this three. and that three. you know you can't do much i agree i agree So it's impossible to repair at that corner unless you plan to dog the tube from the other side. Other side, But, then you can. So. so that's one area. Other thing is uh, most of the time the suction tips that we use over a period of time get rough. So I prefer to use a ball tip suction tip nowadays. Uh, like Umesh, I'm hundred percent sure fifty percent of his tip will have a sharp point by now with the use of drill plus the suction. Is most of yes. No, we 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 actually uh, you know soften them once in a while. Yes. Uh, the tip is cut and you know they are like soften. They go for some maintenance. So no, a... yeah, yeah, sure. So as you can see, even in this tip, uh, so if you see this tip also, there are some slight marks already. 
they are all because of drill they are all because of drill they are all the drill marks yep i agree yeah so do you use a ball point drill that is available there is got a small thickening at the tip so that's fairly blunt and it also works as a better dura retractor is locally available i think jesco makes them right i i, I have not used for this purpose but yes good idea that is a good idea so i have a that suction which is retractable so i have a suction which acts as a dissector as well which is closed at the end and suction is on the side so in this step we i use it as a dissector as well as well as suction hmm the suction is a, a good tool to have because then you don't need anything else apart from a blunt dissector. suction the suction needs to be blunt a sharp yeah. suction can cause a lot of But issues this is mean, a retract yeah suction has to be used as a retractor so it should be appropriate suction because you don't have the place for three instruments you have place only for two hands and two two instruments it's i like the way you're taking away the adherent attachments there yes yes what you're doing so i uh, uh, i don't in no, they are they are not adherent uh, in this case it's i don't think it's they are that bad but yes it's definitely a step that we have to make it a common practice for all the cases that make sure that there are no adhesions separate the dura separate the ligamentum flavum from the dura in all cases make sure you identify the margin between the ligamentum flavum and the dura especially this area especially this area because you know uh, it is in the contralateral lower aspect there is a thick ligamentum flavum there you know sometimes your vis visibility is less sometimes your angle may not be correct the angle of approach may not be correct so especially this is one area where i take uh, extra precautions to make sure that the dural and the ligamentum separation is thoroughly done before inserting and uh, you know taking bites with my upcut Uh, the good thing i mean uh, the audience should appreciate that he is not pulling on his keratin after taking the bite he is letting go so that in case there is an incomplete cut yes. it usually happens with a uh, keratin that has aged over a period of time you, you don't get a uh, dural tear because of the pull uh, excellent excellent uh, shikant uh, uh, umesh the way you are doing it excellent so now we are seeing the shoulder now we are seeing the shoulder of the contralateral root over there so we just have to remove the ligamentum flavum from the all this area you know i am i am trying to minimize the time taken by going as lateral as possible so that we go directly to the attachments and you know rather than taking multiple bites through the thick ligamentum flavum sometimes a hook also helps there yeah yes sir i agree so even we have those right angle uh, uh so, hooks uh, yeah umesh so while you are doing this do you also tilt your table to the opposite side yes uh, i i i forgot to tell that it's already tilted mm -hmm. so once as soon as we angulated the tube the table was tilted to the other side so that you know uh dr rajkumar uh, and you know was stressing so much on physical fitness and maintaining our posture while we are operating so that you know you are not uh, operating at too much of a awkward posture when uh, doing the contralateral decompression and even in some cases of l5 s1 where uh, sometimes your angulation the neck tilt becomes too much due to the lordosis and angulation So we are almost reached the lowermost part there. Now I am on top of the nerve root. So this is one part of the ligamentum flavum that will not going to come with this upcut. So again, what I do once I remove this completely, so I use a angled upcut in order to take that out.
Has anyone studied the biomechanics of the spine after removing all the ligamentum flavum from almost 180 degree? There is a study in the spine, I think 2011 September issue, where they have done finite element analysis, but it was for a fusion to see the adjacent level stability, where they say that if you remove the posterior, a bony posterior elements, there is more instability. Right. There is lesser instability as well as lesser adjacent level stress if you have left the bony elements on. Obviously, here the ligamentum flavum is uh, pathological, so we got to take it out, but there is an element of instability that this also induces. Why I am asking you, Vishal, because why did the ligamentum flavum hypertrophy? Uh, it's, uh, it is not hypertrophy as much as I think it is the infolding because of the sagging of the disc over a period of time. So, the disc height goes down and the ligament infolds. Of course, there is degeneration, calcification, which will, as an inflammatory reaction, cause some hypertrophy. But majority of it is due to loss of some disc height. A very tall disc in a 20-year-old, by your by the time you are 40, it's gone down by 10 to 15%. By the time you're 60, you're nearly 40% uh, reduce in the reduction in the uh, water content. So that's going to cause the disc to bulge. And that's where the ligamentum flavum infolds. Of course, uh, hypertrophy of the facets and also that co pushes the ligament everywhere. So but the most important so uh, structures are the interstitial. Well, so, it's in a situation compared to, you know, wherein you excise the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments into a micro lumbar decompression, this is much more stable than that particular model. So, basically, the interspinous ligament will hold, uh, 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 will be the one that will be more sturdy than the ligamentum flavum, where flavum was just. Uh, Arvin, this is a topic for your next research with your fellows. You know, there is a, there is an article where they compared a micro lumbar uh, model with the tubular model, and uh, the right. interspinous ligament, supraspinous thing. They are the keys to you know. They are the tension band, so they constitute the tension band. I don't remember seeing any article of long term adjacent adjacent segment issue after doing a minimally invasive. Radical flabectomy. Have you seen any article? No, not me. Too long. So, this is what uh, Mesab needs to do. That I have always wondered what happens because we have removed a very, must be an important part. It is not a very unimportant part. It is there. But if you had done a very good calculated, you know, uh, decompression with minimal instability to the facet joints and left the interspinous and supraspinous intact, I don't think you're destabilizing. Exactly. No, no, you're not destabilizing. You're not destabilizing as such. You are just doing a minor biomechanical uh, stress. Uh, so, I think we have completed the decompression on the other side. So, I am able to palpate the pedicle over there and that is the upper border of the pedicle and that is the foraminal area that is starting. So, that is the contralateral nerve root so which we can see there. So, it is completely free and lax. Good job. Very good job. So, now as we can see there, now we are not able to see the complete area of decompression and that is what we need to stress while doing the uh, minimally invasive decompressions because we will not be able to visualize the area that we have to decompress all at one go like we or assess the adequacy of decompression by keeping the tube in just one place. So again, I think we need to trace our steps back. So what I'm going to do now, this is confirmed. So we are happy with the decompression over there. I'm going back to the shoulder of the contralateral nerve root and the lateral recess there, fix. Give me a wash. So again, we we can be assured that there is a good adequate decompression over there. Bisetta. So that is the contralateral lateral border of the dura. That is the disc force disc over there. 
on the other side and that is the uh, that will be the exiting nav route somewhere over there we will not handle that too much and then come back press it fix it this sector so i'm not going to remove that so that is the ipsilateral nerve root which is free and then ipsilateral shoulder over there the lateral recess upper part of the lateral recess over there so that is also free so i think that completes our complete decompression so any any further or uh you know the senior panel anybody feels that anything more needs to be done can i pay my respect to you mesh sir sir sorry sir i couldn't can i pay my respect to you sir i am the honored person here mm-hmm. wash so i think there is a reason being Uh, lens is 18 mm tube you know so whenever you pass this tube adopt this tube and see in the image the upper part of the tube and the lower part of the tube they they are from one pedicle to the other that is the extent to decompress across the disc so okay in a part pedicle, lower part of superior pedicle to the upper i mean to the lower part of the lower pedicle mm. uh so i always put the prime sin alone at the end of the procedure why <laughs> there is no evidence so again uh, it is something that we have followed from a very very long time i think it's old habit i uh, just uh, we believe that it probably it reduces like some that. amount of local inflammation due to the surgery so that is the muscle track that we have created i think uh, Okay. So there is evidence there are two fibers, C fibers and alpha A alpha fibers. If I remember my basics right, so through which the pain is modulated. So this blocks the C fibers, I believe. And I'll tell you why. So some patients tend to re- get relief after some time. They may not get relief the same day, and it is difficult to send these patients home the next day, sometimes. And this assists there. transfer yeah start ha oh, ha oh, start start okay uh, thank you uh, uh, dear panelists thank you everyone you put a drain yeah i always leave a drain sir why so because uh, this is a closed space and uh, you know even that 5 10 ml of blood that collects can be a potential irritant the no, incidence been, no there have been uh, studies saying that that it does not cause a problem sir i i don't use the drain uh, but uh, as see i mean mesh must be doing that as i withdraw the tube at each and every centimeter uh, you can see a few bleeders in the muscle you can just yeah, uh, so we have also done that we have we usually do that especially yeah you could run up sir but uh, uh, what we feel is despite that there is some amount of post operative bleeding from the muscle loose uh, due to the separated muscle fibers which we can't see and that uh, because it's a close space even it, it doesn't cause any issues but uh, i think we will remove the drain tomorrow morning usually always we see that there is around 5 to 10 ml of blood that is collected and uh, you know just to, it is just to minimize the side effects of this what i have been told by the people who have done see if you don't close the fascia very tight yes. then the pain will be less so the fascia should be just opposed so much of fascia pain right? comes not from the bleeding pain comes when we very tightly try to close the fascial breach i don't so if, if the patient is thin and if you don't close the fascia tight they come with this bump in the back have you seen that no uh, excuse me Uh, can we shift the visuals to uh, OT8? Uh, Rajkumar sir is uh, s- starting there. Request the moderator of uh, this particular case to 
take over from here. Hey, thanks, Sumit. Thank that was an excellent uh, demo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vishal. Sumit, very well. Very well done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, Mike is on. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, everybody. I'm going to start a TLF. I think uh, there is a presentation by Dr. Akshay Hari. Has it been done? Doctor. Rajkumar, you can smile once in a while. It's all right. I know. Yeah. So, Alok, after this excellent work by Umesh, I think you cannot match that work. I know. So, my story, yeah. my yeah, yeah, my yeah. Uh, humble Confidence excuse. Must Confidence must be at the ankle. So he 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 done the he done the surgery so well that even this patient will be cured. <laughs> <laughs> So my assistant for the day is Dr. Akshay Hari. Akshay is a guy who is in Australia, works with Umesh. They make a great combination, and in Bangalore, they are a formidable team. He's Akshay, a old man. Akshay, Akshay, he's an old man. Don't worry about him. <laughs> okay, he has gone uh, to the birds and the. Cars and all those things. Yeah, uh, I know birds, cars, and all. Satish, can you play the case history video which uh, Akshay had sent, please? Have you started Akshay's presentation? Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the live surgery. Uh, we are going to do a really invasive uh, Wonderful. Uh, transparamnal lumbar interbody fusion. So just a brief uh, presentation about the patient details. Uh, this is a 64-year-old male. He's been having low back pain since many years and he also developed bilateral lower limb radicular pain along the L5 dermatome, right side more than the left side, which was worse since the past five months. The vascular back pain was eight and the vascular leg pain was nine out of 10. He also had significant difficulty in walking with the claudication distance, neurogenic claudication of less than 100 meters. He also had numbness and tingling in his uh, uh, gluteal region as well as the postural lateral aspect of the thigh and calf. Uh, past medical history was unremarkable and uh, he did not have any improvement even after conservative management for about two months along with physiotherapy, etc. Uh, his neurological examination was normal and uh, his pulses, uh, distal pulses were also normal. This is the imaging, uh, the MRI, uh, sagittal images, T2 weighted, showing a significant uh, lumbar canal stenosis uh, at the L4, L5 levels and also a grade 1 listhesis. Uh, these are the axial images showing the same, the severe uh, 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 lumbar canal stenosis because of facetal hypertrophy as well as ligamentum flavum hypertrophy as well as uh, prolapsed uh, intervertebral disc, which is uh, compressing more on the right side than on the left side. This, these are the preoperative x-rays. Uh, on the right side, we can see the flexion extension views uh, showing a grade 1 listhesis uh, at uh, L4, L5. Um, and uh, on, the, on the left side, we are seeing a standing full-length spine uh, x-ray showing, uh, uh, and, and these are the radiological parameters with an SVA of 8 centimeters. Um, the PT was 17 degrees, PI was 51 degrees, lumbar lordosis of 43 degrees, sacral slope 34 degrees, and coronal compangular of 17 degrees, showing that there was a, a, some amount of sagittal imbalance as well. And now we're proceeding on to the live surgery. So, am I live? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So, Akshay gave a great uh, review of uh, the patient's problem. Here, the patient is position prone and the perk pin has been put. Can you give me the navigation? And uh, everything has been marked, all high tech, guys. The midline. Okay, there's no problem with the midline. You can see that. You can see the midline being nicely marked. There's no problem. Okay, and uh, the 
and the wires have been put to the two pedicles on the opposite side you can see it here skin incision has been uh, not yet done on the t lips i mean on the side where the facetectomy will be planned midline incision is marked now he has marked this after using the navigation but anyway it's about 4 cm in a slightly thin individual i'll be comfortable with 3 and 1/2 cm 4 cm is good give me an artery forceps and i can take out this piece of uh, tissue i'll take out this uh, sticky sometimes the sticky comes in the way of your insertion of there you go so give me a knife please local is given not yet given local is already given and yep you can discard this so i'm going to make an incision about 22 mm can you give me a scale please so you can see that this will be possibly 22 22 mm can it be seen can you see it You can see this? Yes. Yeah, this is 22 millimeters. That is the size of the uh, incision that we normally use. Subcutaneous is cut. Then what I do is for the lumbar fascia, I make a stab like that. Give me the first tube. Oh, you want the navigation of the tube? Oh, this is luxury. So you can see I'm already on the facet there. What's that? Yeah. Somebody see there? Magic wand. Okay, you can see that. There is a nice facet. So I'm on the facet. Not a problem. That's the first one. Second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Can you give me a sponge, bigger sponge? So you then dissect the muscles off. So you do it inferiorly first, medially, and then superiorly. Then I do laterally. So the whole uh, area gets separated. The facet is nicely felt. give me this again just to make sure that you are on the right track when we don't have navigation it's a good idea to the navigation is there it's quite good we can go wherever we want see that's the place we want that's the place isn't it akshay hmm that's the inferior part this is the superior part the third place I think we may be slightly superior. See? Okay. After the black, give me a knife. Second knife. Do you have some? Knife? Give me the one first knife only. Okay, that's good. Do you have the size? Huh? You have seven. So we take the appropriate quadrant. You can check it. Okay. 
This is correct. Huh? Akshay? This is lateral, isn't it? Yeah, doesn't matter. It'll be fine. So they're going to come like this, isn't it? This is good. There you go. Get me. Excellent. Thank you, brother. Okay. That in that first. So somebody was asking a question to Umesh. We just tighten the one on the table first, then the one which is near to the patient, so it remains firm. So what happens is if you don't have navigation, at this stage we take the X-ray and then confirm the level. It's very important to confirm the level before you take away the tubes because that's the best way to identify. So we are reasonable here. No, loosen this, loosen this. Yeah, tighten it now. We are good. I think we are good. Hold this. Okay, hold this. Then they widen it. Can you give me the widener, please? And uh, give me the first uh, dilator with the navigation. Okay, that should be good. Now let's see where I am. I think this is pretty good uh, to see that, right? We are on the right level. Can I have the medial lateral, please? Yeah, narrow, please. So, what we did was put the quadrant in, make sure the level is good, then take out the inner dilators, then you widen the distal wings like this, and it is held by spring-loaded uh, flaps here. This is the narrow bladed medial lateral. Can I have suction, please? Suction. Can you give me the navigation again? Are we good? We are good with this, right? It will take a couple of attempts to just dilate the muzzle some more. Suction, please. I think we are on the right track. Okay, give me that navigation again. Just ensuring we are doing right. Correct. This is a little long. Do you have a seven? Let's see. I think the nine is jutting up a bit. We'll put a seven and see.
there we go let's see i like to have a complete low profile sometimes it falls between 7 and 9 and that can be a little problem but let me see can i a monopolar for a moment how much is it How much? When it is good. It is good. Yeah. Section three. Can you give me the navigation again? Better to check where you are before you do anything. So that will be the lower end of where we are going to make the cut, perhaps. But I'm not seeing the facet still. and this will be the upper level right okay there we go can you give me one upper please oh, i can do this under microscope others can see okay can you take out the light and i can see the microscope i'm sure everybody is used to microscope for those people who are not used to the microscope i would suggest uh, getting some additional training so what happens is this handle will have focus and zoom buttons so you adjust the focus and zoom this will be the one to adjust the aperture of the light it can make it large or small i like it to be less so then assistant the nurse or all those people will have less headaches the brightness of the light sometimes oh, is this sterile oh this i have touched sterile okay that's pretty good how much is light can you come little closer light okay enough enough Are you good? Section three. This is the facet. One of our place. So, and the nine comes. This is the seven. The seven is correct low profile, but the nine is too big. Just release a bit and see if I can put the nine again. Give me a nine. the facet now right oh let me see well, i'm going to zoom this area a bit okay on a pole that is the facet give me the navigation so people can see the 
That's it. So you can touch this here. We are right over the facet, right? We are, we are correct. So that will be the upper part of the this part will correspond to the lower part of the disc or the superior surface or upper part of the body almost. Please take this. Give me a monopolar. This is the superior articular facet, looks like. Take this place. In the strip. I think can you give me the nine? Maybe a good idea to use nine now. Once a little bit of release has been done. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. Suction to me. Again, the narrow, no? Yeah. Hmm. That's good. No great advantage. Huh? Suction. So placing the middle lateral is a very important portion of the disc removal in the end because not good. Give me the seven again. Because that gives us the ability to keep the muscles from prolapsing. So many times you try the seven or a nine, and then you'll get an idea of where we are. Thank you. Yeah. Give me a monopolar piece. I'll take a bit of muzzle. Unfortunately, that's all I can do.
I want to see the horse. Take this, please. Raise the table a bit. Raise the table a bit. Some more, some more, some more, some more. Enough. Thank you. Pretty good. Mama Parker. Yeah. You can do the talks, huh? Yeah, finish the three talks. By the time I'll expose the table. No problem. of the session. Uh, uh, so that while Dr. Rajkumar sir is I'm trying to identify the force. Give me that navigation. Yeah, I want to see how far it is. That's too medial. This is good. Huh? Best sector for While uh, dissecting the, uh, you know, uh, the for the relief and, uh, you know, doing the bony work, I think we have uh, two, three lectures that are pending from the previous uh, session. Uh, you know, we can, we have the permission of Dr. Rajkumar and as well as the senior panel, we can actually in the meantime finish those three lectures and come back by the time uh, Sir is uh, on the bone and, uh, you know, doing the bone work. Uh, so, I think what you can do is you can chop off the last a bit. Hello, mate. Give me a drill. Uh, can you please uh, we go ahead. In charge of the, the drill? Yes, we have Absolutely. Left three yeah, yeah. Yes. We will, we'll go ahead directly then. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thanks very much, sir. Let's moving, right? So, good afternoon. Hope everybody has had... Uh, Dr. Karthik and uh, Dr. Karthik and team, give us a minute of time for the transition. The live demo, live search yeah. will stop now. Then we can start our uh, presentation. Sure, sure. sure, sure. Give Absolutely. us a minute. Sure. Give me a small chisel. That's pretty good, yeah. Mallet. Dr. 
Dr. Karthik sir, can I start? Please do. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, good afternoon back again to the uh, lectures. Hope you all had uh, a wonderful session watching some live uh, surgeries. We we'll go ahead with uh, Rakesh's uh, talk on MISTLF. Good afternoon, everyone. MISTLF step-by-step technique. Success of spine surgery is decided more in a consulting room rather than operating room. So very important to have detailed clinical evaluation as well as a detailed study of images. MRI and dynamic X-rays are very important. In a selected cases, CT and DEXA scan also plays a role. So preoperative evaluation and identify what grade of listhesis it is, what type of listhesis it is, how much mobile on dynamic use, and what levels you are planning to fix. Look at the pedicle, look at the size, look at direction, try to assess bone quality. Look at the disc height at index level and adjust the segment disc. That will give you an idea roughly what size of age it will be. Identify what whether it would need decompression or not, and if it is yes, then whether it's ipsilateral or bilateral, and look at a sagittal balance. Even though you are acting lo locally, you have to think globally. So this is a case of L4 L5 lytic dysthesis, which is a good case for beginner as you don't need a decompression here. And this is a case of lumbar canal stenosis with a degenerative dysthesis, very tight stenosis. You have to decompress associated with TDP. So. Going for procedure under general anesthesia, patient is laying prone. You have to make sure that all the pressure points are padded. Mark midline, we have marked 2.5 centimeter lateral to midline as well, which is roughly your entry point. And then CM is brought in in APU. Make sure that your pedicles are seen properly and a spinous process is in the midline with step knife incision are marked and the jump shade in are placed in. And entry point for pedicle is 2 o'clock or 10 o'clock and with hammer. It's placed in, then lateral use taken, make sure that uh, you across the posterior vertebral body and the K-wire is placed the same way in L5 vertebral body, medical screw entry, four of the K-wires are placed. Once you're all four K-wires are placed, go and control lateral side, serial dilators, cap and screw. Once all four L5 screws are placed, place your rod, then distract. Come on ipsilateral side, mark entry with your smallest dilator, Dock on the inferior aspect of superior lamina at the lamina passive junction over which serial dilators are placed. We are using 18 millimeter tube here. In an early learning curve, one can use a larger diameter tube or expandable retractors like X tube or quad. And once your tube is in, get microscope in, ipsilateral laminotomy is done, and the ligamentum phloem is kept as it is, and you go on contralateral side, drill underneath the spinous process and control lamina. Separate the ligamentum phloem from the dura and contralateral lateral recess decompression and the contralateral foraminotomy is done. And then tube is tilted on the ipsilateral side, ipsilateral ligamentum phloem is removed, then ipsilateral facetectomy is done. Complete facetectomy is important. Either you can take out it with a punches or you can use chisel and hammer as well. So once facetectomy is done, foraminotomy is done. The focus should be on disc excision. So annulus is incised, discectomy is done. Here we do aggressive discectomy. Once your discectomy is adequate, discectomy is done. Get your pedal distractor in and then you start with a smaller pedal distractor. Like this is a pedal distractor, 8 millimeter, 10 and 12. And then get your curates in, superior end plate, inferior end plates are prepared, which is a very, very vital step. So once your end plates are prepared, you get a bone graft. Bone graft is filled in this funnel and that hammered it. Once it is in, you impact with a impactor and then bone graft with cage is placed in. At this stage, again, CM is brought in. Ensure that you get proper position of cage. And once your cage is inserted, compression is done on control little side, insulator rod, and this is a final picture. And this is how you close it. So, steps, K-wire insertion in all four pedicles, contralateral screw and rod, distraction, ipsilator dilator and decompression, ipsilator facetectomy, discectomy, and preparation, bone graft cage, and opposite side compression, ipsilator screws and rod, and closure. Points to ponder. So, pedicle screw, 
here it's an image guided based technique you don't get a tactile feel so you have to follow principles as seen on cm complete facetectomy is important to minimize no rotor action adequate and optimal ample preparation is essential you have to use ample bone graft as ultimate success will be based on fusion optimal sized proper cage, cage placement is important thank you Thank you, thank you, Rakesh, for that lovely uh, demonstration and uh, thing. We we'll just have one question: Is uh, Nikhil uh, Nikhil around? Nikhil or Nikhil, Nikhil Arbati is he around? Nikhil is not there. Okay, Neeraj. Okay, I can see only Arvind. So maybe we'll ask Arvind then. Is that okay with you, Arvind? Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> Rakesh is a uh, Rakesh is an expert. So eighteen mem. Yeah. mm may be a bit dangerous for a beginner yeah that's yeah would you uh, suggest the same for the beginner or would, would you want him to have a bigger perspective and then later on uh, zoom down to a 18 uh, mm tube what what is the thing which you would like to start off with arvind and rakesh both of you what would you so uh, if, if you are a beginner if you are a beginner you can use expandable retractor like x tube or quadrant and gradually you can go for fixed tube which is 22 mm and then i have switched to 18 mm for last 2 years mm -hmm. arvind is that the same which you also done or uh? i uh, i never use a 18 mm tube for a till if uh, it's either mostly a 22 occasionally a 20 mm uh, tube so okay. uh, you need to get in adequate uh, room to put in your cage uh, so maybe you see in a, uh, since it's a focus surgery what you can probably what rakesh must be probably doing is when he is doing the cage part his tube is right docked on the Uh, on the you know anulotomy hole to put the cage in he is not the advantage of uh, using a 18 mm tube is you don't need to retract much you put a tube where you put a wanna put a cage in yeah. and just retract a bit of root just for a safety purpose and then you can hammer 12 mm cage usually that's what i use so you are right you are bang on the disc space right away so that uh, you don't have to tilt anything and do anything across okay Now, is, is, do you also do a complete uh, if, uh, contralateral decompression, Arvind, uh, before uh, going and putting the cage in, or uh, do you put the cage in first and then? Depending upon the demand, if it is a lytic lysis, I won't even bother to see the exiting root also on the ipsilateral side. Forget the contralateral side. But if it is a stenotic canal, uh, and if there is flavum hypertrophy on the opposite side, and it is, uh, you know, if it is basically a degenerative lysis with stenosis, therein I would definitely go on the opposite side. Hi, right. thanks much. So, thanks, Arun. Thanks, um, Akesh, for uh, saying. We we'll just go on to the next speaker yeah. now. Uh, Dr. Nirmal Vasudha does not require any introduction to the MISAB group, and he's going to talk to us on um, how to minimize complication with tubular surgeries. A general overview. Good afternoon. I have slightly changed my topic from tips for to avoid complication to tips for smooth uh, tubular surgeries. I am going to give you some practical tips. Uh, we'll skip the introduction. Just you should be aware that you know there are three types of tube. One is a fixed fixed diameter tube. Other is expandable tube, and the third one is now the uh, the anterior tube wherein a pin is incorporated, and that will anchor the tube on the uh, vertebra. Uh, any surgery would have learning curve. Initially, you uh, face more complication, and as you go proficient, your complication rate goes down. So let us. take some practical tips based on my experience before you begin you should have entire array of your tubular retractors with you uh, so that you, when you get this kind of a patient this gentleman had a 100 mm deep spine so if you don't have this long tubular uh, retractor system with you you may end up having more uh, trouble managing this kind of a patient so always make sure that you have all the sizes whether you should use a fixed diameter or an expandable tube that's another challenge uh, the concept of minimal invasive surgery says that you have to spare the muscle on the skin incision so early beginners should use expandable tubes so that they are more comfortable with the vision inside but as your experience grows generally you should migrate towards a, a fixed diameter tube because they are very very easy to handle and rotate or, or a toggle around especially when you are doing over the top decompression you should have a bayoneted uh, uh, instrument so that you know you are you don't have a blind spot while you are operating very important is having a thin long handled bayoneted bar with you for your procedures study anatomy before you begin you spend some time on your console as 
as in this patient when you have a sub outpouting facet with there is very narrow spinal uh, laminar area and if you try to dock the tube from the right side and do a lateral decision this decompression you may damage the tube so in this kind of a patient where other side other area is having a wide uh, lam a spinal laminar phase try to put tube on the opposite side first do a left sided decompression till the tube and then do an over the top decompression if both the sides of the facet are like this then right side of the decompression is done from the left side of the tube and left side of the decompression is done the right, from the right side of the tube to lessen the danger to your facet and leading to an iatrogenic instability always check level before you begin your bony work because specifically in a hypolordotic spine even slight slippage of your uh, tube will change the level from 45 to 5s1 or from 5s1 to uh, 45 Uh, have a liberal fasciotomy because if you don't incise fascia, your tube will be uh, tightened by that fascia, and it will be difficult to maneuver around. Or even if your patient would wake up uh, uh, with back pain. So once you have done a fascia fasciotomy, don't use guide wire. I try to use my finger to dissect between the muscle, and then the first blunt uh, dilator goes inside. I feel all the bony bony prominences, spinal laminar junction, facet joint, and isthmus. And at the right area, my finger rests, and then over my finger, finally I will put the put the final dilator. Maybe Make sure to keep on move, moving your dilator side to side to dissect through the muscle, and every subsequent dilator try to rotate your outer tube so that you know, the muscle doesn't get entangled between the two subsequent tube, and you you have a very very good clear vision. Always keep on rotating sideways, upside down, upside down to dissect through the muscle. Very important thing to keep your microscope at an angle from your instrument's long axis because if you keep both the axes together, you will have a big blind spot. So keep your uh, uh, microscope at an angle. So if your instrument is coming from left to right keep your microscope from right uh, uh, right to left the moment you dock identify the capsule i always use a gauze piece to uh, rub off the muscle fibers from the capsule I use a cob elevator to clear the facet capsule then identify the lamina and then from there i tilt the tube and walk the space from there this is my final space uh, placement this is ligamentum flavum spinal laminar junction from where we will start the drilling always keep in mind where is the isthmus if either isthmus is visualized through the tube or you have to feel it with the pen field and if 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 it is either fractured or left very thin, your patient may have post-operative iatrogenic instability. When you are doing over-the-top decompression, decompress opposite and thoroughly. Always check the root. Uh, don't retract root too much on the ipsilateral side. Don't try to push your tube too much in the oblique. Otherwise, you know it will. a uh, uh, a fracture spinous spinous process don't leave a ble bleeding vessel on the opposite side otherwise your patient may have a hematoma on the opposite side because there is not complete plavectomy nor a complete laminotomy on the other side while doing mi still it makes sure that your tube is at uh, in parallel with the long axis of the disc of interest because if the axis of the tube is different your cage may go somewhere else than expected and may damage the end plate of either superior or inferior vertebral body this is one of the patient that we forgot to keep that axis in mind and our tube was slightly inferiorly angled and you can see the cage went right inside the alpha body we had to remove the cage uh, pack that area with the graft and and finally we put the cage from the opposite side this patient was bedridden for 3 weeks so think about it you know small mistake in your patient loses all the advantage of mi surgery specifically when you are doing over the top decompression and then inserting a cage keep in mind that your table is always tilted tilted and uh, horizontalize your table before you start inserting your cage otherwise your cage may go uh, on the opposite side more it may abrade the dura it may track put a traction on the root and may lead either to uh, a nerve damage or a dural injury back out is quite common when you have used a uh, uh, undersized cage or when you have put cage not too anterior into the disc space that uh, the cage may back out and lead to a new onset of radiculopathy late, later on always try to compare your disc with the adjacent level disc and try to put largest possible size cage, cage possible from the tube and always try to compress as much as you can so that you can achieve a better lordosis keep your cage as anterior anteriorly as possible not to let it back out and give a better lordosis as well i started my tubular journey journey by using tube in the uh, in, in an open surgery like this and from there we have migrated to all the tubular surgery in the short of time i am not going towards how to prevent complication in tubular surgeries for anterior surgery thank you so much I'm sorry to rush through you but thank you thank you niraj uh, sir uh, just a minute yeah uh so dr rajkumar just wants to show the landmarks for the bony cut sure. so we'll just take uh, two minutes of your time in between if you don't mind and Absolutely. then we will go back to the last uh, lecture again sure thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much so can we just uh, switch to the live operative view
Hello. Can we switch to the live operative view from OT eight? Umesh sir, in one minute it will be on. It's on. Give me a dice, sir. Yeah, uh, sir, Rajkumar, sir, you are online. Thank you. Okay. So I have dissected the muzzle of the bone. You can see the facet here. So for orientation purposes, this is inferior, superior, medial, lateral. This whole area was covered with muzzle. There was a hypertrophied facet joint like this. So initially, I drilled off the hypertrophied facet joint here, exposing the lamina. The trick that we have to do is the muzzle is covered here, dissect the muzzle till you reach the standard pars intraoral clavis. This is the pars intraoral clavis. Typically, the pars is almost always not involved in any disease process, very rarely, except if you have a fracture or a pars defect. Very rarely, it is affected with the disease. So that's the standard one. So this is superior. This is the lamina. This is the superior articular facet of the inferior joint. So what I can do is I can show with the navigation that we are on the lamina. This is on the lamina. I go lateral and hit the facet. See, that's the facet, very nicely seen. This is the tip of the superior articular facet, which is seen in the lateral aspect, lateral view. And up till here, I can cut the superior articular facet. So my cut will be from here. And then I'll cut it off here, like this. Give me a chisel, and I'll show what I mean by the cut. Chisel, please, and a mallet. So I'm going to make a cut like this here. That is one cut. You can see the cut. The second cut, I'm going to deepen it afterwards, but I'm just showing you the, that is another cut. And then the third cut will be like this. Like that. So all this, all this can be made with a chisel. You can use a drill. You can make a chisel. Oops, slipped. We have a slightly bigger chisel. No, oh, it's too big. So, Dr. Raja, you always use a chisel or a Always, always chisel. That way we can get the bone for, give me the narrow. So, I can almost always use chisel. Sometimes if it is too hypertrophied, very resistant, then I, I will use a drill. Very hypertrophy. So just to take your attention away, Dr. Raja, mm -hmm. uh, in, in patients where there is very severe facetal arthropathy mm -hmm. with osteophytes, do you okay. think that your tube generally remains superficially docked? instead of deep and the moment you removed the facet your tube actually starts hanging around is that is that have you experienced that uh, no see for example now i have nicely docked down to here the muzzle is thick so i don't know whether that is oh this this has broken you get me some other thing this now the superior part is moving so I can take it off. Yeah. This is good. The 
It's too big. A piece. Yeah. Sorry. And give me a drink. So if the chisel doesn't work, drill does. Give me that chisel, please. There is a needle faucet. So I want to bake the parts area. I get a lot of bone. Can you give me a do. I can zoom this area a bit so I can see better. Ready? So this is a Match, match head. I think this is twenty-two or seventeen. Twenty-two. Give me a, a hook or something. And if there are any other uh, papers, go ahead. It will take a little bit to dissect. I'll expose this. Uh, mm. Sir, can we tell us? Yeah. Okay, we'll just go ahead to the last paper that Raj. Cut. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Thanks, Raj. Prashant, can we just switch? Keep the bone. Ha, huh, sir. Can we start, sir? Yeah. Can we switch over and uh, say, yeah? Sure, sir. I'm doing it. Give me a minute. Thank you very much. Probably. Can I share my screen, sir, now? Yes, please. 
is going to be no go on to the last talk uh, session with the uh, dr zubair zawari talking to us over to you zubair hi how are you how oh, well absolutely fine sorry about the delay hi ah, it's okay things happen we have to learn and accept and move on good afternoon friends i am dr subir javeri consultant spine surgeon from amdabad uh, at the very outset let me first thank ms sab for having provided me provided me with the opportunity to uh, make a presentation to this audience um we all want to learn new techniques as uh, we progress in our career and uh, after having spent uh, some time with an mis consultant Uh, one is definitely convinced that MIS works. So the next step is to dev- is to first purchase MIS equipment and then start doing these cases on your own. So the very important topic is that case selection. That how should you proceed to make sure that you have successful outcomes? The very first case would be a posterolateral lumbar disc, either L three four or four five. which you can start with a slightly larger diameter tube maybe a 22 mm and once you get oriented to the limited vision which you may be magnifying using loops or microscope you can progress to a slightly smaller diameter tubes inferiorly migrated discs are also quite easy to tackle early on the only thing you need to remember is that the fragment tends to push the doors the nerve root dorsally and it is at risk of injury you may also do these kind of facetal synovial cysts uh, which are quite easy to handle in the early period as you progress uh, any any such case with a large central disc is uh, going to be a little bit of a challenge especially because the dura tends to be pushed dorsally towards you uh, you may need to work in the axilla at times to make sure that the uh, tension of the dura is a little bit released before you can remove the rest of the disc as you progress uh, then you gain more experience you may be able to handle double level discs such as these at the lumbar 2 lumbar l4 5 and the l5 s1 levels um, just be aware that you need to remove the entire tubular system from the l4 5 before redocking and re- at the l5 s1 level lateral canal stenosis is uh, quite easy to handle in the early period but as you progress with central canal stenosis you may require a burr to do the undercutting of the spinous processes and to make sure that the ligament of flavum on the opposite side is also adequately released combination of narrow canal with a disc prolapse with central canal stenosis is a little bit more complex to handle but it is very well doable with a burr you always need to remember to keep your implants ready because the inadvertent facetectomy is quite common and you must be prepared for that eventuality a combination of cases can present as you keep on doing your mis cases and then there would be narrow canal with stenosis with large discs all bunched up together in one case again a similar multi level case where you may require an l4 file decompression including over the top an l5 s1 lateral canal release with discectomy and an l12 uh, discectomy as well at the upper level then you can progress on to mis tlfs as you proceed further and uh, you can put instrumentation and uh, do uh, do fusion cases as well then proceed on to cervical discectomies such as these and the patients actually have an excellent outcome following a uh, Uh, MIS cervical laminoforangomy and discectomy. Uh, you can proceed on to doing olives with little bit more experience as you proceed, and in a case such as this with a light list as is at L34 managed with an olive tends to do very well. Subsequently, you can proceed with an MIS uh, multi-level TLFs as well, and you can also proceed on to doing MIS spinal deformity uh, as you progress on to the. Uh, Uh, in your career so uh, if you take a look at the algorithm for case selection uh, cases with a mild complexity should be taken up first then as you proceed central disc prolapse narrow canal lateral canal they all can be taken subsequently later on you can add central spinal stenosis as well as combination cases then proceed on to the mis tlfs olives and the cervical discectomies 
followed by the multi-level delifts and the deformity. In short, this is the degree of complexity decides how you should progress with your case. And as you get more experience, that is how you should proceed. Thank you very much. The house is now open for discussion. Thanks, Zubair, for a very uh, a lovely uh, lecture and uh, taking us through the complexities. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have any questions presently at this. And uh, we will go back to uh, Dr. Rajkumar for uh, his video session. Mm -hmm. Rish, can we go back to live surgery? Thank you, thank you, sir. Bye, Polo. Can you guys hear? On. On. First, please switch on my video camera. Can you guys hear? On. On. It's on now. Dr. Rajkumar, you are online. I'm on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll unzoom and I'll show you what I've done so far. So again, reorientation, superior, inferior, medial, lateral. And you saw me do a cut on the bone here, cut on the bone there. So all that bone has been removed. Uh, this is the disc level here. And this is the exiting nerve. You can see it here. Can you see the exiting nerve here, guys? Can the exiting nerve be seen here? This is... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Raj. So that is the exiting now. Just behind that will so I can take some more of the bone there. Otherwise, the disc is decompression is not sufficient. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take out some more bone. Can you give me a one of polar, please? Just a wee bit. Can you give me a drill? Since my interest is pedicle to pedicle, I've seen the nerve root on top. I need to take out all this. Can you give me a drill? Can you give me a chisel, please? Okay. When you're using a chisel, it should be very gentle. Don't be in a hurry to take out a lot of tissue. Bone and tissue. There's a lot of bone work that needs to be done outside. Very thick hypertrophied bone. Can I have a can I have a drill please? Yeah. Hello? Yes, please. Hello? I'm <laughs> not <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Dr. Rajkumar, sir, you have muted. You have muted. Can you please switch on the audio, please? We are not able to hear you. Someone has to inform him. We are doing it, sir. this. You can see Akshay? Clear? Is my... Hello? Is my mic? Okay, audible? Uh, no, sir, we can hear you, sir. Now, what is that? Yeah, yeah. I'm just... We can hear you, Raj. Can you hear me? Okay. No problem. So, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say you again. Hello, Frankie. I'm going to hear you. So, you can have a dissector, please. So, what I've done is, I removed the superior part of the articular facet of the, of the inferior vertebra here, till we reach the pedicle there, okay? That's the upper part of the pedicle of the inferior vertebra. You can see the narrow root going here, that means this pedicle to this pedicle is the area of interest. Medial, I removed the lamina and the medial facet joint all the way. There's nothing there. Okay. And you can see the dural tube. I'm going to zoom this area some more. Focus it better. Now you can see the nerve root, the disc space, some remnants of soft tissue here, along with the compressed veins. This is the transiting nerve root. You can see it going there. Can you give me an upcut, please? Number three. I think the anatomy is of the Cambin's triangle. Actually, you can tell the anatomy of the Cambin's triangle to people. This is the transit nerve root, the exiting nerve root, and the pedicle here. So this is the Cambin's triangle. Terror is Cambin. The man who described this actually for a transforminal surgeries, injections, bipolar, please. And now you're using it. Is it okay? They can start. Another two minutes. I'll just show the incision into the dura. I mean, into, sorry, disc on. On, Akshay? Okay, on. On. Have the faculty come? On. Have the faculty started already? Nice. Have the faculty online? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are here. Okay. So I'm trying to cut the veins and make space. So this whole tissue is removed. This is the disc. This forceps. So what we can observe, Raja, is that your tube is, is bang lateral. I mean, you are in true foraminal area with absolutely no glimpse of the dural sac, even the lateral border. No, so there, is, there is a glimpse. Can you see it there? Yeah, little bit, yeah. So yeah. that is the dural sac, the medial. The 12 o'clock position. Yeah, this whole thing. Yeah. 
So my, my question is, my question is now since you are so lateral already in the foramen, do you think that uh, uh, for a patient in whom you have to do bilateral decompression, placement of your tube little more medial would be more prudent, or from here you will be able to do all the way to the other side also? So now, right now at this point in time, the posterior and the lateral part of the dural tube is completely decompressed. Here. Right. Right. The opposite side hasn't done anything now. Right. That requires the angulation of the tube, raising right. the table some more. That's the right. we have to do. But what we'll do right now is go ahead and show, because of time constraints, I want to show incision into the disk space and right. hand over the mic to Umesh so that the international faculty or waiting can continue with their talks. Right, right, right. True that, sir. True and that. and okay. the rest is all straightforward. You just take out the disk. And then you put in a cage and you put pedicle screws. I mean, the rest is the rest is very simple. Right, right. And we already saw Dr. Umesh doing it contralateral over the top. Yeah, that's right. This is uh, now in the next stage of stages to remove the disc. And, you know, everybody removes the disc in their own way. But the trick here is to make sure that at least 65% of the disc is removed. And the way to assess it is to make sure that you take out all the disc, just not medially, but largely too. Uh, so what I do is I go first uh, like this, take out this disc, whatever comes out. And I, don't, I just don't go medially, straight away. I stop at this. And then what I do is I go laterally first. Do you have the lateral another scoop here? Do you have the scoop laterally scoop? Yep, you give me that. So what I do is I go laterally first, like that. The medial I'm not going at all, you see? Either is if I do lateral first, then the whole disc will come out easier than just going medially. It's been an observation that the lateral discs, now give me an angle up or angle down, whichever is there. Yeah. Do you have a scraper or something? So, scraper, 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 scraper. You have anything else? Uh, Rajkumar sir, if you uh, give us permission, can we move on to the please, next session please, and we'll, please, we'll, please, we'll, please, we'll keep ahead. coming back to you and, uh, you know, see the progress of the surgery. Okay. Uh, thank you for thank watching. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, so again, uh, we go move on to the next session. That is one of the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, interesting sessions where most of our uh, point faculty are going to give their lectures. And this is about we have already seen the basics of uh, tubular surgery, and we have listened to the talks given by, you know, eminent national faculty. Now we are going to the advanced applications of the tube, and the session is aptly named the versatile the inspiring and the impressive tubular retractor. So I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Arvind Kulkani, so who is going to be the moderator for this session. Can we bring up this introductory slide for the session, please, uh, Mr. Anil? Satish? Sure, sir. We are sharing it. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Arvind Kulkani, I'll hand over the mic to you so you can take over and uh, you know the session is all yours to control. So uh, the tubular retractor has uh, changed the paradigm of spine surgery. Every surgery can be done using these tubes and uh, this, is this tube has become popular all across the globe. There's no denying about that. And uh, more this and more further generation surgeons want to learn this. This And... Uh, can we blend the noise uh, sound from the OT? Is it possible? Take off my mic now. Okay. 
so we have a galaxy of uh, international faculty uh, you know sharing their knowledge uh, on the the topic of the tubular retractor its indications its evolution uh, uh, the extent in indications complications uh, etc and we have a host of uh, indian panelists who are uh, grand masters in using this tube namely dr jaiswal our ex president dr desh pandey was busy in surgery right now dr alok ranjan dr satish shudrapa another star surgeon from uh, bangalore dr vishal peshatiwar from bombay and uh, dr bala from chennai so without uh, much ado i would like to uh, invite dr franky to speak on the evolution of uh, tubular retractor the story so far Dr. Franke. Uh, Do- Dr. Franke will be joining us a little later. Uh, meanwhile, we can have his talk, and he can take the questions later on. Sure. Can I play his video, sir? Yeah. I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, we are sorry. I think we just missed you. Sorry, Dr. Franke. No, no, I'm here, but but yeah. Sure. Yeah. So okay, so you have my version from yesterday. That's fine. Right. But you all, the the sound of you were happy to, to you able to participate in the meeting. Unfortunately, I can't be there. You know, I would love to come to India again. And you know, first of all, I want to give you a little historic background on the on the topic of uh, MIS technology, the evolution, and the expanding indication of tubular techniques. Uh, so this is. If you if you look at uh, at those uh, techniques, right, it, it it did not start with tubular techniques. Actually, it was uh, Fritz Mayl, right, who did uh, those uh, fixators, external fixator of minimal invasive techniques. Later on, people like Matthews came and put in uh, like uh, internal fixators, God knows the skin, without uh, doing anything to the spine and. Uh, In a tubular manner. So, and and this was already ninety-five. Uh, After all, this came on. Then this was round right about in the late nineties uh, that the evolution of a discectomy or a discotomy or a sequestrectomy, uh, decompressive techniques with a microscope or the endoscope, uh, this evolved rather in the late nineties. Uh, and then, right, and then the. And and this then further developed on you know maybe for even the vital spine that you could do something like that you all know if you do a framinotomy like Fricom uh, did before it's usually you know related with some muscular pain and and people are not very happy uh, after but you know with the with the back with the neck pain uh, after the compression like this but if you do it and you see one of my examples here very early on you know we do it uh, we use chest tubes. Uh, uh, in order to to get there and and to do the the operation, uh, and this worked, worked rather pretty well. You know, you can do that uh, nowadays uh, with to, uh, with a lot of tubes. You know, different sizes, different angulation. You use microscope or endoscope, but you can nicely decompress the spinal canal, which is uh, here uh, shown on an 18 millimeter tube. Uh, we, we you see really on the opposite side. You know, on the lower. Uh, last one on the opposite side, a a nerve root decompression, which is which is very nicely done, and and this is something you know you you can do nowadays, and and, and in a lot of uh, centers, this is a standard technique now. So if we talk about tubular techniques, when and how, you know you can decompress virtually everything. Uh, you can really everything from cervical uh, via thoracic to lumbar spine. Uh, it's it's kind of with those dilating techniques, you can nowadays really go on and and do quite a lot of things to the spine. Uh, even you can kind of add on with the tubular techniques uh, with more with tubes which are more able to open up. You can do dorsal fixations with it. You can instrument you know up to uh, certain levels of deformity. So that's possible and and really for any. Any level of the spine, the, the, the tubular techniques really made a lot of impact on on the post-op rehabilitation. So the fusion option is is 
row the three with the tubular techniques, you can kind of do it open, old one, mini open. That's probably, especially for the lower lumbar spine, the one a lot of people do, that they combine uh, kind of a mini open muscles uh, dilating approach uh, they or combine a tubular decompression technique with a percutaneous fixation uh, there if needed, right? So, and the question really is, is this, you know, full laminectomy with a, with a PLIF procedure in this case, uh, at all necessary nowadays? That's questionable. The difference, and that's important for, for you as, as people who want to get to know and get used to those techniques, the difference is really not really the skin incision more, uh, more often, it's, it's rather that you dilate, and you see that on, on that lower picture here. On the left, you know, you have those dissection of the muscle from the spinous process, you know, with a lot of um, fluid and edema and, and, you know, kind of gap in. Uh, but if you do the dilation through the muscle on the right, like in the mass techniques, you won't have that. And that's a major difference, especially in the early post-op phase, right? You can see that that's something you really should keep in mind when you talk about those techniques. And, uh, right, the principles is very important. It's not a dissection, and so, uh, it's a dissection, soft tissue retraction. It's, the muscle is not cut. That's the point. That's the difference here with tubular techniques. It's dilation only. On the spine, there's virtually no difference because, you know, you have to do what you have to do by indication. It's not minimal surgery. It's minimal excess surgery, and that's very, very important. You have less invasive multi-level options and all that. You can do all that. But the, the major principle is not minimal surgery. It's minimal access surgery. Very important. But you have a lot of opportunities. You can do stenosis, discs, PLIF, T-LIF, cervical foraminotomy, uh, you know, kind of additional fixation. That's really, you know, the possibilities are there. And don't forget, if you do that, it's not a Vilsi approach. You know, it's only the trajectory we use because we use on the LMP, uh, LIMP approach, we use the layers in between the multifidus and the longissimus muscle and go in between those layers. Vilsi cut through the muscle. He wanted to create bleeding in order to create a fusion. So what we do is we use those layers given in order to get there. And, and, you know, we have better ability to create diffusion with biomaterials and everything. So we don't need that bleeding. We want to avoid that bleeding. So to have a better rehab afterwards. And that's what you see, right? You see here on both sides, even with instrumentation, virtually no muscle scarring, muscle edema after shortly after those operations. But you have to be careful, even lateral. You have to know where the, the nerves are, which, you know, kind of, uh, which are uh, responsible for feeding uh, the nerves for, for kind of the nerve supply for the multifidus or how the vessels are there. You know, if you, if you kind of um, cauterize all those, right, you even damage the muscle without being there. So be careful there as well. And maybe, you know, use another trajectory, another access point for your uh, screw. That's important too. But most of the time, our emperor said, I believe in the horse, the automobile is only a temporary thing. And that's what he said in 1900. And what we see now, MIS is definitely not a temporary thing. This will stay, right? And this is 2008. I, I showed, uh, demonstrated this. You know, we talked about high-grade spondy, degen scoli, if it's a future, we did low grades, you know. Now... We do a lot of things, you know, we can do a cervical spine with sophisticated uh, uh, things. We, you know, we can uh, use spinal image guidance and, and use a cycle, uh, cervical posterior uh, and, and do that. That's, that's very nice. You know, we can use that for any kind of uh, added on uh, stabilization to our tubular decompression. Uh, this is something, you know, we need. We can do the thoracic spine for fractures, you know, can do combined procedures with one positioning of the patient. There's a lot of things, you know, which are able now. We have better reduction of possibilities in MIS with, with very sophisticated uh, instrumentaria. So that's very nice. You know, we can use 
Do you do it in different indications, you know, with long level epidural abscesses? You can do a different, you know, kind of tubular uh, access uh, to, to kind of get, you know, the pus out of the uh, spine. So that's, that's very nice. And even deformity is something which we can go into the development from, you know, full open to MIS, you know, you see a very large tube, possible. Or do it uh, only percutaneous with, with smaller tubes. So that's that's possible. Potential problems, learning curve is still there, reduction, fusion rate, revision. You, we have to address that. We will do that in, in the session. That's my learning curve with the first 50 uh, T lifts. And you see, I came down from three hours then to, you know, kind of one and a bit with the MIS T lift. Very important. This is the spectrum, and especially your degen and deformity, you can address easily and nicely uh, with, with MIS uh, currently. And this is something I really appreciate, and I, I love to have uh, kind of MIS in my portfolio in order to kind of mix it up with all other um, abilities to access the spine. Uh, but, right, don't invent an indication, but you know, be aware that there are a lot of those techniques tubular around in order to help you uh, doing a good job for your patient. Thank you very much. Uh, Doctor Arvind, you need to. You're on mute. Arvind, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Thank you. It was a very enlightening talk. If anyone has a question from the panel, Doctor Frank, Doctor Doctor uh, Satish. So, uh, Doctor Frank, is there any one particular indication wherein you would not do a MI? Yeah, it's it's uh, if it's uh, yeah the, if it's uh, kind of uh, the the tu tumor surgery uh, if uh, you know if you want to really get out the tumor and you have a high risk of bleedings uh, in in kind of in a in a vertebral bowery section or something then then uh, you know it, it depends or big time deformity correction it, it's always uh, you know when, when I'm when I'm in doubt that uh, I can reach my surgical goal. Uh, in an MIS uh, version, then I do it. But what I said, uh, it's it's always possible, even if you do a deformity, you can do it the upper or the lower end MIS. So you can combine that. And that is what 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 now is, is uh, usually happening in my department, that we, we, we combine those things. Obviously, we do all this MIS with a tube, right? We, we do all uh, decompressions with a tube. Uh, and uh, in instrumentation, you know, sometimes we really combine or we do uh, we do it as a full uh, MIS procedure. That that's how we do it. Okay, so we'll catch up with you in your next talk. So because of lack of time, uh, we'll go oh, to yeah. the, we'll go to the next talk. Uh, so that is uh, by Dr. Hartel. Uh, so that is uh, you know one of the popular surgeries that uh, he's championed. That is uh, minimal minimal access uh, decompression over the top. Hello, everybody. It's my great pleasure to talk to you about lumbar over-the-top decompression using tubular retractors. I know this can be a very challenging procedure if, if you're not familiar with it. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm a neurosurgeon at Weill Cornell in New York City and at the Oxpine Hospital. I've been using this approach for a number of years, and we've published our clinical experience, we published some of the tips and tricks of how to do this operation. And I'd like to walk you through how we do this operation now these days after having treated many patients over the years. It's obviously a minimal invasive approach for decompression of the lumbar spine. You can also use it in the cervical spine now in patients with lumbar spinal stenosis. Most important is patient selection. Uh, so you got to make sure that the patient's symptoms 
MRI scan, the imaging studies all fit together that this is a really good patient for immunoinvasive lumbar decompression. Tools technology, we'll talk about it. I use a microscope. Some surgeons use loops. Uh, you can use navigation if you have it uh, available. Uh, there are a number of special instruments that we use. Uh, the techniques are very important, and that's really the most difficult thing to teach on a PowerPoint presentation, certainly. It's something that you really want to do in a cadaver lab or maybe with surgical simulation, or you want to visit somebody who does these operations. The idea is really, from a technical perspective, that you're performing a unilateral approach for a bilateral decompression. The advantage of that is that you, that you preserve spinal stability so that means that a lot of patients, you don't have to do, do a fusion where in other cases where you would do an open decompression, you may have to do a fusion. In this case, because you're preserving the stability of the spine by undercutting the spinous process and by leaving a lot of the stabilizing elements of the spine intact, you do not have to do a fusion unless there's really gross instability. So, um, and that's really the basic idea. A traditional laminectomy with a big midline incision, you remove a lot of the posterior elements. And again, there's a higher bleeding uh, risk. There's a higher risk of infection. And there's a higher risk of causing iatrogenic instability. We avoid that when we use a tubular retractor here by undercutting the spinous process. These patients in my practice, North America, typically go home the same day, maybe the next day. Uh, the infection risk is essentially zero. Bleeding is very, very minimal. And if you if you know how to do this, these patients do exceedingly well. Uh, I use tubular retractors, obviously, um, and uh, I don't like using expandable retractors. I think it's too complicated. It's not necessary. I use simple tubular retractors. And for lumbar micro for lumbar uh, lumbar stenosis decompression, I use 18 millimeter tubular retractors. We can also use 15 millimeter retractors, especially higher up in the lumbar spine where you want to avoid cutting into the pars. It's sometimes a good idea to use smaller retractors. Uh, you can also use 21 or 22 millimeter tubular retractors, of course, makes it a little bit easier, especially in the beginning of your learning curve. Uh, a number of different companies uh, have developed tubular retractors. I use this particular company here. Uh, but uh, it really depends on, on what you're familiar with, what, what you have available. Some of the tubes come with integrated light sources here, which is nice, uh, but I use a microscope, so I, I wouldn't need that. I, I came across this actually many years ago when I was a resident, and uh, at that time point, some of the pioneers who developed this used syringes that would cut off the ends of the syringe. And this is a case I saw in Mexico a few years ago where they they still use uh, syringes now. Uh, so that's obviously also an, a possibility, but just goes along showing you that people are really excited about this and, and, and use this and even with low resources. We use bayoneted instruments. It's what, what I call a five instrument surgery. You, you need a few uh, ball tip, a few kerosens, suction. Uh, I use a drill uh, that's slightly curved. Uh, so you can look around it through a small tubular retractor. I like using a match stick. You can use a diamond drill as well. And then uh, the bovi to remove the muscle. Uh, we bend it in such a way so you can look around it. And this kind of walks you step by step. We published this uh, through the procedure. There's a patient with lumbar spinal stenosis at L45. We place a tubular retractor on the right side. That's the x-ray. We identify the L4 lamina. Uh, we remove it, we find the insertion of the ligamentum flavum, we remove it. You know, this is the key when you go contralateral, you tilt the tubular retractor, you tilt the table away from the surgeon, you leave the ligamentum flavum here contralateral intact, so it protects you. Uh, we call that the over-the-top decompression, and then you can uh, get a really nice over-the-top decompression. You can uh, decompress the contralateral lateral recess, uh, it's a, really a beautiful way of preserving the stability and uh, getting a nice bilateral decompression. This is a videotape that shows you how we go contralateral. This is the bone, the ligamentum flavum on the other side. The next video shows you 
how we then drill the contralateral bone. So we're undercutting the spinous process and the contralateral lamina at this point. We protect the dura with our suction here. And then once we've done that, we remove the ligament and flavum on the contralateral side with the kerosene rongeur, uh, which we can do now because we removed the bone, so there's space there to work. And then you get a really nice you know, contralateral decompression as is shown here. Very important in these patients then when you remove the tubular retractor to get good hemostasis, uh, because some patients will develop muscle spasms that can be very sp painful afterwards. I think it's related to, to, uh, to bleeding in the muscle. So I spend a lot of time uh, achieving hemostasis once I use, once I remove the tubular retractor. And I also put topical steroids on the dura before I close up. And uh, we published our experience here in operative neurosurgery in 2017 that walks you through the whole procedure. Uh, what do you do if you get a CSF leak? How to fix that? What type of tubes to use? There are a lot of tips and tricks. Also with AO Spine, we developed a curriculum now that walks you very thoroughly, very in a very detailed manner through the technique of performing a minimal invasive tubular decompression for lumbar spinal stenosis. One thing that I tell my residents and fellows all the time is you want to be able to drill with one hand. How do you achieve that? You got to rest your drill on the rim of the tubular retractor and then use your other hand with a suction to pr protect the dura. And uh, these are just some of the drilling techniques. You can do multi-level lumbar laminectomy. Michael Meyer from Munich described this years ago. We do a slalom technique, technique so we make a an incision for each level on, on opposite sides uh, when you do a multi-level lumbar decompression. Some of the pearls are listed here. I'm not going to go through all of that. All of that. At the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, there's education. A few papers that we published. Uh, this is a great, uh, this is one of the most, op most frequent operations that I do now. People come from all over the world to have this done. It's very successful. And I would encourage you to uh, do this. Uh, I think that in the future with the endoscope, we'll be able to do this as well, probably in a very efficient and very safe manner. Thank you so much. And uh, again, it's a pleasure to be part of this course. Arvind, you are mute. Arvind, you are mute. Dr. Arvind, you are mute. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hartel. Uh, it's nice to have you over here. Uh, if anyone has a few questions to Dr. Hartle. Sure. My Thanks. pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So good morning. We woke you up. <laughs> no, I've been, uh, I'm already operating. I'm just between. <laughs> so There's always a debate, Arvind. Can I ask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Between uh, endoscopic, because he must be doing now endoscopic also, probably. So between the tube and an endoscope over the top. Yeah, you know, I've done I've done some endoscopy, but I I haven't spent enough time with it to really, to really totally adopt it. Uh, it's uh, there's a significant learning curve, and as you, as you will know, uh, you know, it it, you, it it requires quite some fifteen years. A lot of what we do now with the tubes is going to be done with the endoscope. You know, I think there's a little bit of a limitation now in terms of the equipment. I think the drills and the kerosens that they use for endoscopy are probably not ideal. Uh, but uh, I think today, uh, doing this through a tube is much faster. Uh, but again, I think in 5, 10, 15 years, I'm sure endoscopy is going to catch up. In, in my practice, I'm, I'm totally comfortable with the tube. The incision is a tiny little bit longer, maybe. And patients still go home the same day frequently if they're younger and if they want to go home. So I don't, you know, I at this point in my career, I, I don't see the need to go through the painful learning curve of, you know, doing this with the endoscope, to be honest. So, uh, Dr. Hartel, yeah. how do you manage stenosis at upper lumbar levels? Upper lumbar levels, L2, 3, L1, 2 levels. Upper lumbar levels, L2, 3, L1, 2. Yeah, it's a challenge, you know, because of, uh, you don't want to destate, you know, you have less space to work. Uh, the parse is much closer to the midline. There's a higher chance of drilling through the parse. So I try to make my incision just next to the midline. Sometimes I use a smaller tube just to not to get into the parse. 
And frankly, I use navigation. You know, I, navigation points out if you have navigation available, it's a great indication because you can you can look at the par. You can always check that you're away from the pars. Uh, and sometimes, if you if you do over the top in the upper lumbar spine, you get contralateral very very quickly. You know, and sometimes you go too far. So um, if you have navigation available, try it for for lumbar stenosis, or if you do multi levels, you know it, it it saves you at the end. It saves you time because the fluoroscopy you don't have to bring it in, you don't have to get AP shots with fluoroscopy if you're lost or something. Uh, so so those those would be my my main tri- uh, tips. Doctor Aki, just a question about multi level. Um, uh, do you use an expandable uh, tube, or do you take a couple of incisions, okay, doing two, three, three levels or above? Yeah, I don't like the expandable tubes because uh, you know the ones that I've used very a lot of fiddle factor. So I, I use I use for lumbar laminectomy. I do multiple incisions. I alternate the sides. I go right, left, right, left, and I uh, and I use eighteen millimeter tubes for that. And uh, it, and and sometimes if you have an assistant who's good, he can start working on the other side while you do on one side. You know you. Can, you can, if you have a good assistant, you can. They can get started inside, you know. So I uh, and and I don't I don't see the need for expandable retractors because the other thing is with the tubular retractors, you always change the direction. You know, if you, you want to look to the left, you go like this. So you, there's no need to expand. The more you expand, the more muscle you you injure. Doctor Satish, you had a question. No, no. Uh, as the doctor Hart has said, it is a wonderful procedure. Can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? No, no. No? No, a little bit. I can hear you a little bit. Yeah. Hartel said this is a wonderful progr- you know, procedure, especially for elderly, where many of them, we used to do the fusion technique, but they will have a stenosis and clinical finding is especially from one level. I think tubular decompression is the key for elderly people. Yeah, listen, I, I agree. I operated yesterday on a 90-year-old. He's a, he's a Holocaust survivor, a 90-year-old from, you know, it was an incredible life history. And he, he had severe lumbar stenosis. And I operated on him yesterday Yesterday morning. He went he went home the same day. You know, I, 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 was, I was surprised as well. Uh, he woke up and he, first thing he said, he's, he wanted to go home. Uh, you know, with an open laminectomy, I mean, it's hard to imagine that that would happen, you know. Or with a yeah. fusion. Perfect. All yeah. Right. So thank you, Dr. Hartel. We need to move on. Uh, so there is a surgery yes. happening uh, downstairs, and we are relaying that to Dr. Uh, uh, Rajkumar Deshpande is at a critical step. He wants to show some something. Oh, wow. Doing a minimally invasive TLIF. So we'll just go oh, wow. to the operating room. Yeah. Great. I'll try to uh, to uh, to to watch that too. That's great. Oh. Good luck. Dr. Deshpande? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. So okay, Dr. so what I've done is again, I'm just showing the step of a TLF. This is on the right side, I've done the facetectomy. You can see the dura there. This is the uh, uh, nerve or the dura which is going here, traversing the root. This will be the exiting nerve root. This is the discectomy. This is the inferior superior on the right side. So I'm going to show how much discectomy you have to do. So normally what I do is I remove the dura, I mean, sorry, disc. Can you show me the, no, the dissector, please. So how much should we remove? Remove till you see the anterior longitudinal ligament here. Can you see the anterior longitudinal ligament here, guys? Yes, yes. So from, from my side, Towards my side, all the way here, you can see the anterior lens ligament. I'm going to move the microscope all the way. You can see that. How much area I can move the microscope angulation throughout this one and a half to two centimeter of anterior lens ligament is seen. So this is how much the disc should be removed. And can you show me that uh, angulated? This is a scraper, angulated scraper, other, other, yes. So you know some of these scrapers angulated like this, you should be able to pull it across all the way 
all the way deep inside more deep superiorly and inferiorly all the way on one side on the same side on the same thing on the other side so if you do this much discrectomy probably you'll be doing about 60 to 70% of this and that's the amount of this you should do that and you can also check it with the navigation yeah so what you do is you push this stuff all the way deep inside and i can see now that i am in the anterior edge of the disc is it convincing uh, arvin yes yes we can see on the monitor and you can you know uh, guide your cage in the right position yes that's what the whole thing is once you remove a lot of disc the then it's little ll yeah then you can uh, see how much of uh, this can be removed actually if you can do a navigation for some of the instruments including the scrapers angulator scrapers and you register it then you can see to what extent of the disc you have removed if you want to be very scientific about it but i think this should be pretty good as far as the discectomy is concerned and i can hand it over to you guys because yeah, you continue wait, talking we'll come back to you later yes please thank you so much coincidentally the next talk is on the min- on minimal invasive tilif by dr sanguli oh great so we look forward to this talk so, so doc- dr lee so give us a minute we will transition now Hey, how are you? Good to see you. I'm Dr. Lee from Seoul, Korea. I just like to uh, live in a strange world right now. But so far, we are doing well in this pandemic crisis. I'm waiting for the day to come to your country. I want to see you soon again. Today, I'm going to talk about some tips for linear arterial decompression in minute till. I prefer to performing this surgery under the epidural anesthesia. The operating time is uh, less than one and a half hours. Bleeding is quite smaller, so it doesn't need a general anesthesia. And we need an electric operating table for changing position and tilting. I use also the recent frame to obtain a proper capillary position during the surgery. After insertion of the cages, deflating the frame makes the spine have a good orthotic angle. Basically, my lateral approach makes it easy to get proper disc height and good reduction of the spondylolisthesis. Usually, skin incision will be made on the location of the, the 3.5 cm from the midline, but it depends on the, the patient's body shape and obesity. The tip of the tube should be located over the, the, the set joint and it point to the, the center of the disc space. Tubular retractor can tear to laterally for the extrapyramidal decompression and to the midline for the, the spinal canal decompression. The other side is the same thing. Tubular retractor can laterally and the, the medially or approaching the, the primary area so that uh, we need to remove the facet joint. For the approaching the primary area, so the first, the inferior articular process is removed first. And then half of the superior articular process should be removed. It opens the, the primary area. It's a pedicle to pedicle exposure. For the exp- extrafemoral area to the central canal the compression is very wide and perfect in this approach and also the cage's location is very good cage's insertion from the both side and place in the center of the disc space and contact area is quite big and centrally located if the proper decompression and the good reduction is granted we can choose the unilateral approach and also that they can save operating time and bleeding with this approach in this approach usually single cage insertion is common for for this single cage insertion one of the long tail cages or the banana shaped cages is popular but when i was when i use one cage i feel lack of 
sufficient contemporary. So I prefer to use two cases for the unilateral approach. When you want a unilateral approach, sufficient decompression is needed. Entry point must be moved more medially comparing to the bilateral approach. But if the tube is located laterally, it's very hard to see that the lateral board of the opposite side of the thicker set. And we have to take flatter approaching angle. Tubular retractor must be tilted and do out of the lamina and remove the ligament and flavum over the thicker sac. Keeping going until showing opposite side nerve root. To make it easier, operating table should be tilted to the opposite side. It, it must give the additional angle. This is the, the, the degenerative spondylolisthesis case. On the right side, this is the, the post of MR. You can see the closer entry point for the unilateral unima, approach. The compression is perfect, and two cases places where, just like a bilateral approach in the middle of the disc space. This is the, the interoperative photo of the unilateral simple decompression for the stenosis. That's not a killer. The facet joint is preserved, but you can see that the both sides traversing nerve is well. This mini tilt case shows almost the same operating field, decompressing the opposite side nerve root. And this side is medially locating first K. Tube was moved to the lateral direction. After slightly retracting nerve, cage was inserted. It just nerve root protection from the cage insertion. This is the, the lateral formula side after Vasectomy and the discectomy. Operating table is moved back to the neutral position, and I made two vertically. You can see exiting nerve root. For the second case insertion, tilted table should be returned to neutral position. You can see that the exiting nerve root. After retracting nerve root, disc space preparing, and the water side second case is inserted. After that, percutaneous pedic screw were inserted. Ipsilateral side screws could be inserted through the, the same the hole for the, the, the tubular director. In opposite side, we make two more small holes for the, the screws. This is the, the final view of the, the operation. In the, on the left side, there's a longer incision is for the, the tube. We just insert the, the screws through, through the, this hole. And opposite side, in the right side, two more small skin incision is for the, the percutaneous pelvic screw insertion. Let me show you some cases. This case is degenerative spondylolisthesis, which has a central canal stenosis. Dented fecal sac was restored in a round, round shape after the decompression. This, this is the right tick spondylolisthesis. And on the right side, the posterior MR shows good reduction in the discarded restoration. It provides good alignment and neural decompression. And this is the actual view of this case. So you can see that the two cases are located on the center of the, the disc space. And also that the posterior X-ray shows good reduction of the Spondylolisthesis. Oh, thank you for your attention. I hope these surgical tips will be helpful for you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sengvili. Uh, I'm not sure if he's around. I can't I'm hear. Dr. Dr. Lee? So since there, uh, we'll jump to the next talk that is by Dr. Bhadu Kaur. He's from Australia. So the talk is on researching importance of lateral approaches. That is X lift and O lift. What are the changing trends? Can we have his talk? Can we play his talk, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your invitation for me to talk at your MRS uh, online course. Uh, it certainly would have been wonderful to have had this in person last year. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the lateral approach in uh, spinal surgery. 
Traditionally, we've utilized the post tree approach as it's certainly something that we are all well familiar with. Uh, we use that approach for all of our intradural work and thus makes it easier to gain access to the disk space. Uh, there's good visualization and still for a lot of scenarios, it's by far the better approach. The changes have occurred as we've started to utilize minimally invasive or keel type surgery with tubular discectomies, decompressions, MS, TLF, and of course with percutaneous pedicoscope fixation. The tube like concept can be utilized for the anterior corridor to get to the ALIF, but also the anterolateral and lateral corridors for the lateral transoas or exif approach and the oblique or anterior to psoas approach. The tube approach is designed to uh, be a muscle sparing approach with splitting or retraction of the muscles with no denervation uh, or stripping of the muscle from its attachment. The aim, of course, is to get interbody fusion, which is preferred over on lay fusions, and there's no clear benefit of one approach to the other. However, the approach has been modulated and modified to ensure that we can keep up with changes in technology, patients' expectations, uh, medical economics, and short hospital stay, as well as earlier return to work for most of our patient population. The tubular approach facilitates less tissue disruption, less blood loss. However, it's certainly improved over time because of instrumentation, imaging, visualization, as well as neuromonitoring. The game is exactly, the, the goals are exactly the same, to achieve interbody fusion with maximal segmental doses and improve the neural foramina by increasing the foraminal height, improve the canal by reducing the slip, offloading the pressure in the lateral recess, and utilizing ligamento taxis. The anterior to psoas approach means mobilizing the psoas posteriorly to get into that anterolateral corridor, and the transoas is going via the psoas, uh, but ex potentially exposing the lumbosacral plexus uh, to neural compression. The excellent procedure is uh, with the patient in the lateral position, we gain access to the lateral disc. Going through the psoas does mean that the patient needs to have neuromonitoring and is thus not paralyzed. Uh, working in a true lateral position uh, also allows us to get a much larger implant into the disc space. The anterior to psoas or oblique approach is an anterolateral corridor uh, and thus working primarily obliquely, which unfortunately means that we may end up with a smaller implant. However, the advantage is that the patient can be paralyzed and no neuromonitoring is utilized. The advantage of a larger implant is noted when we use an ALIF uh, approach where we can get a large uh, implant in with a good window for bone grafting, still able to achieve a fairly large graft with the extra for direct lateral, but not as large with the oblique approach. We know that these clear evidence of good indirect decompression in numerous studies with improving the foramina by between 25 to 30 percent and the canal by 30 to 33 percent. Over and above this, the risk of subsidence is increased uh, in patients with osteopenia or osteoporosis. However, a study by Malam and uh, colleagues in 2015 suggest in, suggested that uh, the greater risk was in smokers, uh, there's also evidence that smaller implants and end plate disruptions do increase subsidence rates. The larger the implant, the better the load distribution and posterior fixation decrease the risk of subsidence. In a study by Rao, reveal that up to 10% of patients may reveal subsidence at 18 months. This is similar if medium-sized implants are utilized in this study by Marchi. When uh, they looked at smaller implants of 18 millimeter, there was a much higher subsidence rate. Lang showed that if 28 millimeter cases were utilized, he did not get any subsidence in his cohort of patients. We're not able to really compare this with standalone OLIF. There's not much data available. Uh, almost all of the OLIF cases are performed with posterior fixation to achieve the higher fusion rate. The advantage of both approaches is single surgeon operation with no excess surgeon required in a lateral position, retroperitoneal dissection and radiologically driven. There's beginning to be increasing role of navigation and you can get a good implant size with very low risk to the seeker. Uh, it can suitable for certainly primary and prior posterior spinal surgery, uh, confounded if they've had previous lateral spinal, lateral surgery. 
the X lift is ideal from T12 to L5, where the O lift is from L1 to L5. It's both certainly very good for a grade one slip. Uh, the X lift certainly will work for a grade two slip, but not as well for the O lift or ATP approach. Uh, the X lift is not suitable if the crest is very high and certainly not at L5S1. As a high success rate in terms of fusion rate with the X lift type procedures can reduce grade one and two slips and improve both sagittal and coronal balance. Uh, in a study by Rogers, the risk of complications was found to be very low, uh, and he performed 600 X lift procedures. The study, the studies in the literature, however, vary in terms of the risk and complication rate with transient sensory changes between 0.7 to 30 percent and transient motor changes between 3.4 to 23 percent. The risk of abdominal wall paresis and bowel or vessel injury is very low. The success of an OLIF in terms of fusion is very good if there's pedicle screw fixation. Uh, however, standalone OLIF cages do have only an 82% success rate. The complication rate of transient deficit is fairly low and most do recover within a short period. However, they do have a slightly higher risk of sympathetic chain disruption, venous or segmental injury. Thus, the lateral tube is a safe, reliable approach where we can place a fairly large implant, certainly larger than the posterior approach, certainly corrects sagittal and correct uh, coronal balance uh, very well. Muscle sparing with less blood, less blood loss, multiple levels can be operated upon and you get better and quicker at it after your initial learning curve. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Badu Kawar, it was a great talk. Uh, if the panel has any questions uh, with regards to these lateral approaches, uh, these approaches have become very popular in the last few years with uh, increased recognition of uh, the capabilities of this anterior approach in getting your sagittal plane right, in achieving indirect decompression without going into the canal, etc. Of course, yeah. uh, you have these potential complications that can uh, you know, ruin the post-operative uh, uh, recovery. Arvind, yes. I do most of the degenerative scoliosis with this procedure now because uh, the OLIF uh, definitely makes enormous difference uh, whenever we do. Mm -hmm. It is straightforward and uh, you'll get avascular plane if you do it in the right way. And uh, with a single tube placement, you can do at least about two level without any problem. And you can recreate the lardosis followed by either percutaneous you know, screws posteriorly. I think especially in elderly people, we have noticed most of them can be made to walk on the same day after this uh, OLIF surgery. I think I'm sure, you know, the lateral approach is uh, caught up because when I started spine surgery, all the procedure we used to do with the big incision anteriorly with the tubular retractors and uh, with the navigation available, it is a wonderful procedure to do. Uh, Karthik, you have a question? Yeah, now for the, for the lateral uh, procedures, I mean, what is the true incidence of uh, paresis they're talking about? Because the literature is not really very clear when you do it. The second thing is, um, you know, the, the, sec the second thing is, uh, how, how common uh, do you find that you're able to do it in a degenerative spine with a degenerate facet, hypertrophied, and what is the uh, indirect correction you're getting? Th th thank you very much for your queries. Uh, with regards to complication, I found it very hard to sift through the literature as to what the real incidence is. So those that do it fairly regularly find that the incidence is extremely low. And certainly the incidence of transient sensory changes is anywhere up to 20%. They almost always settle within the first two to four weeks. And that's simply because of potential uh, stretching of the lateral cutaneous nerve. In terms of uh, motor deficit, the, long, the, uh, the longer your retractor is in through the psoas, the greater the risk of a transient motor deficit. So if you've got good monitoring, you dock through the psoas safely, uh, I think the risk is extremely small. And if I look at my series of patients, and I've done uh, probably over 300 of them, the, I've only had one patient that had transient weakness uh, in the initial stages of my, my doing it. So I think that 
what's important is being meticulous in terms of your positioning, your neuromonitoring to ensure that you've ducked safely if you're going through the psoas. So the anterior to psoas, the oblique approaches, I think the risk of a motor deficit is exceptionally lower because the traction injury to the lumbosacral plexus is different. So if you're getting it when you're doing an anterior to psoas or an oblique approach, then I think it's probably a technique more so than the approach that needs to be looked into. So what do you do now? Do you do x lifts or do you do o lifts now? I do both depending on what the clinical picture is. So if the psoas is suitable uh, for a, a, a OLIF or an anterior to psoas, I'll do that. At 4-5, a high-ish crest, I'll do that. Uh, at 4-5, I'm more likely to do an anterior to psoas or an OLIF. Uh, above that, if it's 3-4-2-3, three, three, uh, for some reason, 1-2, I'll do an x lift because I can get through all of those through one incision, different muscle splits. And I find that I can use it for, for I can use the X lift for more than I can use some of the O lift because I can use it for a grade two without any problems. Uh, I can get into most collapsed disc spaces. And even if the facets are hypertrophied, I can quite comfortably get into the disc space, uh, get a degree of indirect decompression. And if needs be, I can then later do, I, when I do my particle screws, is put a tube down to disrupt a facet and get a decompression if I need to. I think the advantage of the lateral for me or the lateral or anterior to psoas, it allows me a bigger, bigger implant, uh, a better correction of the lordosis, uh, better correction of the sagittal or coronal imbalance. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a young Turk from Turkey, Dr. Mehmet Zileli. So he's come as a, a, a breath of fresh air because he is saturated with degenerative condition since morning. So, he is bringing some trauma patients with him. So, uh, Dr. Zileli, all yours. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Good, Good to see you. Uh, it is really a great uh, meeting. I enjoyed it very much. Yes. So, we'll go ahead with your talk. Yeah, thank you. Can I play his video, sir? Yes. Yeah. Everybody, uh, uh, I am Mehmet Zileli from Izmir, Turkey. Uh, I will try to summarize our uh, in, uh, knowledge about the minimally invasive surgery for trauma. MIS, in, especially in thoracolumbar trauma, uh, have mainly two uh, technical options. One is the MIS posture stabilization using percutaneous fix fixation techniques. The other one is MIS anterior column support using uh, vertebral body augmentation or mini open lateral corpectomy and fixation. Uh, actually, the percutaneous uh, uh, pedicle screw fixation uh, is widely used uh, in, in degenerative diseases. It may also be applied in uh, some burst fractures uh, of the thoracoloma region. Uh, in a study from 2019 has gathered 144 patients with short fixation with or without intermediate screw group. Uh, 71 patients had non-intermediate screw group. 73 patients had intermediate screw group. Clinical outcomes and radiological par parameters have been followed up uh, for three and six years. Intermediate screw significantly improved radiological parameters, but not clinical outcomes of the patients. Uh, Percutaneous pedicle screw fixation uh, without fusion uh, can be applied in the, in the children uh, with subsequent removal of the instrumentation uh, after six to 12 months. Is a good option for pediatric spinal fractures instead of bracing, uh, especially for uh, the kids who the uh, casting uh, may not be ideal or is otherwise contraindicated. Is a good option. Uh, here you can see from uh, that study from 2016, uh, an L34 ligamentous chance uh, injury. 
uh, treated with short segment uh, fixation and they have removed it uh, one year after surgery and this uh, this last film is uh, the correction is maintained 30 months after the removal of the instrumentation but uh, the uh, transcutaneous pedicle screw fixation uh, can have also complications especially uh, misplaced screws. Uh, this is a study from 2012 with 424 uh, percutaneous placed pedicle screws. They have done a postoperative CT scans and they have found misplaced screws in 9.7% of the patients. Most of the breaches are uh, lateral cortical breaches and uh, only 0.5% of the patients had some neurological injury. Uh, if you look at the advantages, there are many advantages like less muscle trauma, less bleeding, less infection, faster wound healing, decreased pain, uh, postoperative pain, earlier mobilization of the patients, and decreased hospital stay and early return to work. These advantages, however, limitation of reduction, destruction, and lordization uh, maneuvers, less tactile control. Uh, transverse connector is hard to apply, long learning curve, and more radiation uh, to the patient uh, and to the operating team. Shorter fixations are possible, so uh, many studies uh, are with shorter fixation. If we look at the, uh, the, uh, the compressive surgery with mini open lateral corpectomy and fixation, uh, in the past, uh, it, it was used mainly by thoracoscopic or laparoscopic uh, approaches. Uh, since it is very technically challenging and time-consuming procedure, uh, many surgeons have switched to mini-open retropleural thoracotomy or mini-open retroperitoneal transpsoatic approaches. Uh, however, these approaches may need special retractors and hand tools and uh, especially in transpsoatic approach, monitoring is mandatory. This is one example with L3 uh, fracture, AOA3. Uh, the, the, surgeon, uh, the surgeons uh, from Germany, Dreiman and, and co-workers have applied uh, uh, pedicle posterior uh, MIS pedicle screw fixation and, and did at the same time a laminectomy there. And then uh, at the same session, they have done a lateral transpsoatic approach with a, with a graft and plate application uh, ventrally. Uh, this is a competitive study, uh, MIS lateral corpectomy or open lateral corpectomy in uh, 59 patients, MIS lateral corpectomy, 16 open uh, surgery. MIS patients had shorter operation times and shorter ambulations, but the outcomes, uh, the other outcome measures uh, were very similar. This is uh, one case of those series, uh, which had a unstable burst fracture with a significant compression to the uh, spinal cord, they have done a lateral MIS, lateral corpectomy, uh, plus posterior pedicle screw fixation. You can see how well is the uh, canal decompressed with the uh, lateral uh, surgery. Uh, if you look at the vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty uh, in burst fractures, uh, in the literature are full with level three case series. However, there is no good high level uh, evidence in the literature. Uh, another concern is that vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty alone may provide good painful relief, correction loss uh, by the time is, is a concern. Uh, however, if you add MIS superfixation, no correction loss in long term uh, will happen. 
Those cases can also be treated conservatively, although MIS interventions may shorten the time for mobilization and provide pain relief in the early period. Uh, in conclusion, MIS posture stabilization, percutaneous fixation techniques, and MIS anterior column support can be used in unstable fractures, burst fractures. Literature is lacking high class studies comparing those techniques with open surgery and conservative therapy. There needs a steep learning curve to apply some of these techniques. Yes, uh, there are some options, in MIS options in thoracolumbar trauma, but the value is not validated yet uh, with high class studies. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mehmet Zileli. Uh, the panel has any questions? Vishal, Alok. Sir, I just, uh, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Alvin. I just have a question from uh, Dr. Zileli. Just wanted to ask if they are comfortable with uh, this single uh, percutaneous pedicle screw, single level fixation in types uh, AO type C also. I mean, uh, just wanted to ask them, okay, are they doing it routinely? Because we have been, you know, using going two levels up and down or at least going through the intermediate uh, uh, vertebra. Just... Uh, in no, no uh, I think uh, for the other uh, fracture dislocations, especially, mm -hmm. we should... Uh, I would prefer uh, open surgery. Open surgery. This is, th th those are indicated only for... Burst fractures. Okay. Yeah. Unstable burst fractures. Do you, do, you, do you routinely do a pedicle screw fixation for osteoporotic fractures? No. So what is... Mostly not. So you said that the, the results are basically... Anatomical results are better if you do a concomitant pedicle screw fixation after vertebrokyphoplasty. What is your opinion about this? <laughs> the authors have said this. Uh, the, I, I have shown the results of some I know, papers. I know, I know. Yeah. yeah, but uh, uh, I try not to use any pedicle screwing in osteoporotic fractures. If there is significant kyphosis, if there is neurologic deficits, yes, we can. But if there is not, uh, if especially non-neurologic symptoms, I would prefer vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty only. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. So, uh, we'll move on to Dr. Salman Sharif. Uh, he had to go for another meeting. So, he left early. He was around for quite some time. So, we and Dr. Salman, uh, being the same subcontinent, we share, share this common uh, issue of in spinal infections. And uh, he would be the right person to talk on MIS applications in spinal infections. Uh, so please uh, play his talk. Um, good evening. It's my pleasure to be part of this um, interesting um, effort that Minimally Invasive Spine um, Surgery Association has taken. Um, it's wonderful to join all my friends from India and from all over the world. Um, um, I'll be talking about tubular retractor surgery for spine infections. The goal of MIS techniques is to decrease morbidity, faster functional recovery, um, reducing um, uh, collateral uh, tissue damage through less extensive approaches using preformed anatomical corridors. And the basic idea is that you stabilize the pathology, restore spine balance, preservation of neurological functions, and then uh, start the appropriate chemotherapy. The MIS techniques could be various. I'm not going to go into that. Advantages, we already know. There is a direct access to infected disc space, vertebral body. It's relatively virgin area if you've had posterior approaches before, and better for addressing spinal alignment and curvature. Discipline advantages, obviously, there's procedure-related morbidity. So what to do? So various pathologies can uh, address this by minimally invasive approach. Unfortunately, there are no large randomized controlled trials or studies to back this up. 
and there is very uh, scarce literature on this. Uh, the available studies that we have are uh, a study of 40 patients with thoracic or lumbar infection with spondylitis who underwent anterior spinal surgery. Minimal access surgery was used and they, th they thought it was effective and safe in treating thoracic and lumbar infection with less blood loss, less ICU stay, and reduced complications. Another study from 2015, um, extreme lateral antibody fusion in both units of instrumentation for spondylodiscitis. They, use, uh, they had 11 patients and they used x lift and posterior percutaneous screws. All patients normalized their inflammatory markers. There was no symptoms of infection and none required repeat surgical treatment. They suggested that it could be a safe and effective procedure alternative to ALF for spondylodiscitis. And this is uh, some scans, uh, pictures from that study. Uh, posterior approaches, advantages, it's a familiar approach, routine approach, including TLIF, uh, transpedicular curettage, which are easy to perform. Disadvantage, possibility of superinfection of implanted material. Uh, it has been shown that really doesn't do that if you have aggressive antimicrobial therapy. Another study uh, published in 2013, minimally with the treatment of multi-level spinal epidural abscesses. They did it in three cases and they showed that it was safe and effective uh, via this MIS approach. When they have spinal epidural abscess over multiple levels, the conventional surgical approach in laminectomy may require a large exposure and in, uh, increases the <laughs> mortality. And obviously, it may cause spinal instability and kyphosis. All this causes prolonged surgery, increased blood loss, and exposure of intraoperative uh, mobilization of the paraspinous muscle, uh, increased pain, delayed mobilization, longer hospital uh, stay, and recovery time. Minimally invasive microsurgery by a tubular retractor system, uh, it could be very efficacious in these patients. Entry sites are on outlined with AP and lateral fluoroscopic images, images by C arms first. And if there are multiple separate abscesses, you could have multiple um, uh, entry points and paramedian incisions. To, uh, you, may, you may use two tubes for irrigate, irrigate, evacuate, and drain. So a patient like this, this is shown that you know uh, we're using a uh, microscope uh, and the skin and fascia are then traversed, sequential dilatation, 18 millimeter diameter tube, and rostral and caudal to the spinal epidural abscess. And you can see the abscess here. And what you do is then you drain from above and below, you pass a small a uh, silastic tube and then uh, do copious irrigation to remove this epidural abscess. Uh, rapid pain relief, neurological resolution, and minimal invasive posterior paramedian approaches with tubular retractor has the possibility of uh, removing the disc, drain the abscess, and percutaneous uh, fixation can be an option as well. TLF is, could be a most common approach uh, used here. Um, 51 patients with fixation. Um, reinfection after surgery in three months of antibiotic therapy was not seen in these patients. Um, and they uh, concluded the application of um, this uh, TTN or PKGs does not appear to influence the radiological outcome or risk of reinfection in these patients. Transpedicular curatage is a routine for us in patients with spondylodiscitis. Um, um, so what they did was they, they had only 10 patients. That is the problem with the study. And they showed that because of this, it is much, much more easier for earlier embolization, embolation, uh, shorter hospitalization, and similar clinical success rate. Isolated curatage cannot be done in case of severe bone destruction, so you need to remember that, and you may require to supplement that with MIS posterior percutaneous screws. So this is the curatage system that you could use and wash, and if there is a lot of problems, you can irrigate and you can have coming out from the other, other side um, opening as well. So you could have two tubes inserted. Endoscopic techniques again, have again been shown to be very effective. Uh, the in infected disc is accessed by endoscopy percutaneously through a posterior lateral approach under a fluoroscopic guidance. Tissue sampling discectomy are then performed and irrigation and placement of a drain is connected to a pump and left in place until the drainage resolves. In dorsal spine, it is the same a thoracoscopy approach as was shown to be very effective are from group from barrows. And the same thing continues to be uh, very effective for patients who have got, for example, POTS or uh, involvement of the virtual body with infection that you can come in anteriorly and uh, take care of these.
uh, is posterior um, um, percutaneous screw rod instrumentation a safe and effective alternative approach to TLSO? And patients to be treated with percutaneous instrumentation had a faster recovery, lower pain scores, and improved quality of life. And so this is uh, the retrospective to cohort study that showed that it is effective. So a scenario like that, obviously, it's not done by two, but by many mechanisms. So in conclusion, in recent years, MI slash tubular retractor surgery uh, have been shown increasingly uh, effective for treatment of spinal degenerative disorders and infections as well. A broad variety um, of techniques have been reported for spine infections, some based on endoscopic uh, approach, other on transforaminal or interlaminar or lateral approaches. These techniques have been used, uh, shown to be effective in selected cases. Most of the studies, unfortunately, are case series and with small number of patients. MIS can be viable option, limited infects, uh, spinal infection in low degree of end plane destruction. Percutaneous instrumentation can be effectively applied in these patients with severe bone destructions, particularly with navigated techniques. I thank you all from Pakistan and bring good wishes. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Salman Sharif is uh, not around, but I want to ask uh, the panelists. So when you do multi-level uh, percutaneous screw fixations, uh, you know, most of these patients who have infections, you know, fractures, they are elderly, they are osteoporotic. The mechanism of rod and screw play, it's basically you're using a reduction uh, screw technique to, you know, put the rod on the screw head and tighten it. So there is a lot, you know, high chance of you know, these uh, screws pulling out, pulling out during surgery or later on. How do you negate it? If you're using a sextant kind of a system wherein the rod sits on the screws that is okay for a two mm -hmm. or three level mm -hmm. fixation but beyond that uh, you know you have to use a reduction screw technique mechanism to, to bang the rod on the screw head so any way out and apart from you know using cemented uh, you know augmented screws and dual threaded screws in spite of all this how will you how will you use cement in these cases because they are infective cases so you can't use cement huh. you can you can fire away, away from the infection. Yeah, 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 I will be careful. I will be careful about that uh, because then you may land up in a bigger problem. Right. I had a case like that. So from personal experience, I'm telling you that you can land with a bigger problem. So I don't think there's an ideal solution there. Anybody? We shall do long fixations. MIS. Yeah. Yeah, Arvind, can, can yeah, I come in? Yes, sir, yes. Can I come in? Yes, uh, I, I mean, you have a genuine point there. If, if you use the pre-bent rods, uh, as in section and things like that, th there is hyperlordosis. You land up with these problems. So, if you are using multiple fixations in, in these kind of things, where you where there is some osteopenia, it's better to use those, um, you know, multi-level fixations like you know the the, the system where you can you you need not bend the rods to that, that to that effect. So that that's that that's a, that's a good option to do. And also, you use an extra level of fixation. So if there's if there, if for example you're doing in in, in a infective uh, patient, so in, instead of a one uh, one or two level, well, you can you can add on an extra level, especially in the thoracic spine. That will give some stability. That's what I that, that that's what I used to do, you know. So so uh, uh, contour your rods accordingly. Get some get some kyphosis in the thoracic spine and flattening in in the thoracolumbar spine. Other than have an exaggerated uh, lordosis of sextant. So, so, so use longitude, for example, rather than sextant, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Actually, right. I, I, I agree with that, what Dr. Jasser said. I think, you know, whatever you, you it's very, very important to stabilize the spine in, a, in an economic position for that specific patient, especially in infectious cases, right? If you have any load, uh, and a, too much load or a overcorrection or whatever to, to that spine, you know, that usually results, you know, that the... Uh, the infection, you know, still goes on and goes on. You, you, you we should see that as, uh, you know, why, as an internal brace, which has to be as stable as possible in an economic position. Right, Dr. Jaswal? I think this is very important. Hi, Frankie. Good to hear you. Yeah, hi. Great. Good to hear you and see you all. I'm very, very happy about it. Great. 
All right, thank, thank you. you. So, uh, we will invite Dr. Anand Kumar. Uh, he is a senior spine surgeon who settled in the US. Uh, he's from. He's a deformity surgeon. Uh, we'd like to uh, listen to what pearls he has to, uh, to share with us. Thank you, Dr. Anand Kumar, for being around. Thank you. Sir, shall I play Dr. Anand Kumar's video? Yes, yes, please. Thanks. Hi, good evening. My name is Anand Kumar. I'm a solo practitioner, an orthopedic spine surgeon who practices in Denver, Colorado. My practice is called Colorado Spine and Scoliosis. And today I would be talking to you about minimal invasive lateral approaches to the thoracic spine and the thoracolumbar junction. This study is a retrospective analysis of 146 patients who underwent two to five level X lift procedures for greater than 30 degree scoliosis. And all of these patients were operated by a single surgeon. The vast majority of our patients were elderly and were about 60 to 79 years old. For many years, I have been performing adult scoliosis surgery with an anterior L2 to S1 spine fusion followed by a posterior approach. I have always felt that extending the fusion superiorly to the thoracolumbar junction gives you better correction with, with less pseudarthrosis. We have not had any patient in our series who developed pseudarthrosis. We analyzed a data with long segment fusion involving the pelvis and a small subset who we could avoid the pelvis and the thoracolumbar approaches can be utilized to treat adjacent level degeneration, severe junctional kyphosis, pseudarthrosis and the most important benefit of a lateral approach is that we can save levels in our scoliosis surgery. We can use the same principles to perform minimal invasive thoracic corpectomies. Only a third of our patients were male and the age extended from 29 to 87 and we did multi-level two to five level x lift procedures. Our patients were elderly and 75% of our patients were between 60 and 79 years of age. Only one patient underwent a multi-level fusion with the superior level being a T9 vertebra and 58% of our patients had T12 or L1 level x lift procedures. The slide on the left shows that we used a Berktoll bed with the Stuhlberg support as seen on the slide on the right. This Berktoll bed allows the patient to slide and also flex and this helps with our x-rays. Here are two examples of scoliosis going down to the pelvis. This is a 70 year old patient with neurological deficits who had a rigid curve L2 to L4 left 60 to 80 degrees which was corrected with a right side approach with a T12 harvest. We used a direct lateral approach and rotate the bed appropriately to correct the scoliosis. The most important aspect of this surgery is to know when to abort and when to proceed. X-rays are extremely important. The slide on the bottom right shows that the spinous process is exactly at the midline. If you do not see the spinous process in the midline, the rotation is not corrected adequately. The slides that are above this one shows that we can see the posterior posterior vertebral body appropriate and if you cannot see vertebral body without rotation we would need to abort the case and we have had only one patient who had a 95 degree scoliosis who intraoperatively we could not proceed with the correction. The AP and lateral x-ray show that we can get excellent correction on these rigid scoliosis deformity with a lateral approach. A four level T12 to L4 x lift procedure gave us good correction both in the sagittal and coronal plane and we can get good rotation correction also. The scoliosis deformity is frequently associated with thoracolumbar kyphosis. The thoracolumbar approach can correct the deformity in both planes. Here is an example of an 82-year-old patient who is severely osteoporotic with a T-score of minus 3.4 with progression of her deformity to 51 degrees. By performing a T12 to L3 three-level X-lift procedure, the thoracolumbar kyphosis was nicely correct. We have got optimum anterior column support and we always perform a kyphoplasty procedure at the adjacent level. We have been performing adjacent level kyphoplasty for the last 10 years with excellent results and our proximal junctional kyphosis incident is less than 5%. Here are two examples of multi-level scoliosis fusion that stopped at the L5 level. As you can see on the slide on the right, there is excellent rotation correction of the deformity which was achieved because we performed an excellent procedure from L1 to L5. Here is a 38-year-old rheumatoid patient with a 30-degree progression of her scoliosis where 
we had to perform T11 and T12 rib heart so that we could access the thoracolumbar junction. We had to perform a T5 to pelvis spine fusion. A four level L1 to L5 X lift procedure was followed by a T5 to L5 posterior spine fusion. Allowed us to get good rotation correct and restoration of sagittal and coronal plane balance. The sag reformat CT scan on the right shows severe degenerative changes at the thoracolumbar junction. This patient had lumbarization, the last motion segment, and had previous uh, I had performed a multi-level L2 to L5 X-lift interbody fusion, which stopped at the T12, but I thought I was at the T11. She broke down and had degenerated, which was extremely painful. The lateral approach at the thoracolumbar junction is an elegant way of obtaining a solid fusion. If a posterior only approach is utilized to correct this deformity, there would be a higher incidence of surarthro. And we performed a T10 to L X lift above the previous L2 to L X that had been performed to obtain a solid fusion from T10 to pelvis with no evidence of junctional kyphosis. Severe proximal junctional kyphosis at the thoracolumbar jump can be corrected with a simple single level X lift procedure. Here are two examples. This is a 69-year-old patient. As you can see, she's severely osteoporotic. She had a fail back procedure, multiple previous uh, narcotic dependent, severe osteoporosis, neurological deaths with a junctional kyphosis at the T12L1 junction. The severe proximal junctional kyphosis was corrected with a single level x procedure at the T12L1. She was off all narcotics. And here is an X with 11-year fall. Please notice that I did not perform a kyphoplasty at the upper level. We have been performing kyphoplasties at the superior level for the last 10 years. Here is an example of a 70-year-old patient who had 13 prior surgery and a failed. She had junctional kyphosis at the T11-12 level, which was corrected, a posterior approach initial. The slide on the lithrosis the T to L1, this was up by when we had performed a T10 to pelvis posterior spine and a L2 to S1 anterior lumbar. Unfortunately, the vascular surgeon had a complication and he had an intestinal perfect, which resulted in dress. He had to be treated with large doses of stress and developed UVs, and even today has poor vision because of the large doses of stress, which resulted in a fusion at the thoracolumbar. Despite being treated with large doses of stress, he obtained a solid fusion from L2 to the pelvis. The pseudoarthrosis that was present at the T10 to L1 segment could have been by an anterior approach, a posterior approach, or an anterior posterior approach. We felt that the fastest degree was to perform an anterior X lift, and we put a minimal invasive T10, 11, 11, 12, and 12, 1 X lift, and he went home one day after this. This could not have been achieved if we had performed a posterior or an anterior posterior spine. He obtained a solid fusion and has six years. The X lift procedure is no different from a traditional anterior. One of the teachings in the past used to be that we can save levels by going and people forget. We used to do a lot of anterior surgery for scoliosis. Here are two examples where we could save. This is a 29 year old patient who had a 20 degree progression of, and we could stop at the L4 by performing a multi-level fusion using the lateral. The post-operative x-ray show good correction of the deformity and uh, L1 to L4 right x lift procedure was performed with a T12 rib hub. We go into the concave side of the curve, perform multiple right and left side approach. This is another example where we could save levels where it made a big difference. This is a 50-year-old who had a T11 to L4 right scoli curve measuring 34. We were the third. Of One of our colleagues said that she needs a T4 to pelvis spine fusion. Other surgeon that she needed a T10 to pelvis spine. The post-operative x-ray shows that we could correct the thoracolum and save levels by performing a L2 to pelvis fusion. This could not have been achieved if we did not come early, perform our x lift And this was a hybrid L2 to L5 x lift with a L5 L5. This is an example where we can use our minimal invasive techniques to treat complicated. This is a 58 year old patient was a diabetic renal failure on dialysis with a paraparesis with grade one function, bowel and bladder apathy 
and the slide right show a CAT scan with four levels of ray completely destroyed in the lower thoracic. It was paraparetic for over seven weeks when I initially evaluated. The ribs were crowded together and the kyphosis can be used to our advantage. A small window was created at the T rib and this allowed us to correct a full and restore sagittal plate. We performed an anterior followed by a posterior approach and then went anteriorly and then securely stabilized the vertebra final posterior. The patient came back walking to our office six weeks later with complete recovery of his neurological. I've been performing lateral approach surgeries for the last six In my opinion, we get superior correction of the T and get good rotation, exclusion. As you have seen, we have not had any patient who has developed a psoriasis and all of these patients have had minimal complications because of the minimal invasion. None of the patients had this and there was minimal blood loss and there was a quick Thank you for allowing me to share my experience here. The lateral approach is a powerful using age-old principles of good anterior colport, which allows us to get superior and excellent results. So that was uh, phenomenal, uh, Dr. Anand Kumar. Uh, just wanted to ask you, what is this, uh, you know, uh, uh, complications discussed about X lift and you know Olive versus X lift uh, with regards to, to the anterior thigh pain and all. Is it all a humbug or? Uh... It's not humbug. Um, so um, when Pimenta started this, we all used to sit in one room, Neil Anand, he and I, and we used to talk about this. And in fact, going through the concave side was my idea, the direct lateral approach. I don't write papers. As you can see, I'm a solo practitioner. I don't have the time. Um, someone writes that up and gets the credit for it. And so um, my first case that I did, I followed Pimenta's idea with two incisions. And uh, I was screwing around, screwing around. She woke up with quadriceps weakness, ankle dorsiflexion weakness for a simple one level L4-5. I said, this is not the right way to do it. So my second case actually was a 64 degree scoliosis in a 66 year old patient. That was biting too much on your second case. And I put the cage into the vertebral body. And that was because I didn't realize how much the rotation had to be corrected the 65 degrees osteoporotic, you tilt the x-ray and you see something else. And I put the cage into the body. This one did not have neurological deficit. I did a direct lateral approach. I said this going around with two incisions doesn't make sense. <clears throat> my incidence of thigh numbness uh, has decreased in my last 16 years. It doesn't even match how many levels I do. I have three in the hospital today in the afternoon, today at 7.30, I've got one more to do. I did L1 to S1 on this lady who's 78. And I did six levels. So L T12 L1 to sacrum because she had a pathological fraction. She was kyphotic. No numb, no weakness. She has maybe 5% loss of sensation. And then I'll do a one level and they'll have numbness. So I'm unable to explain which one has it, uh, to be honest with you. Um, my incidence was worse before, but it is much less. It's probably at 15, 20%. If you're really a critical, I, I wish I could be honest and count everyone. I would, and as surgeons, we, are, we don't know how many we have. But almost 70, 80% of them decrease. But I do have quite a few that when you ask them critically, they have persistent thigh numbness. Except for my first patient, I've never had a neuro motor deficit. I don't have any thigh pain, but I have thigh numbness. And if I understand you, uh, your mandate is to go from the concave side, is it? And any particular... Always. Way? Always. Um, in fact, Pimenta used to talk about going on convex and I said, Luis, it doesn't make any sense. Then he took the idea and started talking about it in meetings. But you just imagine if your spine is bent like this with one incision, sometimes you may have to do two incisions. You can get to six levels with one incision. So but if you go in the concave side, it's much more helpful. It's really difficult because the disc is opened out on the concave convex side. So is it doesn't matter. All my cases are bone on bone. 
um, uh, the, so I'll share my experience with it. I have had my share, fair share of subsidence. That was my learning curve with this 16 years. So I used to use the instruments they had advised you. Don't do that. Use your, when you make your opening, like this case yesterday, shows kyphotic pathological fracture. There's hardly any disc space. You make your opening with the thinnest. Um, you just um, uh, put your wire there. You, you're in the disc space. And then you put your widest spreader um, inside that space. And then that will separate your vertebra gradually. And, and then you, there's a, there's a rasp-like instrument, which I use constantly, and it separates the vertebra. But you go one, one the widest footprint and not small instruments, and it'll separate your vertebra. My subsidence has decreased significantly. It's hardly there. Um, most of my end plate perforation were done by me but because I used to use a curette and whatnot. If you use that flat disc spreader, it doesn't happen. And all my patients, because they're all elderly, you saw my graph, they're all 70, 75, 80 year old people uh, and they're all osteoporotic. The one game changer is in the last two years, I've been using Timless and Forteo and that's made a huge difference also. Thank you, Dr. Anand Kumar. Very interesting. If anyone has any questions from the panel for Dr. Anand Kumar. Yeah, Arvind, can, can I just yeah. come in here? Yeah. Uh, uh, great presentation, Dr. Anand Kumar. Uh, but going back to the question which uh, Arvind asked about the thigh weakness and uh, cords weakness and numbness, uh, and you mentioned Louis Pimenta. I mean, when, when, when the technique just devolved, it was it was basically percutaneous, if I'm, if I'm correct, right? Correct. And and now what most of the surgeons are doing, you're doing a, doing a mini open. So you, you're Correct. going almost going right up to and, visit and visualizing your entry, uh, your docking points, right? So you're able to assess where you are, plus, plus neuro monitoring. That has, uh, I personally feel, has decreased the amount of, um, you know, numbness and medical cord disease. Is, is, is that uh, how you look at it? Earlier, you, you would just do it uh, percutaneous and rely on your neuro monitoring. Now you have a mini open to see where you're docking. Is that that gives you an idea where you're actually docking? Absolutely, Arvind. Because my first case was a percutaneous case, and yeah. she woke up with quad and ankle dorsiflexion weakness. Yeah. Ever since that, every single case I did yeah. open lateral, and yeah. so we, we, the incision is small, but. Uh, it's like an ACDF. I mean, you're seeing everything on the inside. Exactly. Uh, you can go from top to bottom, and it's so easy to do. You just keep marching one level to the other, multi-level. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing the psoas. You can just use your finger, and your finger is blunter than anything else. Mm -hmm. And you just move the muscle away. And that is, that's the key to this approach, like you rightfully said. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, Dr. Anand, you know, I have one question. Uh, I think, you know, the Thai-related problem is redu reduced, as uh, you said to Dr. Jaiswal also, because you dock it exactly at the groove between the psoas and the medial part, and subperiosteally, you can, out, up to two to three level, psoas can be pushed laterally, and then you are entering from front, right? That, did it make a difference? So you enter I, I, exactly the anterior edge of the psoas, then subperiosteally, you can remove the muzzle at one to two levels and then push the muzzle otherwise rather than entering into the muzzle. So you're talking more like an OLIF approach. OLIF to be honest, of. right, I have not done an OLIF thus far. Yeah. I'm still a, a lateral approach guy. So I go, um, I start from either level, either bottom up or up bottom. Up, um, bottom. Okay. Um, the key is if you take your 11th or your 12th rib, then you're already up uh, at the thoracolumbar junk. You can go to T10 without any problem with with that approach, even in a really uh, 70, 80 degree curve. My worst is a 90 plus degree scoliosis that I've done this with. Um, the 95 degree curve, even with all the experience, this happened to me just three weeks ago. I aborted. I just couldn't do it because the, the rotation was far too much. I couldn't see the vertebral bodies. And an opening would have to come at T6 to get into... Uh, T12. So um, I, I go each level, like up, upper spine is not a problem. As you come down, I just make separate openings into the psoas. 
but it's just one opening with the rest of the muscle intact that's what i do okay but then you can once you bluntly dissect the nerve is not in your way we need to abort now so we have the next talk uh, by dr frank and before that dr De- uh, dr deshpande wants to show some critical step he is reached uh, you know in the tilt that he is doing yeah over to the operating room yeah thank you thank you we'll just take 5 minutes of the time so dr dr rajkumar has finished uh, his ipsilateral bone work as you already saw he had finished his disc or disc job he is now put in a cage and he has finished the over the top decompression as well so we are just going to show a little bit of the video there as soon as we can switch the transmission and then we can get back to the uh, to the lecture session again okay dr rajkumar you are live yeah so now we are we are live sir you are live sir dr rajkumar yes sir can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah thanks for the patience and allowing me i know i'm sorry interrupting you guys in a fantastic lecture by all the stalwarts So I'm just going to show you. This is the ipsilateral area that I operated. This is the nerve that was transitioning. This will be the midline. I run across, and I'm going to zoom that area again. So I'm just going to zoom this area all the way. Quiet, please. Thank you. Ah, uh, you can see I've gone right across. You can see that I have separated all the. tissues here there's some little tissue that side is okay but you can see this is the edge of the dura is here can you see it please is very well uh, dr deshpande yeah this is the edge of the dura this patient was severely stenotic and dura yeah and you can see the opposite disc here can you see the opposite disc this is the opposite disc the nerve root is going down there so all that has been removed just a bit of tissue here but other than that i think everything is good and i think this much of decompression for the severely stenotic lysthetic uh, patient across uh, over the top is good because we also have put a 14 mm cage which i think we can see on the x ray and the 14 mm cage is pretty good and it has distracted the body so all is left now is to put the screws in place and then uh, put the rods and then i think that's the uh, thing that is left behind Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, you can ask afterwards, and I'll allow uh, our friend Omesh to continue with the uh, talk that's uh, pending. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Deshpande. So we are rushing to Dr. Frank's last talk on yeah. a very important topic that is MIS in revision. Yeah. So the last interesting uh, talk of just a minute, sir. We'll transition it. This session. So, Doctor Franke, you use a handheld uh, retractor, right? You don't use a table attachment. I've seen you operating. You hold it with your left hand, right? The tubular retractor. Yeah, but but this is this is both possible, right? Uh, for for tubular decompression, uh, I have a tube uh, with the hand. You know, you with the handheld. So we we uh, we do have you know those quadrant retractors you know which you can uh, attach to the table so it's both possible. Sometimes you know I use one or the other. If I if I got the resident with me, right? Usually then you know he can and that he, that the resident has to do something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a handheld for it. Otherwise he might does uh, different things which we don't like. So therefore there's a handheld for it. <laughs> that's a that's the same like you know the Lagenbeck. Right, the two Langenbecks, you know, they are they are there, you know, that the hands of the resident have to do something. Okay, which works usually fine. Can I play your video, sir, on your permission? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. So otherwise, we can, you know, I I made a I made a rather, you know, a, a, a call on a revision, you know, because uh, Dr. Anand, I have to congrat uh, Anand Kuma, I have to congratulate you on a brilliant talk, you know, and the nice results of your your correction, you know, this is this is really marvelous. So I'm very happy. I I did it a little more theoretical uh, on on the way to uh, kind of to create your thoughts on on you know if you do revisions and where the place of MIS is, you know, that's that's very important. And I liked your comment very much, you know, only stay MIS. uh you know when you can achieve your goal otherwise you have to find different solution and it's not you know that you have to stick to that always you know kind of that we find uh, com- uh you know that we perform sometimes e- even you know combinations of the two techniques and use the best of both worlds 
So we can start with the Hi, uh, everybody. So this is my second talk for this session. Uh, we are now talking about the application of MIS techniques for you know, adjacent segment disease, recurrent problems, previous laminectomy. So kind of a revision talk uh, on MIS. So we uh, we see now what are the situations? You know, what, what is the kind of situation you, you might uh, encounter? First, mass decompression versus mass decompression. This is one. The other one might be mass stabilization, matter removal, mass fusion, going on to another mass fusion adjacent segment, or maybe the same level as a revision case, prior open procedure, if you, uh, you know, if a laminectomy has been done or this procedure has been done before, and then you have to add the mass procedure, a revision, laminectomy, or revision, decompression, or a fusion, or whatever, and any kind of extension onto a prior open fusion or onto a prior mass fusion. So those are the situations which you might encounter and you, you have to have a look at if you can do that. If you talk about mass decompression versus a mass decompression, for a re hernia or recurrent disc or stenosis, it, it, your situation is in principle much better than uh, if you have a prior open surgery, if, uh, prior revision for an open surgery. You know, stick to the to the bony structures. Use the microscope. You know, that's desperately needed. That's very very important. So therefore, if you have to revise a mass procedure, this gives you much better options. Uh, so this is one reason why you might uh, should consider using mass. You know, in case of a revision, it's much easier. If you have to revise a prior open surgery. Maybe mass gives you a opportunity to go another direction and maybe maybe come around the, the scar tissue, but it's not not that easy. So what you can see here, this is one study I did, which is published in the European Spine Journal in 2009, and uh, the map uh, called on the on the right side of the slide. The, this is uh, the minimal invasive procedure, and and the other one is the microscopic assisted procedure. So in let's say, not very invasive procedure. What, what you can see here is the scar tissue is much less in the uh, mite and tubular techniques might give you the chance to come around the scar tissue a little better than in an open uh, way. If you talk about metal removal, that's pretty easy. You know, use the same incisions, maybe use lung backs with junior doctors, you know, that's sometimes the same as a tube, right? Two lung backs. Uh, if the tube is has been used in the first surgery, maybe you know two lung and backs may act, may act as a tube as well. Uh, you need no special instruments. Use the same in metal removal as easy as a revision. If you talk about a mass fusion after a mass fusion, you know there's something like the quadrant, which is a very nice retractor. Some other ones are very nice too. So. Right, you should not cut any muscles. You you can place it individually to the position you you need it. Uh, you know, so I will I will show you one of my cases where I did a revision of a mass case. So what you, so what you can see here, you know, I already removed the, the screw uh, on the upper side of the of the image uh, because you know it was a little medial misplaced in an MIS signage before. So I had to revise that case, and I go through that. You know, I can easily see the whole. On the uh, midline, there's the uh, spinal or the, the nervous structures. And you can see here now, it, it's pretty nice. You see both holes, right? There's one. You can see the bite of the, um, of the uh, lamina here, you know, where, where I did my decompression. And then, then uh, you, you see, you know, on, on, a, on a further development, right, we could... I could add the new screw. I could uh, kind of then decompress. Then I, you know, the, the screw was a little medial displaced. So therefore I had to remove the screw a little more to the lateral side on that revision case. But that's pretty easy possible. You have a very nice view through the tubular um, quadrant with a microscope. You can do your proper decompression. You can kind of visualize the nervous structures. You see the nerve root, the trans, um, Versing nerve root here very nicely, uh, and 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 with that you know you can then kind of make sh make sure that there's no problem. You know there's a cage in now, 
And with the Cajun, you can place the second screw, right? That's the second screw, a little more lateral. You, you are very nicely able to see that there's no problem with the, with the nervous structures anymore. Uh, and then, you know, you can place uh, the rod inside secure that there is no bleeding, put a little bone aside, and, and you are safe. So revising an MIS procedure, MIS is, is possible. Even you know with scar tissue around, you can do that. Uh, use a microscope and you can nicely see you know whatever you want to see. And you see you can create a nice fusion with a lot uh, less muscle damage than you might have done before with a very, very open procedure. So the point is with any prior open procedure, you know, you can especially uh, do that if, if the midline is hidden by scars, you know, create your approach to a virgin territory if possible. Uh, sometimes smaller tubes are more flexible and better. You know, still think about the principles of Vilsi. Use those given layers if they are free and virgin. That's something you, you should do. Yeah. Uh, for, for the screws, you can use the trajectories. And you see, even if there's kind of muscle damage already there. You see that in some of the pictures, you might get around much better uh, doing with the tubular technique with your workflow. You can really nicely uh, you know, kind of try to, to uh, you know, whatever you use, a chisel, or if you use a burr, you know, you, that's that's not, not of importance. Uh, the portfolio for those revisions is, is really uh, quite a bit, you know, you don't only have now PLIF, T-LIF, A-LIF, you know, you can even go for D-LIF from lateral, you can do for O-LIF from a little more anterior, which is very important, you know, that you create whatever you want, any kind of uh, approaches is, is, is given. Very, very important if you revise those surgeries, either for this or you do an adjacent backman, please, again, look at the properly prepared end plate. Please do your release good, nicely that you can create height to in order to, even if you do it MIS, that you respect such a balance parameter. Either you do it from the back or the front. You see both versions. Very, very important. Right. It is not important if you go, you know, whatever kind of in the body then you use in addition to your decompression and to your um, stabilization, please make sure with that revision that you really put, you know, even one or two or three segments in the, in the best position. In any of the extension of a prior open fusion, you know, you can combine whatever you want. Uh, on, on those techniques and you have to make sure that you have the basic requirements, that you have an adequate uh, imaging and indication, that you have adequate neuro navigation if needed, a good fluoro or even a, a, a O-arm or whatever, and your skills are there in order to do that MIS. Please, again, don't invent an indication. It's very important. The main difference is really you don't detach, like on the left side here, the muscle. You distract, and uh, you the muscles are just you know kind of dilated. And with those big tubular uh, tubal tubes, you can nicely do that even on deformity cases. And there, you know, there was a kyphoplasty done with a uh, with the decompression, with the compression, you know, and then the kyphosis. But, you know, and, and on that case, you, we could nicely do it with a, with a combination, right? We did the, the fusion, MIS, and the correction, we did it in, in a mini open way, with a mini open PSO here in this case. So, therefore, don't do always everything, you know, MIS, you can always combine that. And that's the point, you know, whenever you are in doubt, try, go open. But... Have a solar assessment of your equipment. Have a clear view on your personal capabilities. Then, you know, a lot is possible with MIS. And no one says that you have to do everything of the uh, redo MIS. You can always use the combinations, you know. I love it. And your patients will do if you, if you add that even to your revision strategy. And that's the point. The reality is it works well. But be aware of learning curve and don't invent indications. Thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Franke, 
for a great talk again uh any questions panelists arvin i just want to thank all the uh panelists for their excellent uh, inputs all the speakers including your your thank you very much i really enjoyed hearing all of your talk maybe i'll sit and talk to you hey exe exe uh the raja i'm very happy too you know i i saw that very nice 40 mm cage in the area right to have some anterior height i was very happy thank you very much many times we have discussed such issues and uh, and now i'm very happy to see you keep yourself safe i think germany is in big trouble like in some parts of india and hopefully all of us will get through it successfully and i also want to thank uh, dr roger hotel dr lee dr baru cover mamad zileli salman sharif and dr ant kumar for their wonderful talk i think we are running great arwen and yeah. we should uh, start Hi. this session up and yeah. we'll start the next session we are 30 to 40 minutes late and i thank you for your <laughs> wonderful moderation my appreciation for you thank you so much thank you very much so as we inch towards our wine glasses i would last i would invite dr uh, jacob ipan to uh, moderate the last uh, panel last uh, session for the day it's an interesting session uh, which has lots of tips and tricks to be uh, learned uh, and i would uh, request all of you to still hang on and uh, listen to all uh, uh, these uh, stalwart speaking thank you thank you jacob to unmute, unmute myself so we have dr jacob can you take over and uh, hi. the last session hi. yeah it's hi 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 this is uh, it's really uh, nice to uh, moderate this session and uh, as as you can see we have a lineup of uh, the best stars from around the country presenting on some very very difficult uh, techniques in uh, minimally invasive surgery uh, from uh, we have the stars from bangalore dr satish rudrapa and uh, dr umesh uh, shrikantha we have vishal uh, uh, talking about a very difficult uh, uh, spon you know spondylolisthesis reduction especially it does for uh, high grade listhesis in mis tlf and we have uh, uh, the others talking about uh, very difficult approaches uh, in uh, minimally invasive spinal surgery and first i would like to call upon dr chandan mohanty to talk about palatal discectomy with the tube thank you thanks jacob give us a minute sir i'm sharing your video sure so uh, so i think it's going to take a second to start but i would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity and uh, really enjoyed the Uh, sessions and all the talks uh, throughout the day thank you dr rajkumar and dr rumesh uh, uh, for this good morning good morning everyone i would like to thank dr rajkumar deshpande and dr mystery kanta for this wonderful opportunity to discuss about tubular microdiscectomies of bilateral disc herniation uh, for purpose of this presentation we'll be discussing foraminal and extraforaminal disc herniation so so we know bilateral disc herniations are much more uncommon than the, the routine central and paracentral disc herniation lateral bending 
is a, a more specific provocative test uh, than SLRT for far lateral disc herniations. So my usual skin incision for far lateral uh, disc is about three to four and a half centimeters away from the midline, depending on how big the patient is. I like to work between the no natural septa between the multifidus and the longest muscles, which takes us straight to the area of interest. Uh, classically, the docking of the tube was uh, described at the level of the transverse process and at the pars. However, uh, recently, however, as time progressed, it was noted that docking more inferiorly at the junction of the transverse process and the facet joint uh, were much more uh, simpler because it gave a much direct access uh, to the uh, to the disc space, and this is what I prefer as well. So we have a 50-year-old male who had acute onset low back pain, radiating to left knee, severely antalgic gait without any neurological deficit. Uh, sagittal MRI typically does not show any nerve compression. However, nerve compression is picked up on the parasagittal and the axial uh, sequences where you can see narrowing of the foramen. So, so here, uh, uh, the upper part of the screen is the medial end. Lower part of the screen is the lateral end. Left hand side of the screen is the superior end of the patient and right hand side of the screen is the inferior end of the patient. After docking on the transverse uh, facet junction, uh, we identify the transverse uh, intertransverse ligament, sometimes called as intertransverse fascia in some of the books. So once uh, uh, it's uh, dissected, we start removal of the intertransverse ligament piecemeal and we see the nerve root immediately after dissecting the intertransverse ligament. So we usually with a blunt instrument try to create a proper plane between the intertransverse ligament and the nerve root. Uh, uh, if there are any possible adhesions, don't want to damage the nerve root. As you can see, the nerve is, uh, is directly shifted posteriorly because of the underlying disc herniation. There we are moving the nerve root superiorly and laterally, dissecting some more of the intertransverse ligament. So now we are trying to palpate the lower end of the disc herniation. Make sure we have the inferior limit of the disc herniation in our operative field. If if it is if the fragment is beyond that, then probably we'll need a resection of the uh, transverse process. Here we are performing what's a uh, lateral foraminotomy. We taking out some part of the ligamentum flavum and some part of the facet. Just a few uh, few punch with uh, with the kerosene punch so as to enlarge the foramen. So the root is retracted superiorly and laterally, as you can see, and there you see the disc. So now we're taking the fragment of the disc. I usually I like to retract the root with my suction. I don't like to use. Uh, a root retractor which is held by my assistant for these cases much because i have much better control i can control the degree of retraction that i need i can control uh, how much of retraction and where exactly i need it i get more space in the channel as well in the tube you can see already the root is getting much more relaxed the roots moving much more freely with a blunt instrument uh, like this or sometimes even with a flat pen field dissector, we can take out the loose fragments, which are usually stuck under the annulus. So there are multiple ways to skin the cat. I usually don't explore the disc space too much. I just prefer to take out the loose fragments. So I keep the manipulation of the root to the minimum because the dorsal root ganglion is located right there. Too much of retraction and pulling of the root may cause uh, neuropathic pain complex in the post-op uh, period and hence I uh, prefer not to retract the root too much, but keep it at minimum. So here again, we are taking out any searching for loose fragments and there we take it out. Now we will check the nerve, make sure it is completely free. There are no fragments anywhere underneath the nerve, hiding underneath the nerve or causing any nerve compression. Hemostasis is the key not only in the site of operation but also in the surgical tract. 
So once your localization is done with a, with a lateral and AP X-ray, this is relatively fast, about 20, 25 minute uh, procedure, doesn't take too long. That's a disfragment we got out from this patient. Uh, in cases of L5 S1 discarnation or patients with a high uh, crest, uh, this can be uh, somewhat of a problem. However, trans ALR approaches have been described to approach the L5 S1 uh, disc where you dissect part of the ALR lateral to the facet joint and then you are at the site of the hernia disc herniation. So my key take home messages are uh, diagnosis uh, has to be made on parasagittal and axial MRI. If uh, height of the crest or L5 S1 is the location of the far lateral disc herniation, then a trans ALR approach is more useful. Minimal handling and retraction of the dorsal, uh, dorsal root ganglion and the nerve is extremely important. And uh, superior and lateral retraction of the nerve is much more simpler. It may be also be useful to do a small lateral foraminotomy just to enlarge the uh, exiting foramen. Uh, I would like to th thank Dr. Rakesh Luhana for the video and I would also like to thank the organizers, Dr. Umesh and Dr. Uh, Rajkumar for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any, any questions uh, now. Yeah, Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandan Mohandir. Such a beautiful uh, exposition of uh, the uh, removal of a palatal disc. And uh, notice that uh, he has docked. Uh, the docking is very important. You know, you want to have the junction of the uh, transverse process and the superior articular facet. You know, you want to go in that groove uh, directly to get at the disc and there's minimal retraction of the nerve root because the nerve root is pushed superiorly. Any of the faculty would like to add anything to this or uh, should we proceed to the next? Uh, Dr. Amritlal. Okay, I think we shall uh, proceed to Dr. Satish Rudrapa's uh, lecture. And uh, Dr. Rudrapa is speaking on his experience with uh, anterior cervical functional discectomies. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Rudrapa. Can I play his video? Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Jacob. Uh, can you put my video? My topic is on functional cervical discectomy, otherwise anterior functional cervical discectomy. You all know cervical disc is the most common cause of cervical radiculopathy as well as the myelopathy. But the natural history of it says that 90% of the patients do not require surgery. You know, And even in those patients who have a neurological deficit can be treated conservatively. The common surgical options available are posterior lamina foraminotomy, anterior discectomy and fusion. So when you see the posterior foraminotomy, the most patients will have a lingering problem with the neck pain, especially due to the facet removal partially, as well as the muscle fibrosis and kyphosis developing in some patients. Whereas in case of anterocervical discectomy, it definitely decreases the range of motion. It also can create the adjacent segment degeneration or implant-related complications. So looking at the overall picture of all these years of experience in a new methodology is tried where we can remove only the causative agent, that is a causative disc or osteophyte, and still preserve rest of the disc in these patients, which is called as functional disc surgery. Joe et al. started it, where they removed the, you know, um, the uncinate process and, uh, you know, the syringer et al. preserved the part of the uh, uncinate process in to remove one of the only extruded format, uh, fragment of the disc and so that they can preserve rest of the disc. Uh, but most of these patients who had the surgery in these two procedures, where the uncinate process is removed, the bleeding was higher, sometimes vertebral artery injury was created. So hence, we modified the procedure. So how the Joe's procedure is done is shown in this, you know, the model. Uh, here in the Joe's procedure, the, the drilling is done on the lateral uh, part of the disc, lateral to the ALL. Uh, this is the, whatever the yellow line, uh, the blue line I put in, that is a part of the uh, bone removed and the PLL is removed from posteriorly and then the disc is removed as a single or multiple fragment to give the relief to the root. So you can clearly make out in this procedure, vertebral artery is closer as well as the root is very closer whenever they're drilling this, you know, in this procedure. So what did we do? You know, we did a modification where we took the more medially, uh, medial drilling of the you know, the upper vertebrae, uh, closer to the oncovertebral uh, uncinate uh, uh, process, and uh, the avo it avoids the breaching of the lateral wall of the superior vertebrae, preserves the lower end plate, and the disc is directly reached at the herniated side. So this is how we started doing our procedure. Here, you can clearly make out 
you know, we do a drilling with using the 3 mm bar. The ultimate our goal is to create 5 mm hole within the vertebral body and directly go in the supracorporeal, that is, the, you know, the body which is above the level of the disc herniation. And you drill it in such a way that when we go posterior, the amount of the hole created is not more than 5 millimeter or it should be able to allow at least 1 millimeter of kerosene punch which will go in and remove the posterior longitudinal ligament easily as well as the osteophyte which is there medial or lateral to the area which we drill. So you can clearly see here we are using the 1 mm upcut and use of the 1 mm upcut increases the enlarging of the hole from inside to outside and so that we can get the clear view of the disc herniation and the herniated disc perfectly under the, the hole we have created. Then you take a small hook, uh, the sharp and blunt hooks to remove the disc as a single piece mm. so that the you know we will see the uh, epidural veins uh, bleeding at the end of the procedure so that the disc can be uh, removed in a piecemeal or if it is a fresh you know, uh, disc, sometimes we can remove as a single piece the way we depict it. So the procedure is exactly like what we normally do it because in case if you are not able to uh, do this procedure, you can convert it into standard ACDF. Uh, same way we prep the patient, inject. But only thing is what we do is we will not expose more medially and uh, we expose only to the side where it needs to be exposed. So here is an example, you know, C5-6 disc left sided, the nerve root compression is significant in the axial region, you know, uh, axial region. And you can see uh, clearly see the uncinate process which is seen on either side. And we drill it in such a way that the hole is made in the supracorporeal part. Uh, and so the drill is created using the 3 mm bar. And after creating the drill, you put, use the 1 mm kerosene punch, make it go to the depth, where when you go to the depth, the end plate should not be breached. In the superior part, only the inferior posterior part where the you know, the PLL is closer to the disc space. You can take a small punch there so that you know it is easier for the disc to be removed. You can clearly see the disc fragments are coming in pieces using the hook and we are exactly slightly lateral to the axilla of the exiting narrow root. And remove it piecemeal in such a way that the bleeding happens at particular point as you keep doing uh, the the epidural veins come into the picture that this is the last fragment as you hook it under the microscope you can either use the microscope or endoscope whichever you are convenient with and i am very you know uh, convenient with the microscope because my left hand is also can be utilized very well and remove the uh, all the disc fragment in such a way that the bleeding will happen and whenever there is a bleeding happens, you can keep a small fragment of the surgical cell into that place and you can coagulate any of the bleeding vessels which are coming in. Mm. And the procedure, you know, ends there once you take out all the fragment medially and laterally. Even the ossified, which is much more medial, can be removed with this. You can see the amount of fragments which I removed with this procedure and which is good enough. This is a pre-operative picture of that patient and that is a post-operative picture, you know, when we have done it. And the CT scan shows how we are created in the supracorporeal end. You can clearly make out the hole is created in the upper corporeal, you know, upper vertebrae. In the high cervical disc, sometimes unseen process has to be removed because the angle in which you get it, it will be slightly difficult if you do only the supracorporeal part. So, you know, in our experience till 2018, I had done about 15 patients, you know, all the patients have significantly improved in neurological deficit. You know, only two patients had the constant radicular pain for uh, transient for about a few weeks, but that also improved significantly in these patients. So, in conclusion, minimally invasive. This is a minimally invasive procedure. Clinical outcome is excellent. Complications are least, and duration of the stay cost is significantly reduced in these patients. And only limitation is if the disc herniation is gone beyond the midline. You know, it is very difficult to remove in this procedure, more so when there is an osteophyte which is creating a myelopathy. And it is definitely recommended when you want to preserve the motion in these patients as well as the healthy disc, which is not, you know, degenerated can be preserved in these patients. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Satish. Uh, what a wonderful, uh, such a technically demanding procedure, which uh, Dr. Satish has so beautifully shown us. Um, there are a few questions from the audience. If I may ask uh, in brief a couple please, of things. Please. Uh, please go one ahead. is it uh, is oh, what is your experience uh, with this uh, procedure as compared to doing a like you have got a lot of experience probably with uh, also with uh, posterior microframinotomies. So yes. that's also a minimally invasive procedure, and this is also an anterior cervical like anterior framinotomy. So yeah. How, how do you compare the two and like what would be your indications for either of these? Uh, I have most often now switched over to the anterior compared to the posterior. The reason being, uh, when you do the posterior, the muscle has to be dissected. Second, a part of the facet has to be always removed, especially if you want to see the you know, root and the root comes first and then comes the disc. So if the root is completely posterior and the venous plexus are coming, Sometimes the amount of bleeding will be very nagging. You cannot take out the you can take out the disc, but the bleeding is slightly nagging as well as the patients will have small neck pain whenever I do that. So now I switched over to this anterior procedure where it is a usual ACDF kind of exposure, least you know vascular area, and the drilling is superbly vertical. You do and straight you will enter into the disc without any problem. And the bleeding happens at the end. So I'm much more comfortable now with this anterior procedure compared to the posterior. Yeah, certainly I can understand, sir, uh, because uh, when we are doing, like, there's a lot of bleeding, number one. And uh, yeah. secondly, uh, we have, for let's say, some obese patients where there is significant difficulty in positioning and, you know, mm -hmm. you, uh, not just the fact that they might develop prone-related problems, but you always... Uh, want to have an additional procedure like uh, the anterior cervical approach, which uh, Dr. Rudrapa has so beautifully shown us. And uh, it's thank you, sir, for uh, showing us this uh, procedure. Welcome. And uh, just one more question to you is that uh, what do you, how do you tackle uh, medially placed uh, disc? Do you? Yeah, the uh, one one good thing about this procedure is especially when you use the one mm upcut. Uh, you can go more medially. You don't have to disc, you know, separate laterally at all. So use the upcut. Sometimes I've used even a 2 mm upcut. If by increasing one more millimeter at the depth, you can put the 2 mm upcut. And once you take out the PLL, you can go towards the, up to the midline, I can go. But beyond the midline, is difficult. Better not to do that because your cord, you know, hump comes, then you might injure it because lower it will be, bl you know, blind. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, maybe just go to the next uh, talk. Uh, technique for uh, spondylolisthesis uh, reduction in MIST lift. The big boss in uh, uh, high-grade lysthesis reduction, Dr. Vishal Peshativar from Mumbai, will uh, address us right now. Thank you. This is this reduction in MIST lift. Well, uh, in mild instabilities like this, it's fairly easy to get a good reduction, adequate hardware and cage size inside to get a good result in MIST lift. Well, the trick is to be able to replicate it in even uh, grades like this, three or grade four or grade two, uh, rigidly stasis. Some of the tips to get this goal. Well, uh, fortunately, majority in our practice, nearly 80% are dynamically stasis, as in they are flexible. So just by, as you can see on the left-hand side, looks very bad, grade three with no disc height. On positioning, it has gone to grade two with opening up of this guy. This is a very heartening thing because that means that you will be able to get a very good uh, reduction, if not a normal positioning at the end of the surgery. Majority of these listases are at L5-S1 levels. As for L5-S1 level is at an angle, it's uh, at the cordocephaloid end. So one of the tricks to change this, this position on operation table is to give your patient a head eye. The moment you give head eye to the patient, what happens is the orientation of the disc becomes more uh, perpendicular to the floor and you're able to work easy. Well, uh, you have to remember to go from this when uh, you are getting a barely a, a bare entry for a number four pen field to be able to put in a size 12 cage, you have to be prepared to make an end uh, 
plate preparation. For that, you need adequate uh, size curates in various sizes and shapes to be able to reach the ipsilateral as well as the contralateral side. We also use this uh, custom-made uh, set of blunt puka chisels, which is from 6 millimeters to 16 millimeters. As you can see, it's got a taper tip and it's blunt on the edges. This prevents damage to the end plate and helps with the uh, what uh, is our uh, concept of ligament retrexis of the disc space. What essentially happens is the soft tissue structures of a disc space, the annulus, the PLN, and ALL are of finite length. So like in a distal end radius where there is a, a collapse of the bone after a fracture, we use the ligaments to open it up again. Similarly, in a listhetic segment, this if this were the ends of the vertebrae and that's the soft tissue that has crumpled over, as you distract it, the soft tissue expands and goes to its optimal height so that you are able to put in an adequate size cage. And in that process, the soft tissue pulls this uh, listhetic segment back into its uh, place and you can put in a cage to hold the reduction there and let the cage be the weight-bearing part. Well, this has to be done after having adequately released the uh, disc space so that there is no pressure on the end place, otherwise they will crumble. You can also use an expandable cage after the disc space has been opened up, not leaving the weight uh, too much pressure on an expandable cage because an expandable, uh, expandable cage by design is uh, weaker than a solid cage that will be used. As you can see here, this is a uh, surgery done in a flexible listasis, I'll take you to the point where that's a 15 number blade used to gain in entry. That's the inferior, that's the superior, that's the medial and lateral edge. I prefer to take the sacral overhang out with a keratin rounder and then introduce my puka. In this case, it's a uh, flexible uh, listasis. So you can just go in with the puka to reduce, uh, reduce adequately and progressively increasing the size of your puka chisel, blunt pukas, uh, so that you are able to get the listasis back into its place. However, the problem starts when you're doing a rigid case, like you can see here, this rigid uh, listasis, that's the inferior, that's the superior, that's medial, that's lateral. This doesn't even take the blade of a 15 number knife inside. It's that rigid. So in this cases, you have to be very, very patient. You start with a very, very small size, three zero curates, make a end, uh, the diskette uh, this where it's been cut, you then scrape open. I use a one millimeter kerosene then to take out the dome of the sacrum so that you can put in rest of the instruments. In this case, it is so rigid that we couldn't use, we could barely fit in the number four uh, dura as you can see here. So then I use a very thin osteotome to get in after confirming the angle of the disc and use that to toggle it up a little bit so that it opens up some of the adhesions open and you can put in the next size uh, implant in here. You can see I cannot still put in the smallest six millimeter puka inside so no issues there's no point in forcing it you have to start again you have to start uh, using uh, uh, progressively larger size curates and take up more and more disc out once you have some space take out the overhang a little bit more after having done that then you again try and open up here it is opening up to six millimeters gently once you've done that, leave it in place for a couple of minutes so that the soft tissues get used to the stretch and don't spring back immediately. Then you can use various, again, progressively larger size curates to reach to the opposite side, open up the disc space and try again with progressively larger uh, blunt chisels. If you're still not able to do uh, open it up again, then this is the time to go to the opposite side, do a facetectomy there, enter and release from that side and then get in your cage. Well, screws, you have to see that you can use the thickest and the largest, longest screws that you can, especially at L5S1. Take a shot what I do is I use a uh, lenke in that small hole of the percutaneous screw that I'm making and engage it un in the opposite uh, cortex so that I know I have a right size screw and getting a tricot hold so that my screws are strong enough to be able to hold a high grade least stasis. With navigation, it's easier. Nowadays, we use OAM based navigation. So we know our trajectory is perfect. It I know that it I have what is the correct size of screws uh, of screw to be used at that level. And uh, as you can see here on the left hand side of the screen, 
are the screws that are put in that is the step that is there but once you have engaged the rod because there is an adequate disc release and an adequate size cage it just comes up and the reduction is there uh, dr deshpande in his uh, paper that has been cited more than 21 times in the past 3 years has uh, described this beautiful technique where he does a release puts in a cage and from the opposite side uses a section system jig to pull in the listesis this is a study case study done in young patients and uh, is one of the good ways of getting a reduction done remember positioning adequate release facetectomy in case of a, a bilateral facetectomy in case of a rigid listesis use of sequential blunt dilators right size cage good bone graft because your end point is a fusion at that age and of course a lot of rods for final reduction are all the tricks of the trade to get a good reduction for a high grade listesis every time you do an mis t lift thank you very much Dr. Vishal, uh, another beautiful presentation, and you know, we all know how difficult it is to get a reduction for uh, high-grade lysis, especially with the uh, MIS uh, technique. And uh, he uh, has shown us the systematic approach that he has followed uh, to achieve that. And uh, I would like to ask any of our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Amrit Lal Sachin, or uh, any of them, any questions for Dr. Vishal? Hi, this is Prashant from Calcutta. I have a question for Dr. Vishal. Uh, Dr. Vishal, this is an amazing presentation. I just want to ask you, uh, for a lysis which is rigid and more than grade two, do you think that is a soft tissue which is holding them back mainly, or you rely on the disc preparation mainly to reduce the lysis, or it is a screw, a cantilever technique of the screw reduction? Uh, because I personally think, whatever you do for the disc space, you jack it up up to fourteen. If it's a rigid lysis, it's not going to come back. It is a screw li lately, which help you bring you back the lysis. What's your thoughts about it? So uh, the basic teaching is uh, a screw is a top neutralizing device. The weight bearing in the spinal column happens in the anterior and middle segment. The posterior segment is not a weight bearing segment. So when you're putting in a screw, yes, they do have a load sharing idea, but if you put it as a load bearing screw, your uh, structure is going to fail. That's why in a rigid is a, uh, in a rigid list uh, you need to have a complete release, not just of the disc space, but sometimes you have to go. Uh, if it is a grade two list stasis, then you, before you go down to the disc, you do over the top, go and release the under surface of the opposite facet. That's give, that gives you some play. Unfortunately, most rigid listesis posteriorly will have an osteophyte creeping over it. So you got to take that out before it allows a spring back. So the best thing to do is to dock another tube on the other side, do a facet release on the other side. Usually so far, I mean, we are now, uh, I mean, great. Uh, we have two year follow-up of more than 24 cases at our place for the past four years. And we finished close to 50 uh, listesis out of which more than 10 were absolutely rigid. So the only thing that helps in rigid is to go to the opposite side, break the okay. facet. And one or two cases, sometimes we just go down from there, put a distractor on that side. That elevates up. And that's when you get the list. Right. Because there will be anterior osteophytes too. So if that doesn't do it, then you have to have a curved chisel. The, and you've got to osteotomize the lateral attachments. And that's when it goes in. Sure. Uh, so they are equally difficult even in open cases. And then to rely on a reduction screw in L5 and put a screw in 4 and pull it up. Most of these patients are going to be old and poor bone quality. So if you are, are going to be relying well, that's on, out of on pull it back, you are going to be in big trouble. So I'd rather, no, that's out of questions. So I'd rather let my intradiscal work reduce it and then put in the screws just to hold it in place rather than let the screws reduce it because that naturally puts too much strain on the screw. No, no, my question was because even after intradiscal work, sometimes or at 50 percent chance uh, times, I mean, this is not reduced. Then I think it's a screw thing. And I always use a longitude because I, I found sextant because you can't put the two rows simultaneously in sextant. Longitude, I, never I put... I never use a sextant for my... All right. I use a uh, free rod technique because yeah, sextant right. is not device that the sextant, uh, the current Solara sextant has a reduction device and everything. But I don't believe in using screws for reducing listesis. It has to be your release. If it is not, it is better to accept that position, put in bone graft, put a cage. One case, a case we haven't put a cage uh, because it was too soft and 
we have put in a lot packed in a lot of bone graft and it has united because uh, to allow your screws to reduce is looking for disaster unless it's a very young patient with the quality of bone is going to allow you to hold so this this a majority of your cases are going to be degenerative old osteoporotic patients in that cases no and i agree longitude is the way to go rather than a sex trend all right thank you thank you vishal and uh, you know one of the messages we have to take from this uh, beautiful video session is that uh, uh, most of the time for high grade listeners you have to go bilaterally and uh, we have to see the roots bilaterally and uh, using dr deshpande's technique uh, uh, really helps to go from bilaterally and you know to do the rocking technique to reduce the listeness and uh, thank you again vishal for a beautiful uh, lecture uh, may i now invite uh, dr puneet girdar uh, to speak about mis t lift with hypertrophy calcified uh, <clears throat> pezet joints and uh, that is sometimes a very very difficult thing to do you know to uh, to even identify the facet joints correctly and uh, to do a facetectomy there and uh, many of us have had difficulties there thank you uh, may i invite uh, dr puneet uh, good evening friends uh, i am dr puneet from new delhi and today i'll be showing you a video of the technique of mis t lift in a hypertrophic facet as you can see in this lady with x ray and mri pictures are being displayed she has a uh, collapsed disc with hypertrophic facets at l45 right more than left she has a grade 4 hypertrophy whereby she has not just joint space narrowing but also hypertrophy and spinal canal stenosis so the usual dilemma in the hypertrophic facet is um, the identification of the facet joint line so to avoid uh, getting lost in the uh, in the facet area it is ideally advisable to lock your tube under cm guidance on the lamino facetal junction as you can see here in a hypertrophic facet there may be osteophytes and which will uh, make it technically difficult for one to identify the joint line also there is a change in the uh, mediolateral dimension of the facet joint so instead of making an error of locking the tube to lateral it is advisable to do it under cm guidance and lock it on the lamino facetal junction so that the lamina can be easily identified and then depending upon your preference one may either use an osteotome or what we typically do is use a high speed bar to uh, uh, osteotomize the lamino facetal junction as well as uh, identify the facetal joint line so by doing that the inferior facet as you can see becomes free between the two osteotomies so then this inferior facet can be uh, picked up with blunt instruments so that it can be used later as a bone graft instead of uh, using the bar on the entire facet so here we are using a kerosene or a disc punch to lift it up and use it later as a bone graft sometimes it may come in as an entire piece but as we understand in a hypertrophic facet sometimes um, it is easier to take it out uh, piecemeal as you can see uh, in this typical case where we have uh, uh, taken it as two or three fragments so another technique uh, uh, which can be employed uh, and not usually our preference is to identify the superior articular process that will help us uh, uh, avoiding any unwanted penetration of uh, our uh, drill into the Uh, pedicle or uh, getting too far lateral not able to uh, or unable to identify the joint line so once you have removed the inferior facet joint 
you can have a glimpse of the ligamentum flavor so one can proceed uh, with the uh, trimming of the lamina till uh, the attachment of the the proximal attachment of the ligamentum flavor because that's where we are going to lift our entire flavum for this particular level most of our patients as we see uh, are having a lot of central canal stenosis so more often than not uh, we need to require uh, to uh, go over the top and uh, that requires um, uh, removing the undersurface of lamina uh, all the way to the other side so as you can see that the lower part of the lamina is being burned in this uh, particular case and the attachment the proximal attachment of ligamentum flavum is identified here so in this technique of moving from medial to lateral after having removed the inferior facet it is uh, technically very easy to bar away the the outer or the superior facet so as you can see now the superior facet is being targeted with the help of high speed bar and till the superior aspect of the pedicle the kerosene can be a useful tool here for to prevent you to uh, uh to avoid any penetration into the superior aspect of the pedicle so once you have the uh, removed the superior articular process also uh, the next steps from here on are very standard for the t lift to remove the ligamentum flavum do an interbody discectomy and this is the uh, final picture after having done the interbody and percutaneous uh, screws for this particular case yeah uh th thank you uh thank you dr puneet uh, thank you dr puneet uh, so that uh, he was talking about uh, those difficult cases where you have a hypertrophied uh, facet joint and where you even can't see the joint line and sometimes it can be very difficult uh, thanks for that beautiful video i'd like to ask uh, a couple of the senior people uh, for example dr umesh uh she has once shared uh, about uh, you know when you have a very bad overhang of the inferior articular facet over the uh, uh superior you can't even see the facet uh, joint line and you know once you showed me uh, can you share a few of your thoughts on that please yeah uh yeah jacob uh, so so usually when there is a significant uh, you know uh, a curved kind of a superior articular process which is trying to ossify and bridge over the facet joint line so usually the simplest thing that we can do in those cases is to bar off that uh, uh, you know overhanging facet joint uh, in plane in in the same plane as the lamina and that is exactly that is actually going to give us easily the uh, you know approach to the facet joint as well as it is going to make uh, the docking more easy so usually in such cases what i prefer to do is to initially dock the tube and we you know remove the calcified facet uh, calcified capsule and then remove the burr the area of the facet joint that is in to the to the same level or the, to the same plane as the lamina and then we do a double docking in the sense like we remove the tube and then we do the docking again so usually we see that we can advance the tube more on to the facet joint and uh, you know we can make the tube more flush with the uh, facet joint and that makes the rest of the procedure quite easy but the problem here is not to deal with the ipsilateral joint alone the problem here is to deal with the contralateral joint as well so most of these cases where there is a overhang usually are associated with long standing rigid lysthesis and uh, you know i i feel that many of these cases do require a contralateral facetectomy as well in order to achieve significant distraction or a lordosis and uh, a significant reduction uh, of the spondylolysthesis in such cases thank you thank you dr omesh uh, and uh, uh, due to lack of time uh, may i ask uh, may i ask to thank go you. to the next lecture yeah please uh, dr arvind sorry similar to what uh, umesh said i have a talk on this tomorrow it's minimizing soft tissue trauma in mi surgery 
uh, it follows what uh, umesh has said it, it's a bit pictorial so for example yesterday i did a mist lift so i started with a 5 mm uh, 5 cm tube and by the time i reached the laminate it was a 7 cm tube <laughs> so it makes it uh, you need to change your tubes once as yes. it go down so one of the key words which dr umesh was talking about was a double docking you know you might yeah. uh, once you finish your drilling you might have to uh, take out your tube uh, uh, put in dilator again and you know use a probably a larger tube uh, like dr arvind was talking about and uh, we are eagerly waiting for your lecture dr arvind shall we go on to the next uh, uh, topic that is minimally invasive uh, posterolateral lumbar corpectomy one of the dons of uh, minimally invasive surgery from bangalore dr Umesh, uh, who's also the organizer, will uh, enlighten us right now. Hi, my name is Dr. Umesh Srikanta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the technique of minimally invasive corpectomy or anterior vertebral reconstruction. The case in example being an L2 fracture in a young girl that is a 24-year-old girl who sustained a fall from a height was diagnosed to have a type A4 L2 fracture with partial neurological deficits and posterior ligamentous complex injury, the TLIC score being 6 and the load sharing score being 7. The technique behind MIS corpectomy is easier to understand if we consider it as an extension of MIS TLIF, a procedure that is more commonly done, which involves unilateral single level facetectomy. For corpectomy, instead of a single level facetectomy, adjacent two facets have to be resected which will then give us direct transpedicular access to the vertebral body to carry out the corpectomy procedure. In fact, if we observe in this case of an open or conventional lumbar corpectomy that has been done, the area that has been utilized to perform the corpectomy and place an interbody cage is almost similar to the exposure that we can easily get by a minimally invasive technique. In order to be able to resect the vertebral body, it is important to consider the lateral angle of approach. In the lumbar region, the approach can be relatively closer to the midline, almost same angle as the pedicle screw insertion, since it is possible to retract the dura and remove much of the corpus and position a cage in the center of the vertebral body. In the thoracic region, since it is not advisable to do any kind of retraction on the dura, which will get transmitted to the spinal cord, the angle of approach has to be considerably lateral enough more than that of the lumbar region in order to adequately access the vertebral body and place a case in cage in the center of the vertebral body. In this particular case, a unilateral percutaneous pedicle screw stabilization was done initially followed by a far lateral approach from the other side through sequential dilatation and insertion of an expandable tubular retractor. Initially, the lower facet that is the L23 facet was removed as well as the ligamentum flavum was excised in order to achieve decompression on the lower half of the operative field. Similarly, the upper facet that is the L12 facet was also exposed and the facet was completely resected and decompression was done in the upper half of the operative field, thus exposing the pedicle in between the two facetectomies which will give direct access to the L2 vertebral body. The lateral margin of the dura was then identified and the nerve root which was coursing along the medial and the lower border of the L2 pedicle was dissected and hemostasis was achieved in that region. Following this, the superior articular process overhanging on the pedicle was removed and the pedicle itself was drilled all the way into the fractured body whilst retracting and protecting the dura as well as the nerve root. The lateral part of the vertebral body was then drilled in order to create a cavity into which the retropulse fragment can later be pushed and removed. Following this, the upper disc that is the L12 disc was incised and removed and the upper end plate that is the lower end plate of L1 was prepared for interbody fusion. Once there was adequate space, the retropulse fragment was then pushed down into the cavity that was created and was removed. Later, attention was directed to the lower disk space 
the nerve root was completely isolated the dura below the nerve root was retracted the lower disc identified and then the annulus was inside and lower discectomy and the end, end plate preparation of the lower that is the upper end plate of l3 was prepared again for interbody fusion an appropriate sized cage that is a non expandable mesh cage was initially inserted to check its size was fashioned according to the required size filled with a bone graft that was harvested from the patient itself as well as and then inserted and positioned so that you know it comes to the center of the vertebral body which was confirmed with a cm image contralateral innis were tightened under compression hemostasis achieved and the ipsilateral tibular retractor was removed and ipsilateral pedicle screws were placed with the rod under compression again this is the wound after closure the arrow that is pointing to the incision used for cor corpectomy it can be observed that it is lateral even to the one used for the percutaneous pedicle screw fixation the patient made an uneventful recovery was discharged on the fourth post operative day and had normal neurology at follow up with the follow up x ray showing implants in position and adequate maintenance of lordosis similar techniques can also be utilized in other pathologies affecting the anterior vertebral column like tuberculosis or any other infective pathologies where an anterior vertebral reconstruction can be done with an expandable cage after a corpectomy achieved through uh, through an ipsilateral side uh, at the same time placing a contralateral stabilizing screws as being has been shown in the diagram Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Omesh, uh, for another beautiful exposition of a very difficult case. Is actually, uh, uh, we know that uh, the uh, there is the inaccessibility of the disc, the uh, <clears throat> the corpus in the lumbar region because of the uh, uh, exiting nerve root. and sometimes uh, it's difficult to put a large cage there and uh, you have to negotiate so it's very important like dr umesh was stressing that you know you need to go further laterally uh, i'd like to ask uh, any of our senior colleagues like dr kulkarni you have uh, any something to add to this because this is definitely a very difficult uh, procedure to do yeah yeah it's a very difficult technique unless you have good amount of experience like uh, umesh has you shouldn't uh, jump into such procedures you need to know your anatomy well and uh, very well done yeah yeah i have a question dr sir uh, to yeah uh, i just wanted to uh, ask the opinion of the house including dr umesh and dr avin what is your preference uh, for the cage an expandable or a mesh cage because the roots there are uh, quite important and any amount of traction on that can be detrimental so what's the preference usually especially if it's a multi level collapse like a tb maybe a two level collapse and you are trying to do it anteriorly the same way and the roots are now uh, crumbled up so it's it's difficult to put a mesh cage is what i i, I feel so an expandable cage makes your life easier so any opinion on that Completely, I completely agree. It is more difficult to put in a mesh cage, uh, a rigid mesh case, the cage than uh, an expandable cage. Uh, in either case, whether it is a lumbar area or a thoracic area, uh, the idea of putting a mesh case is so is so that you can put in lot of bone graft inside that. So as we all know, expandable cages have a very narrow bore, and also the moment we put in a bone graft and we expand the case, there is a very hollow segment over there which is not going to have any bone, and that ultimately that is going to affect our fusion. So whenever possible and whenever feasible, I always try to put a non-expandable cage, a mesh cage, and only when you know the area is too narrow or we are not able to negotiate an appropriate sized mesh cage. Of course, there in such cases, expandable cages uh, uh, may be used. so i uh, don't usually take this approach i use a short anterior incision so one of the reasons is i want my fellows to see anterior approaches so whenever there is a chance i grab on an anterior approach so that is one reason second is i love to do anteriors uh, you know especially when there is trauma and very hardly do we do in tuberculosis nowadays uh, so when we do that so when if the void is small like if it is limited to one body i use a mesh cage 
but if it is a long one it is very difficult to control with a long wash cage because you know it is it becomes quite unstable it's very difficult to factor in the uh, the ligament or taxis effect later on so here you can keep stretching it what i do is if you can't pack it completely you know once it is expanded i feel a lot of bone around the cage you know anteriorly as well as laterally and with pedicle good pedicle screw fixation you know uh, and uh, these rigid cages and good amount of bone graft i have not seen them failing yeah thank you thanks thanks for the inputs yeah Hi, Dr. Umesh. Uh, this is Prashant here. Uh, Dr. Umesh, uh, uh, Hi. Very excellent presentation. But uh, what do you think about the lateral approaches in which you can, you know, uh, without weaving and struggling, uh, put in a much larger cage as compared to the technique? Yeah. So whenever now, I think I think this case was, uh, you know, very case. Case, so where I was not yet uh, very familiar or very comfortable with the lateral approaches. Uh, nowadays yes if such a case comes i i don't i i if and if an anterior approach is required i would always prefer a lateral approach for such cases whether it be an infective pathology or a traumatic pathology uh, so the lateral approaches gives us a very very wider uh, unrestricted access to the vertebral body you can even with an oblique approach you can even go uh, remove the posteriorly dislocated fragments from the canal visualize the dura and you know you will be able to put in a larger cage without any without any problems at all and of course you can you know supplement it with either a posterior fixation or a lateral fixation itself but i always almost always prefer a posterior fixation as compared to a lateral vertebral body cage right thank you uh, thank you dr omesh uh, that was the last word uh, and that but i think uh, the posterior approach a uh, posterior copectomy should not be forgotten because there are certain cases in which uh, this might really come in handy and uh, you know uh, that was a very nice of, uh, the advantage of anterior approach in such cases you can have anterior screws as well as posterior screws if you are going to do posterior fixation you can stability will be much more rigid that's right okay so may i uh, may ask uh, to put the talk for dr uh, ashish tomar retroperitoneal approaches for spondylolisthesis good morning everybody uh, i'm dr ashish tomar i'm working as an ortho spine surgeon in faridabad i'm going to present uh, a case in which i used a retroperitoneal approach only for for the treatment of spondylolisthesis This was a patient, 63-year female, who presented to us uh, with the severe back and leg pain, and with walking distance of few steps. She was having listhesis at two levels, L3, L4, and L4, L5. This was the MRI. If you can see that the there is listhesis at L3, L4, L4, L5, and there is uh, the the very peculiar uh, point in this patient was this patient had a very good anatomical window for doing an olive surgery, and that was the reason why we decided to do an olive surgery in this patient. If you see, this is a very, very wide window, around two centimeter window, right? both at L3, L4, and L4, L5 levels, and it was she was very anatomically suitable for her ulnar surgery. This was how the patient should be positioned. This the the tape should be applied directly on the skin rather than uh, putting gauze pieces or any pads in between, uh, because that can loosen the uh, position of the patient and the patient can move uh, in. Uh, during the surgery the second important thing is that this area should be totally free below the legs so that your c arm can move and you can get true orthogonal view of ap true orthogonal ap and lateral views so uh, beginning with the surgery the skin incision uh, first there is marking is done at both the posterior and the anterior discs are marked and uh, <clears throat> a skin incision around 5 cm anterior to the disc in this case since it was a l3 l4 and l4 l5 two levels were to be done so we we took l4 uh, l4 as the midpoint and an incision of around 5 cm anterior to it was taken next the skin is divided and uh, we reach to the fat is divided and we reach to the first abdominal muscle layer that is the external oblique aponeurosis is reached external oblique aponeurosis is divided and uh, it is cut then the muscles that comes uh, layers of muscles that come they are gently you know divided along their length of fibers with the help of artery forceps which will be shown here just in a while and we reach the yellow glistening uh, you know peritoneum is a yellow glistening layer layer so uh, once you divide these layers of muscle external oblique and internal oblique a yellow glistening uh, 
peritoneal layer is visible so that is the point then that when uh, you uh, you are supposed to create the uh, retroperitoneal window is to be created and that uh, we can do with the help of uh, finger blunt finger dissection and first uh, the finger moves uh, towards the back and we feel the transverse process the psoas muscle and then we come anterior so this is just showing that those steps the internal oblique and transverse abdominis is being divided and this yellow glistening uh, you know which i was talking about the peritoneum layer is going to be visible just in a while and this has to this uh, with finger dissection this is you know divided and we reach uh, the uh, and uh, the swas is dissected with the finger posteriorly and then with the uh, with the guiding with the finger and the cm the inner dilator is docked at the disc space which we are going to do at, right now we are doing a l4 l5 disc so it is docked at the l4 l5 once it is docked the disc space is clear just like an inter body then it is just like any t lift surgery or any other posterior surgery uh, in this case specifically we found this vessel uh, coming right in between us we could have ligated it but we thought of you know uh, just uh, retracting it and we were able to do it we will also show a video where we have uh, you know uh, ligated these vessels and we have done it usually these vessels don't come in between but sometimes if they come they, you don't need to be afraid about it so disc is prepared and a cage is being inserted at l4 l5 level then similarly as we started doing uh, the same thing so steps are repeated at an l3 l4 level and the after docking of the retracted this is how it it, it is they are visible and this also this vessel was coming in our way we retracted here also so this was the first case where both at l3 l4 and l4 l5 we have found a vessel you know uh, restricting or interfering our way we were doing it under neural marking so we were sure that we are not compressing or you know uh, doing any putting any damage to the nerves so disc is created once the disc is uh, discectomy is done you, uh, this is uh, uh, sh shaver can be used you know orthogonal maneuver is being done from anterior we are going when we are going posteriorly we are moving the uh, the uh, shaver uh, and orthogonal maneuver is done uh, with the help of the shaver itself the opposite annulus is broken which helps in reducing squirming which helps in uh, attain, uh, getting the disc height uh, with the help of um, when when you are pushing the cage if the opposite annulus is broken this will help in reducing the uh, the uh, basically this will help in uh, you know uh, getting the height of the disc and this will also help in uh, you know reducing the scoliosis if there is any scoliosis so once it is done cage is inserted closure is done in layers this is uh, the surgical video uh, next uh, as i said this is uh, a case in which we got the, the vessel in between that was in interfering our working area so we uh, have ligated with the stapler staplers are in, uh, and we have we cut, we, we did we cut uh, these vessels and we were able to then perform our surgery so this was the post op x ray if you can see the, the, the there was a wonderful correction we could get a very good correction of uh, lysthesis and uh, this is the pre op comparison of the pre op and post op and the uh, wonderful restoration of sagittal balance has been done this is just to in, uh, uh, show that uh, with the this anterior retroperitoneal technique one very important advantage is that with the segmental lumbar lordosis the end lumbar lordosis improvement is much better than with the posterior approaches and that is the whole idea of restoring the sagittal balance with these approaches so this is a uh, so a wonderful approach to you know uh, 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 redu uh, a wonderful approach to you know in lysthesis or in areas where we want a good uh, sagittal restoration so uh, this this approach can be uh, very very helpful thank you so that was, that was, that was that was really a wonderful uh, video demonstration of uh, the report and thank you dr ashish tomar and uh, i would like uh, to request uh, some of the senior faculty also to share their experience with especially with high grade lysthesis like we are talking about spondylolysthesis so lower grade lysthesis uh, uh, yes but like uh, what is the level of what is the highest grade you could do so how would you choose such cases uh, Uh, I think 
to up to grade two is if the uh, on reducing films it it is going up to grade two. It should be comfortable with an OLED. But beyond that, because you know when you are entering the uh, disc space, so so it it becomes a bit difficult, you know, uh, to get get that from with the OLED approach. Definitely interior you can do, uh, mm. but uh, OLED is a bit dif- difficult for that. So any uh, contraindications uh, you would think that you wouldn't want to do uh, for for listhesis. uh so basically uh, a vascular anatomy is very important you need to be very careful about the anatomy where your uh, uh, you know uh, vessels are the ileolumbar uh, veins and you know the the uh, the iliac ex- uh, external iliac vessels are going so you have to be very careful with that and uh, obviously uh, uh, that is one uh, if, if if it is going very close uh, we don't have in india the uh, the olif uh, you know uh, 51 so we are still doing olive 25 so with that uh, uh, you have to be very careful with vessels which are going very close to the l4 l5 I mean, if the margin is less than 1 cm then you have to be very careful with that uh, dr sachin dr varun any anything you would like to ask yeah dr ashish excellent excellent uh, demonstration just wanted to ask if uh, in addition to a degenerative listhesis you have a uh, lateral resistenosis also so will you just rely on an olip or at times with a facetal hypertrophy you would like to do a posterior decompression also what's your experience on that how many times an uh, indirect decompression uh, surely helps and how many times we may need to even do a uh, posterior sort of decompression that's that's one thing uh, i would like to know uh, 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 your experience as well as the uh, experience uh, of uh, the other panelists so so dr sachin basically uh, in uh, uh, olive uh, in spondy specific, specifically in spondylolisthesis since in spondylolisthesis the basic pathology the compression is because of you know the uh, the vertebra ha- height has gone and it is basically the translation of vertebra which is causing the compression uh, behind so almost in all cases i have never experienced any case in which you know uh, doing a decompression and then i have to go behind go posterior and do a decompression alone however if there is a case where you if, if, where, where uh, there is some compression or something is left you can always get an mri scan done and do it later and uh, if you are doubtful like in very severe stenosis in which i am doing olive Uh, i am doing it in a staged manner uh, where i am not sure that i am uh, you know going to get that adequate decompression and i am uh, i am uh, worried that i might need to go posterior then i explain my patient that i will do the surgery in two uh, two stages so i will go in uh, and uh, uh, and anterior first put my cages and then ask my patients to walk and do the posterior surgery after uh, one or two days so that that helps basically if you are uh, not sure that you will get that uh, decompression you can stage it i would like to uh, put that same question to dr amit jala uh, because uh, he has done a lot of these cases so what what level of lateral recess stenosis would you uh, say that like you would just go posterior or would you just uh, do a second surgery for the lateral recess stenosis if it is uh, residual i'll just share my experience that uh, what we have been doing is a grading of uh, and we see shiza's type of uh, grading uh, in this cases i have done up to shiza's grade d but that's that the patients which we are following but up to shiza's c grade uh, we have already presented our uh, series and about out of 45 cases that we have done in shiza's c and d none of these patients required any of uh, uh, posterior decompression so up to shiza's c there is no problem but shiza's d we need to re- definitely uh, uh, have a fingers crossed whether it will always be uh, uh, useful or not right. i guess the message is that uh, in spite of uh, significant lateral stenosis up to moderate uh, level of stenosis significant it, central stenosis mm-hmm. not lateral even central stenosis can be managed with uh, uh, that uh, 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 lateral approach right uh may i ask uh, the the next uh, topic uh, dr baith uh, to present on uh, transforaminal 
in the body fusion uh, in the dorsal spine. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dr. Prashant Bhatt, uh, working as a consultant spine surgeon in Apollo Planning Hospital, Calcutta. Today, my topic is MI slip in dorsal spine. Uh, this was my case, a six-year-old gentleman who presented to us with a back pain for four weeks, weakness in legs for nine days, and able to move legs for five days. He also had a myocardial infraction uh, four weeks back for which he had antiplasty and is now on dual antiplatelets. Finger examination revealed no power in the lower limbs, no sensation below L2, although the catheter tug was positive, uh, <laughs> albeit uh, faintly. This is an MRI which shows D9, D10 discitis with a lot of uh, implant destruction as well as epidural soft tissue. Uh, the actual cause also revealed the epidural collection as well as um, cord compression. So typically, we didn't waste time because he was zero for last five days. We decided to do surgery with a dual endoplatelet on. Uh, typically, I always do a, a fixation on the contralateral side in dorsal tilic because I don't want any kind of untoward movement during tilic maneuvering. Typically, the, the starting point is 2.5 centimeters away from the midline. Um, the reason being that uh, compared to lumbar spine, dorsal spine, the lamina is very small as well as the rib has doesn't allow you to go more laterally. Uh, once you have dotted the tube and removed the soft tissue, you are directly on the IP, then I make a trough using high-speed burn transversely as well as longitudinally. The transverse uh, trough is uh, just below the pedicle of the capillary vertebra, D9 in this case. Um, once the trough is met, then I use my osteotome. Um, the reason I'm making the trough is that you don't want your osteotome to slip off and cause any damage. Um, and then I gently hammer the osteotome to take uh, to make the cuts. Once the cuts are made, then you use your different maneuvers using the pen fill or the or the pituitary rounders to deliver the piece of the bone. This can be used as a bone graft later on. Once this is removed, um, and this is nicely depicted in the Sorbonne model in the PIP picture <coughs> above. Once you remove it, you are directly on the SAP, which is a glistening structure. Again, you use a bar to make a transverse trough which is just above the pedicle of the caudal vertebra, D10 in this case. And then you use your osteotome to take this um, piece of bone off. Once you remove this piece of bone, you're directly on the, on the, on the desired disc page, which is D9, D10 in this case, and actually exposing the Campbell's triangle. The difference between the Campbell's triangle and dorsal spine, two lumbar spine, is that instead of uh, transversing the root, you have a spinal cord immediately in the dorsal spine. So once you have removed the bone, you are on the on the chem, on the canvas triangle, and then you protect the exiting root uh, using your suction retractor D9 in this case. And once you have um, uh, removed the soft tissue on the disc space, use a bayoneted handle um, blade so that it doesn't come in the in in the way on a microscope. And then you use uh, various sizes of uh, pituitary rounders, uh, straight and curved starting from 2 mm to 4 mm to remove the disc and divide the disc. Once I've removed enough disc space, then uh, this, enough disc material, then I use my curette, the push curette and the down curette. Uh, the push curette is typically very handy because it helps you or allows you to, to decompress the cord ventrally. Anything below or beneath the PLL can be removed. Um, in this case, a lot of soft tissue was there. And then I use my upgoing curette to take off the any kind of uh, this space which is adherent to the end plates. And then I use my shavers and dilator in tendons, starting from smaller to bigger one. Um, make sure when you, whenever you're using a shaver, make sure that you do not do un, unnecessary jacking of the disc head because you, that can put a lot of pressure on the other spine. Once everything is done, and then you um, remove the remaining disc, disc tissue which is in the, in the rongers. And then I do my case trial, starting for the smaller and bigger one. Um, you, I, this case, I use the 14 into 22 mm, and then I do the dis, dis lavage to saline. And then I pack the space using my funnel um, and putting a bone graft, a lot of bone graft in this. Typically, I use the ionic bone graft, but in this case, I use both ionic and trichus and phosphate because there was a huge space. Once everything done, then I put my appropriate size cage. I wanted to put a titanium cage, but in this case, we didn't have the proper size that I have to put a peak cage, 14 mm and 22 mm. Always remember that when you start the, putting the cage, you always see lateral view. Your starting point should be visible because you don't want to go into the end plates. And the last step being the, 
the compression. So I typically do complete hemilectomy, hemilectomy on the ipsilateral side using my burr. Uh, and also I remove the base of the spinous process so that I can look on the other side as well. Uh, this case had a lot of losing because of the dual platelets the patient was on. Nonetheless, I was able to achieve good decompression um, and we removed all the bony tissues um, as well as the soft tissue. A lot of soft tissue adhered to the uh, dura because of the infection, uh, but we, in the end, we managed, managed to have a good versatile cord at the end of the decompression. And finally, I used flow cell to stop any kind of oozing post op uh, because you don't want any kind of oozing in dorsal spine, which can keep, can be detrimental and can cause uh, compression later on. Once everything is done, then I put my screws on the ipsilateral site, and this is how the, the post-op exit looks like. Uh, this patient is already three months down the line. He already has recovered um, his power in the rolling is three plus. He is uh, managed to stand with support. Thank you so much, your patience listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bay. Uh, doing a T-lift in the uh, thoracic uh, level is a very delicate procedure, and uh, you know it's uh, you have done yes, a beautiful position. And uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, some of our uh, faculty if you have something to ask, Dr. Sachin? I think uh, you might have. Yeah. Something to Dr. Baird, uh, I just wanted to know, have you tried uh, extrapolating uh, this to a uh, degenerative pathology like uh, dorsal disc? Um, so far, I've done seven uh, cases of telephantal spine and four of them, four or five of them are infective. And two of them were postulative disc as T11, T12 uh, disc bulge. Um, because in most of the cases where there's a degenerative spine and dorsal spine, is either calcified disc centrally, which is not amenable for T-lift. So in those cases, I go anteriorly. But the cases where there's a postulateral risk or there's an infective pathology, which is not amenable to antibiotics, even after biopsy, where I do T-lift and the results have been excellent. Uh, uh, another question is if it's a degenerative pathology and you're going from one side, uh, do you contemplate doing a unilateral fixation anytime? Uh, if I'm removing the fascigen, always I fix it. Um, so I have done a few cases of uh, OLF in dorsal spine where I have decompressed both ipsilateral and over the top. And sometimes I have to take a little bit more than 50% of the fascigen on one side, then I have fixed it. I have very yeah, low threshold I'm, of fixing it. Yeah, low threshold for fixing it. I, I'm, I'm saying... Uh, can it be done uh, unilaterally, just the same side you are uh, you are doing a fascia? Well, you I mean, can do it because uh, those spine, in fact, is quite stable because of the ribs and everything. So, I mean, it's doable, though I have not done myself. It's absolutely doable. I think there are a lot of publications in China, from China, where not only in dorsal spine, they are doing a lumbar spine also, unilateral fixation. So, you can take it from there. Yeah. And any, any tips, uh, the, because uh, uh, putting a cage... Uh, is quite tricky uh, in an uh, spine uh, and so, the approach is actually quite just at the edge of the uh, thecal sac it is not a lateral approach it is not a very lateral approach where you are your your thecal right. sac is behind so, so that maybe two, i yeah there are some tricks on yeah, that yeah the, yeah that's two things one thing you need, always need to fix uh, it laterally you don't want any kind of untoward movement in the spine if the patient intact, he will end up um, having losing some power. So I will fix it one side, and then your placement of tube is always end on. Unlike the lumbar spine, where you can can come obliquely, the tube placement is always end on because you just want to take. And the second thing is you cannot uh, put your cage um, centrally or uh, away from center. It's always on the central side. Um, even if you roll the table up. Uh, it's very difficult because the spinal cord, you don't want any kind of movement of spinal cord. So that two tips that always try to be ipsilateral and end on position of the cage. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, Thank pra you. Pradyum, what we can do is once you have gone a bit. Sorry, in, uh, 
Mr. Gulka, I, Padum is my son. He's a school laptop. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's Prashant. <laughs> Prashant. Prashant. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. So, I thought you would have a nickname as Prashant. No. You know, so, yeah. So, once you enter the disk space, you can always turn the cage around, you know. you What you do is... Yeah, you 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 can actually. That, that, because uh, my, uh, my experience of tea leaf and doll spine, uh, is, I said seven cases. Of the seven cases... Three cases I put cage, and all rest of four I put only bone graft because I'm very skeptical of putting a cage in the infective cases. So, yeah, it is doable. You have to uh, innovate a little bit more. Uh, maybe tilt the tilt tilt the tube a little bit more, or maybe when you put the cage, uh, maybe few mm, and then you actually can angulate it. Yeah, yeah. so you can angulate uh, it. Lumbar spine. What I do is once if I have to angulate it more, I uh, I make it a mobile tube. I I uh, loosen the nut. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. Then it tilts. Then you can go correct more medial. I absolutely agree with you. I do the same thing. I, uh, we're coming to the uh, end of the uh, program today. I think uh, Dr. Rajkumar, I think, is uh, waiting to talk. Uh, Thank you, Jacob, for uh, moderating the session. It was an excellent session. We've been hearing. And uh, me and Umesh were just thinking that, you know, even though it's late, so many people have been actively participating. Arvind has been uh, the one of the big uh, anchors. I see Varun, Sachin, Chandan Mahanti, so many people, Rakesh. So nice, yeah. Vishal. No, no, please, no Good to see you too. Uh, so, Hold it, hold it, hold it. we all had a... A uh, great day. We had a great day here, uh-huh. and I hope that all of us will meet tomorrow morning. Right. Debu, Debu, talk. I am just. Uh-huh. Let me say something. No, nothing for for those uh, who are listening in. Uh, you know, tomorrow we have a very uh, exciting range of talks all the way, starting from morning eight o'clock with keynote lectures, which are going which are going to be in Hall A, and from nine o'clock till evening eight o'clock, it is continuous parallel sessions in both Hall A and Hall B. including a wide variety of uh, case discussions interactive debates uh, oh. session you know yes oh. yes this session for one hour isha pes the safe spine surgery tips and tricks uh, you know and a lot more exciting uh, didactic lectures so we hope you see see you all tomorrow uh, morning sharp at 8 o'clock with uh, the keynote session thank you everyone and we we'll log out now Thank you. Have thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. See thank you tomorrow. You. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, Dr. Ramesh sir, can we close the session? Thank you. 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 Thank you.